couple of minutes. Okay, are we live? <laughs> I think we are. Okay, um, guys, welcome back to the second part of our, the fifth edition of Jornal de Estudos Irlandeses. Um, I am now very pleased and honored to introduce you to Stacey Gregg today. Gregg or Stacey, if you don't mind, Stacey. <laughs> she, she is the author of an impressive number of plays such as Puv, Lagan, Huzzies, I'm spilling my heart out there, Shibboleth, Scorch, Joyces, When Cows Go Boom and Override, scripts for short films such as Your Ma's A Hard Brexit and episodes for TV series such as The Innocents, Little Birds, Rivera and The Frankenstein Chronicles. Her first feature film, Here Before, which I haven't had the chance to watch yet, was released earlier this year. She's also a performer for the stage and screen. In 2012, she was awarded the BBC Radio Drama Award at the Stuart Parker Trust Awards. Her play Lagan has also been nominated for two Off West End Awards. In addition to her already brilliant career as a writer, she has also co-created an online multimedia installation to enable theatre audiences to engage creatively with Override as part of a project in collaboration with CRASH, the University of Cambridge's Centre for Research in the Arts, Social, Social, Social Sciences and Humanities. So today I'm in charge of interviewing this impressively multifaceted artist who has been interviewed by so many journalists and critics from so many different places and backgrounds. Um, we had first invited Stacey to join us in our thief journal, expecting that we would be able to fly Stacey to Florianopolis, but unfortunately, as the COVID-19 pandemic extended itself, we decided to move forward with our event online. Luckily though, Stacey very generously accepted our invitation nonetheless. Stacey, I'm thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be here. Um, on, in, in our jornada, whose theme is intersections of art, literature, theater, and technology. I also want to thank my PhD student, Jessica Suarez, who's currently doing her PhD on your plays for compiling a huge list of your achievements. And also Melina Savi, our postdoc researcher, and Jessica for brewing some of the questions I'll be asking you today. Okay, so following the theme of this year's symposium, my questions will revolve around your work as a writer, in particular as a woman writer, your uses of and representation of technology in your work, as well as your place as an artist in the Northern Irish, Irish and British contexts. So without further ado, <laughs> my first question is, um, traditionally, when studying Northern Irish drama, we often think of troubles plays and post-conflict plays as, you know, sort of historical landmarks. Many Northern Irish playwrights writing either during or after the troubles seemed occupied with the conflict and the consequences of the conflict from a political as well as personal perspective. Some of your work is regarded as post-conflict, such, such as Shibboleth which was published in 2015 with Nick Hearn Books. However, within the circles of our studies, you're also known as a Northern Irish playwright who moves well beyond the troubles. As a Northern Irish playwright, how much of the troubles or what aspects of the troubles do you carry in you, if at all? As the saying goes, you can take the boy out of Belfast, but you can't take Belfast out of the boy. Do you think that's your case? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and I just want to say it's a real pleasure to uh, to be here and to get to talk about work. It's it's always um, a pleasure to me whenever work leads on to these kind of discussions, so thank you. Um, to the Northern Irishness of it all, um, I guess like, like many people um, writing from somewhere where there has been civil unrest or um, a very strong sense of identity. Sometimes it lives in quite an explicit place. So there, there's certainly work of mine that that, uh, that attempts to address 
um, that conflict and the residual effects of that head on. And then sometimes it's a bit more uh, sideways or oblique. So I guess what I mean by that is I often say that coming from Northern Ireland means that I, I feel like I can hold quite a lot of cognitive dissonance in my head at the same time. So we're, a, a, you know, we're a, a, an area that has learned to live side by side with sometimes really quite opposing political uh, ideologies. And that, um, that is quite every day for us in a way that I like to celebrate, in a way that I think Northern Ireland doesn't often get celebrated for. So I think that the, the Northern Irish part of me and the queer part of me is uh, very interested in collapsing uh, simplistic binaries. And I, so I think that um, thematically that flows through much of my work. So even if it isn't overtly Northern Irish, I do think that it's been informed by both my experience of Northern Irishness as a sort of dual duality. Um, and then I would say secondarily to that, my, my queerness, my experience of gender and so on. Um, and to the sort of post, you know, post conflict, sometimes I guess I wonder if that's such a discreet um, uh, period to talk about because there's, there's something about the circularity of trauma, intergenerational trauma that we see play out in in areas of Northern Irishness, particularly the more impoverished areas that sometimes make post conflict feel a little bit of a luxury. Um, so again, I feel like I probably float between both places, work that's overtly post um, the sort of live troubles that we associate with the height of, of conflict. Um, but also I think lives that still feel very entwined with that pain and the ongoing questions um, that need asked uh, in, in Northern Ireland and Ireland um, uh, and beyond. Thank you so much, Stacey. And the whole issue of um, social class there really is important to think about, right? If you're privileged and you, you get to, you know, study and circulate around places like near Queens, for instance, like, you know, which is considered like a fairly neutral place in relation to the whole, you know, conflict. Or if you kind of, you're restricted to areas that are like predominantly Catholic or Protestant, and where Catholics are not really entirely allowed to, to go or Protestant. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, since you've already, you know, kind of tackled on your um, Northern Irishness, my next question has to do with that. Um, um, sorry, just had a problem with my screen here. Okay. <laughs> you were the first in your family to go to college and explore an artistic career. So I've been prying into your personal life. Sorry about that. Um, I believe moving out of Belfast was, was, was key to that, I suppose. Most of your plays premiered outside of Belfast, in England and Ireland. How did you feel, or better, what did it mean to you to have posies, for example, staged at the Mac in 2012, and Scorch staged at the Mac in 2015? I know this may sound too broad a question, perhaps, but in your view, what's the difference um, of having your play is staged in Belfast, Dublin or London in terms of reception and so on. And the, how does the Northern Irish in your plays travel outside of Belfast? Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question. I, I think those earliest plays that I wrote were very concerned with uh, explicitly Northern Irish identity. So the first play I ever wrote, Ismene, was um, an adaptation of a Greek myth that was set in contemporary Belfast. Um, Lagan was an early play also that was explicitly um, interrogating contemporary Northern Irishness. Um, and then and Shibboleth being the obvious other um, example, uh, and various little short plays in between. And of course, um, there was always a desire to have those to write those for the people of Northern Ireland and have them staged there, but that didn't seem to happen for me. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but, you know, interestingly, unfortunately, uh, I did, I guess, have my career truly launched in Dublin. Um, and uh, I had very many influential and inspiring and formative experiences um, via the Dublin theatre scene. Um, and that was probably in tandem with my experience of London because um, I, after university, I went down to London, but was sort of split between Dublin and London in terms of the work I was trying to make. Um, and Dublin had a much more European outlook. So Rough Magic took us to the Schaubühne and the Theatre Treffen. Um, and I suddenly felt exposed to the kind of theatre that I'd been trying to make, but I hadn't seen ever. Um, it was a slower process in London to discover that kind of, that kind of more ex experimental theatre. In terms of how that felt, I guess, I think that there was certainly an audience in both Dublin and London for those things, um, but the reception of that um, varied quite greatly. Playing Shibboleth in Dublin was a very particular experience and I desperately wanted that play to go on in the North and it hasn't yet. Um, and then the work that I did ultimately have play in the North wanted to fight against, I think, traditional modes of production, and there are less opportunities for that. So um, Huzzies was was part gig, part play, and I actually originally didn't want it to be produced in the Mac. I wanted to tour it around like chip shops and, you know, <laughs> pubs. Um, uh, but it ended up in a theatre building, which was fine. And then Scorch was much more mobile as a one person show. Um, and it definitely played with four more and I, I feel really thrilled about bringing those models of production to Northern Ireland that are a bit less um, common, I suppose. Uh, uh, um, but, but the journey, the experience of going away to London, to Dublin and experience other theatre scenes only enriched me as an artist, I feel. Um, I'm so sorry, something's just playing here. I need to stop it. <laughs> Technology. Um, it has a life of its own, a mind of its own, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, but yeah, I think, um, you know, there was an interesting, there was an interesting conversation with Shibboleth when it played in Dublin. And you imagine that a Dublin audience are as engaged with matters Northern Irish as an, as a Northern Irish audience, but, but that's the case often um, and I was kind of interested and surprised by uh, attitudes to the north and um, uh, and and in a sort of an separation in many ways so when lag and play there were lots of people in the audience in London who didn't know that we still didn't have you know or that um Northern Ireland was still at the time so in intensely homophobic um, so I think all of those experiences have informed the mode of address that I take I usually write in a way that's quite open um, so an audience can uh, experience the work on different levels so even if they don't have a handle necessarily on the subtleties and nuance of Northern Irishness there's usually something else there to um, uh, to lay the tracks into them when you wrote um, plays such as Shibboleth, for example, um, did you have did you have a specific audience in mind? As in, like, did you have a Northern Irish audience in mind, or not? Or you were already so embedded in this kind of you know Dublin um, context that you were actually kind of targeting a more kind of Irish audience. I think in the first instance, Northern Irish, like it was very much written to try and capture the poetry and specificity and the and the oral texture of Northern Irishness. Um, so I feel like if I'd written with another audience in mind, I might have um, not censored that, but you know, it, it wouldn't have been as um, strongly flavoured. Um, but I guess, as I say, given that it was a Goethe Institute and Abbey Commission, um, I, it was informed by my experience 
is with from Dublin. And I guess the, like I said, really on what was the people didn't face barriers. Um, you, you're you're freezing now, Stacey. I can't really hear you. It's uh, it's gotten very choppy. We lost her. Okay. Um, just um, we're going to give um, Stacy a couple of minutes um, to see if. Okay, she's back. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. I don't know what happened there. I'm so sorry for the technical uh, glitches. That's fine. Happens all the time. I'm so sorry. You were. Um, Okay, so you were, I think you were talking about, you know, sort of like the, that you were really quite used to working with, you know, um, in Dublin, okay, mm -hmm. even though you had, um, you know, kind of like a very, um, your, your characters and, you know, they're, the, you were talking about the Northern Irish um, texture of the play. Mm -hmm. But you're you're commenting on the fact that you're already kind of very used to to working in Dublin itself. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And of course, there are artists from the north in the south, but not uh, a great deal of traffic. There's more. Um, there isn't a great deal. There's less traffic than you would expect between the north and the south. I would say, and the artistic communities, and I think that's starting to change. Um, but I was very struck by that when I started out and around the time even the Chibboleth was playing. So it was a great deal to have people travel down from Belfast to see the show. Um, and, you know, travel down they did, but we definitely felt like a very Northern Irish company. <laughs> and that's that's interesting to me, you know. That's that's fascinating. Um... Okay, um, I'm going to move on to, you've mentioned something to do with your inspiration. So my next question has to do with that. Um, so earlier, you know, in the 20th century, women playwrights such as Alice Milligan, Patricia O'Connor, Mary O'Malley, and later on in the 1980s and 90s, Christina Reed, Mary Jones, and Anne Devlin, Devlin and the women actors from Showerbank, double joint and just us, they started important battles and won them, won those battles, I would say, to bring women's stories center stage, metaphorically speaking, as well as to bring women actors center stage. They have also contradicted mainstream narratives of the Northern Irish conflict, challenging the government and the media of their own times. The critics see you as someone who carries the names of those women in your, own, in your own way, with your own voice and style, of course. How do you, Stacey, relate to this legacy? Do you feel or have, have you felt at any stage that you were part of this conversation? And uh, you know, if you can tell us more about your inspirations. Uh, Marina Carr has once said that a writer is a magpie. You take what you need. The whole history of writing is borrowing from the previous generation. So could you tell us about this? Um, there, there are two things I immediately think of. One is that um, Sarah Kane actually used a stronger phrase. She said, all art is kleptomania. Um, uh, and, and I guess, I think I, I remember being asked a question like this a like a few years ago and misunderstanding the question, I think, that uh, and feeling a little shy that I hadn't like read the canon you know, I hadn't read all those plays, but it, but of course, it's it's not literally, um, you know, being part of the conversation and, and being influenced by those plays per se, so much as feeling like an inheritor or the beneficiary of the spirit of those women, and in in that sense, one hundred percent, I'm aware of the work that they've done 
and their attitudes and their fierceness and indeed that um that impulse to contradict and to disrupt i think is very deeply ingrained um it started again <laughs> oh gosh okay um and so uh yes i was very aware of sharabank and um i was a, 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 you know there was a period around the signing of the peace agreement when the women's coalition were very active um and i was looking around for you know for role models and for um you know i guess you know women who were doing their thing that i could look up to um and i and i i also feel like then when i was based in london for a long time and working i was constantly writing those women as well so i think the conversation continues in that spiritual way of of communing with all the strong women that have come before and i talk a lot about my granny she was a real matriarch incredibly uh, well technically underclass by the standards that we would talk in today um and you know a, a, a great figure in my life um and i i've had the pleasure to meet and talk to a number of the, those women who you know that, that you named um since and it's very fascinating to me to hear from their perspective the experiences that they have had and as i said earlier the the benefits that we have felt sometimes that we're not even conscious of in terms of the tracks that they have laid for us i think stylistically i did look to visual art and to european theater um and as i say i i wasn't very well versed in, in the work that had come before um and that's something that came later for me uh but you know that the conversation can sometimes feel very disparate and nebulous in the north um and then when you're in conversation critically with other people there's sort of like the when you're further when you're sort of looking at it from further away the patterns sort of fall and the connections are made and i'm kind of fascinated by that sometimes that i've been part of a tradition or part of a conversation that i didn't even realize was happening um so it's kind of tricky sometimes to comment on that <laughs> when you're in it um but i am aware of it and i feel very proud to be um to to feel like i've been uh, invited to you know to be in dialogue with that work in many ways i i really like what you said of being a, a spiritual uh, beneficiary of of them of this legacy that's that's really beautiful um okay so moving on still kind of you know commenting on <laughs> all this northern irishness i promise i'm going to move on to a different topic very soon um i i myself lived in belfast from 2009 until uh, 2012 during that time there was a strong campaign for the nor the new north that decided that tourism in northern ireland wasn't about the the walls nor anything related to the troubles but about its modern achievements such as the the building of the titanic its brand new waterfront and also around queens there were just so many interesting arts and music festivals going on during that time whenever you're back there do you feel the north has really changed and become new and uh if so in what ways does it feel like a facade to you or are those changes real in terms of the the northern irish mentality this this is such a complicated question you know i think i think there was a sort of um new north again in relation to what we were talking about earlier where yes obviously there were areas of the of the cities that looked better than they ever had and there was development and you know the film industry is a very good example of something that sprung up in recent times and is you know genuinely something to be proud of and fruitful and creating employment um and there's a new sense of pride in that in that area um but at the same time you know the the rates of um per mental health the intergenerational PTSD, rates of suicide, deprivation, you know, these these social elements that continue to not improve. 
um, uh, and that's that's troubling. And I moved back um, just before the first lockdown, and I've had a few of these conversations recently. And what I feel like I hear more and more is is is, is that um, discontent between um, what unites not just working class people, but but I think people in general at the moment, we want better health care, you know, we want to look at education, we want more integrated schools. Um, and these things aren't matching up with the politicians. Um, and I think that's always been the case, but I do think the landscape is slowly really changing. And some of those big changes that have happened recently, like equal marriage, um, or, you know, the woman's right to choose, um, there's that that disconnect basically between um what what people want um and the sort of very calcified political um structures is is becoming something really un, i think untenable um so i think it's both things i think i think that desire for change shows that that, that there is a new northern ireland I really do feel that. And I think the younger generation coming up have much higher expectations. You know, they're digital natives. They see what people in other countries and cultures have, and they don't understand the dysfunction here because, you know, they weren't part of that generation. So I think ultimately like that demand um, will only grow. Um, and we'll see that I think in the next with the next generation over the next you know decade or so and, and i find it very exciting you know uh, it, it, it's it's about time um so i think it's i think it's complicated and uneven um and we've still got a ways to go and people like lyra mckee were trying to talk about this stuff trying to join those dots and you know hers was a voice that should have burned bright and there's something horribly poetic about what has happened um but again we are we are talking about that i feel it, 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 there's a level of national discussion and, and and i think that can only push us forward thank you um that's you know quite optimistic and, and really nice to hear actually i don't know if you know but currently in brazil we're you know going through a very deep um ideological divide um that of course we can't you know compare to the troubles but it is really kind of you know splitting families and you know splitting you know long-term relationships um and uh you know it's it's really good to hear that you know there's hope you know things things can change so yeah you have, you know, you have to be hopeful and i do a few people have remarked on hot my point of view seeming like almost like optimistic and i just you know i kind of can't be any other way and like i said at the very beginning there are certain aspects of northern irishness that despite its trauma despite its conflict despite all of those things i feel we can hold up and celebrate and that those things make me hopeful so you know yes we get pushed back two steps but then a wave will come and we'll push forward four steps and i hope the same for for you absolutely thank you very much um so now um I'm going to move on to questions that are more specific to the theme of our symposium and that are very present in your work. In the afterword to Shibboleth, for example, you mentioned the context and reasons for writing about walls and humans in Scott and override, you know, you deal with questions of boundaries of gender and between human and machines. Those issues are all central um, in those plays in those two plays. Could you talk to us about the ways your plays approach them? Um, about how, your, 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 perhaps your inspirations or your motivations to dealing with those topics. I know that you kind of, you know, tackle, the, tackle them a little bit, you know, kind of talking about um, binaries. What is the importance of bringing such discussions to, to the theatre? Hello, sorry, uh, it just froze there. Um, 
So, sorry, just to, I, <laughs> I missed the very end of your question. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, it's getting a bit glitchy. Can you hear me now? Okay, there's a bit of a delay. Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me, Stacey? Yes. Yes. Okay, there's a bit of a delay. I'm going to repeat the, the final bit of my question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, so um, I just I was just asking you to talk to us about um, the ways your plays approach, you know, issues that deal with the boundaries um, between uh, boundaries of gender, you know, human machine, since those are central issues to scorch and override, for example. And uh, the whole thing about walls and humans and shibboleth, for example. Um, could you talk to us about the importance of bringing such discussions to, to the theatre? I think, um, again, just to slightly re reiterate some of the things I've touched on, I think that my approach to form in theatre is very often to disrupt and to ask questions and invite um, curiosity. So for me, taste-wise, I'm less interested in theatre that um, tells audience or operates simply on a naturalistic level. Um, I'm interested in pushing ideas together or breaking apart or, dis or interrupting, disrupting ideas or receive truths and seeing what happens. And so I think formally I do that and, and thematically quite often that means um, uh, poking around um, at the edges of things uh, that, that sometimes we would rather not. Um, and I think that preconceptions about things such as um, bodies, a sort of corporeal um, essentialism uh, uh, are, are sort of is right, you know, is, is great territory. Um, and I return to it clearly through um, different works. Um, and and I, again, I feel like the poetry of performance is such that you can, you know, you can move limbs or, you know, take people on those journeys. That's the, that for me, that's the beauty and the freedom. Um, and it's, it's messy and, um, sometimes boundaryless uh, and I'm excited by that um, and I'm excited by the density uh, often of that experience uh, and I think you know plays like Override and Scorch are in dialogue with each other um, and some of those are air plays that I wrote as well uh, there are clearly preoccupations and sometimes they're very sublimated in the material but you know like many writers uh, I'm I'm the filter through which my preoccupations <laughs> um, seem to persistently emerge. Um, Octavia Butler once said that she 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 writes about the things that she she fears. This is how she deals with her own anxiety and her fears. So uh, I, I think my my next question has to do with that as well. Um, the science fiction author and critic Joanna Ross has argued that sometimes the science fiction author creates a story in order to reflect on something one would like to prevent. Ursula K. Le Guin, though, says that the science fiction author isn't in the business of predicting the future, but of describing the world as it is in the present. OK, so things that you want to prevent and things that are actually happening now. When you wrote Override, do you think you were leaning towards the first or the second claim? Additionally, 
I'm going to let you answer this bit first. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> it's a very long question. Um, oh, I'm going to cheat and probably say a little bit of both. I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think that um, I think we are more commonly um, experience what we consider to be dystopia or um, or sort of technophobic sci-fi um, story theater. Um, and I don't see myself as technophobic. I'm probably um, the opposite of technophile. But I think that there are um, conundrums and moral questions that we think of as sci-fi that are completely contemporary. We are living through them right now. Um, and I think the public discourse is a little out of step with the reality of where we are. And so a lot of the my work that's interested in scientific progress and the frontiers uh, of that and where it meets um, uh, ethical questions, uh, I probably uh, in the present day and also um, it's my preference to, to favor um, stories that feel uh, sort of not amoral, but there's a neutrality of them uh, about them. Like I don't want to pass judgment, certainly not as a playwright. They're not dystopian. Um, I because I just uh, again that's telling an audience how to feel and what to think. Um, so I mean, Ursula Kale again is a is a perfect example of someone who understood that great art, um, great art gives us the tools to interrogate interrogate and challenge the present um but it, you know through that genre or through that lens and uh why did you explicitly locate override in the present and not the future i think for exactly those reasons so that we don't um disconnect with those characters so that it, we don't feel alienated by it um so that it feels uh, the, the, the sort of existential horror of it, if you like, is, is, very, is the sort of alternative possible world. I'm um, sorry, um, Stacey, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. Much more interesting. It's, uh, it's very glitchy again. Um, our technician has suggested that you stop your video. It might improve your, your audio. Would you like to try that? It would be a PC, but you're, you're freezing again. Stop my video. Yeah, let's see if this is okay. Shall we try this way? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this really feels like override. You know, like yeah. okay. <laughs> sorry, you're I saying. No, I am so sorry. I do not know the connection. So sorry. Where did I get to before I glitched out? <laughs> okay, uh, would you like to just um, kind of, you know, go back a little bit of saying that you, you wanted your characters in Overwrite to be, um, to be relatable, you, you didn't want your, your audience to be um, alienated from, from their reality? Are you there, Stacey? I hope Stacey hasn't become violent. Okay, let's wait. Hopefully she will come back soon. Sorry guys, Stacey's having connection problems. Okay, Heidi, so if you don't mind, just uh, paste I'm in. I'm here. Oh, hello, you're back. Hi. <laughs> okay. 
I was just saying that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping here, that you, yeah, haven't, I'm you so, haven't become oh gosh, Violet. This is just I'm so Okay, um, Stacy, I'm hoping that you can hear us at least. Uh, there are some comments coming from the audience members. Can you hear us? It really feels like we're, you know, kind of inside override you know this is very interesting <laughs> we're in the uh, play. i'm trying on my <laughs> Okay, are you trying to use two different devices, is it? Can you hear me? I can, yeah, yeah. Okay. Stacy, in the meanwhile, I'm just going to read um, a comment by Paige Reynolds. Yes. She says that she is a huge fan of your work and thanks for the shout out to optimism as one engine, however erratic, for meaningful social change. Oh, thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Okay, I think your, your um, audio is great, actually. Can we carry on? Okay, let's give it a go. Okay. Yes, please. I'm so sorry. Let's try Let's try again, yeah. Um, okay, would you like to just kind of, you know, wrap up your ideas on um, locating override in the present? Yes, I, I don't know how much of that you caught, but I was just, I was simply saying that um, it's much more disconcerting to feel like we're in an alternative present. Um, and there is a, to me, there's a sort of low level existential horror in that, that I find quite delightful. Um, but yeah, it's, I, it, you know, simply put, it's, it's, it's much easier to relate to those characters. And I think that it's more truthful as well, um, to, to, yeah, to, to, uh, uh, to be in a world that's familiar to ours. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so a bit on, on boundaries again. Um, in the notes to override, you cite the influence of Donna Haraway's cyborg manifesto, in which, among other things, she troubles the boundaries between human and technology, human and the non-human, um, nature and culture. And there are also the influence of uh, Patricia Piccinini, I don't know how you pronounce her name, it's probably an Italian name. Um, hybrid forms that are also present in Override, although she's actually Australian, right? It's relevant to consider that Northern Ireland is no stranger to the idea of boundaries and to the fact that they cannot contain what they wish to close off. Haraway, in fact, argues that the manifesto is an argument for pleasure in the confusion of boundaries and for responsibility in their construction. In Overwrite, Violet has such a playful approach to the human, non-human, and human slash technology boundary that I'm wondering how and if you're playing with boundaries in the play has any connection with the idea that boundaries are actually utopian and an impossible construction that we hopelessly insist on. Absolutely. I think that's uh, <laughs> a sort of distilled celebration of exactly what is often behind, uh, um, yeah, the, the, what, I'm, what I'm hoping to explore and interrogate. You know, boundaries are usually artificial constructions, um, you know, and getting under and behind 
what has led to those boundaries is is often very interesting because you know they become familiar they become invisible they become accepted normalized um and i'm always very interested in trying to see the unseen or defamiliarize the familiar um and again it's that thing about disruption and interruption um so yes in general boundaries is 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 a great territory uh, you know it's in some ways it's kind of um you know it's i'm just trying i'm trying to i'm trying to articulate the analogy i'm trying to make but it's like it is dialectic is is the you know is the condition of uh this is that this is one position and that's the other position um and how that interacts and to me visually and formally again those boundaries are natural points of dialectic and so it's it, you know it's it, it's probably instinctive on many levels but also uh, quite intentionally constructed that those those are the zones in which you know my, my work often finds itself yeah that's fascinating thank you so much um Okay, um, moving on to one, to my final question, actually, uh, we might be getting more questions from audience members as well. Um, I'd like to move on to your creative processes. I've watched the clip of your first feature film here before, um, quite disturbing in a very good way. Um, um, the clip was available on the Bankside Films channel on YouTube, and uh, I'm looking forward to watching it. How did it feel to direct and write your first feature film? Could you tell us a bit about the differences between writing for the stage and writing for the screen? Sure. Um, I mean, it was um, it was an incredible experience, and um, you know, I got to work very visually and work with. Uh, great performers. Um, oh, has it frozen? Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> just about. Oh my goodness. Um, it, I think that the visit to directing film and my attraction to cinema isn't you know isn't completely divorced from the visually led theater work that i've made um and although you know the film is probably more well behaved it definitely still again shares some of those interests in um in coexisting ideas and um disruption uh, uh and the, the rhythm of the film is quite uh, dissonant so um and sort of lives in the world of the uncanny um so i don't think it's a total departure for me um but i i do reserve um i think the right to work very differently in those different mediums um so i think stacy the filmmaker is probably quite different from stacy You're gone again. Stacy, can you can you hear me? Okay, so I think she's gone offline again. Just wait until she comes back. back. So we can... Okay. Hi. <laughs> so uh, you're saying that you know you were talking about Stacy, the 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 playwright. And you're about to complete your sentence, and then you're gone. Can you hear me, Stacey? Uh, 
I'm back. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sorry, where did I drop out? Okay. Um, so um, you, you were talking about the differences between um, um, Stacy, the playwright, and Stacy, the film script writer and director. Great, a perfect uh, egotistical place to drop out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, I guess I was Okay, it's very glitchy again. Sorry, Stacy, we can't, we can't hear you anymore, you're gone again. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> hello? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, Stacy, can you hear me? I don't think she can hear me anymore. Yeah. Hello, Stacy. Oh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you. There are two more comments from audience members. Um, can I just read them to you? Hello? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this one is again from uh, Paige Reynolds. Hi, can you, can you hear me? <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, I think we might just need to really wrap things up right now because there's another panel coming up. Hello, oh, Stacy. Where are you? <laughs> I can hear your soundscape, but not your voice. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Stacey. Yeah. Stacey just wrote down that she is heartbroken by this connection. Yeah, me too. Okay, guys. Um, so I'm just going to read one more comment from Lance Petit. He says, that would be a great question, crossing media boundaries. Yeah, a really kind of interesting topic. And, uh, and also Paige Reynolds, she was interested in, you know, hearing more about um, the, the changes, um, how, how theater and film, uh, how that changes her, your relationship to each form and imagine audience in the shape of narrative. Could you hear me? That was the last question. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, did you hear that last question? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Would you like to address that? Yeah. Yes. I just. I just want to give my, like my absolute abject apologies for this connection. I just had no idea what has happened today, and the timing is just so typical. Um, so I just hope that it wasn't too painful to sit through. Um, uh, I think the the quality of attentiveness is the um, is the question in terms of what medium you're working in. So I think when I work in cinema, uh, the quality of attentiveness is a, is a, on a certain level, um, and you are uh, imagining people in a cinema space. 
Whereas when you work with theatre, it sounds like a cliche, but of course you are anticipating live bodies in communion in a room and the and the degree of attentiveness is different again. So for me, I don't mind that people drift in their heads in a theatre space. I, I quite encourage that um, it, it, within reason. Um, so I think you are always mindful of people's expectations of the medium. Um, and as I say, the, the quality of their attentiveness. Um, and also, I guess, what is considered um, conventional. Uh, you know, cinema has been historically incredibly rich and, and experimental, but we're now conditioned to very sort of mainstream fare. Um, and I think that can be a bit of a shame, but also, as you know, as long as you know what you're working within and how to subvert that without, again, sort of misstepping or alienating an audience, you can have a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, and then also, I guess, uh, never underestimating those that audience either. Um, I think there's an assumption, you know, that you can be more intellectual, say, with, you know, theatre than perhaps mainstream cinema. And I, I don't subscribe to that. I think that audiences are incredible and receptive and intelligent. And if your work is um, careful and and takes and takes care of its audience enough, then you can be those things in in any medium. Stacey, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we need to wrap things up now because we're moving on to the next panel. Um, so happy to have you with us in spite of, you know, all the glitchiness of the connection. And uh, there are loads of, you know, commentaries popping up. I can probably, you know, write them to you and, and send you send them to you via email. OK, so, uh, yeah. Um, OK, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much um, for, for being with us. And uh, it, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Same. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Really nice Bye. meeting you. Bye. Hello. All right, I, I guess then it's my turn now, right? Can we start? Perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to panel two, Northern Ireland in theater and film. I will be your, your host. My name is Matias Corbett Garces. And we will have the talks of Jessica Suarez Lopez. Look out for the lads, masculinity and violence in Stacy Gregg's Shibboleth, 2015. Kathleen Mara Hosa, making sense of a divided Belfast, 71, and a sensorial journey of embodiment. And Fabricio Leal Cogon, Avenida Beira Mar, a recreation of David Ireland's Cypress Avenue recreation. For our first talk, we will have Jessica Suarez Lopez. She has a BA in English from Ufski and an MA from PPGI Ufski in the field of discourse and translation studies in social cultural contexts. Her PhD in progress in the field of literary and cultural studies focuses on Irish theater. She is interested in the areas of language studies and foreign literacies, with a focus on representations of gender and sexuality as in digital media. She is a member of NUGAL, Núcleo de Estudos de Gênero Através da Linguagem, UFSCI, and NEI, UFSCI. So, Jessica, the floor is yours. Hello, hello everyone, can you hear me?
I assume so. Yes. Okay, thanks. So again, hello. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Matthias, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to present here today among so many great researchers and authors, and especially after Stacy Gray, uh, who is the author I'm investigating. Uh, this presentation is part of my ongoing PhD research, so I hope the discussion after the presentation will contribute to its development. The presentation, as Matthias already said, is titled Look Out for the Lives, Masculinity and Violence in Stacey Gregg's Shibboleth. Uh, so I am briefly contextualizing the play before we move on to the discussion on masculinity and violence. Uh, the play is set in present Belfast, and as Stacey Gregg already commented on, this might be, in this case, also to in order to maintain the audience in the present, not to eliminate the audience. Uh, the extension of uh, a peace wall is the main plot, and this extension interchangeably divides and unites a group of construction workers, which are the focus of the play. Uh, first, a stone with markings. Sorry, Jessica. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I don't know if it's just for me, but there's a, a bit of noise in your voice. Like, it's me, something. Like, if you could move your mic, maybe. Okay, my mic is good. I can, so I don't know <laughs> how I can. Is it better now? Keep going, don't, don't okay. worry. Thank you, thank you. So first, a stone with markings is found buried in the construction site, and it brings the work to a halt, as it presumably marks the grave of a Macaro. Shifting from imagined hero to foe, conjectures about the identity of the absent person resurrect the conflicts of the past. Then the immigrant worker Yuri arrives and tensions rise as he is seen as replacing one of the lads, that is, a local worker. Yuri's daughter Agnieszka is physically assaulted by her muscle obsessed boyfriend Cory, one of the young construction workers. Mo, also one of the lads, gets involved and becomes a target of in group violence, after which he commits suicide and is eaten by the wall. Stacey Gregg's Shibleth was first produced in 2015 at the Abbey in Dublin. In an interview about the upcoming production at the time, the author states that the play is, and I quote, about living in Belfast, and particularly about young families and young men trying to work out how to move through a post-conflict time in a city where peace wall are still in existence. In the afterword to the dramatic text, uh, Stacey Gregg points out that in the process of writing Shibboleth, she had been haunted by boys. And I quote again, our boys aren't doing well at school. Our boys struggle with pride, employment, self-worth. Our boys take it out on people that aren't like them. Our boys are killing themselves. Violence turns inward, depression soars. So because of the relationship between the young male character Mo and the wall, that is, his suicide and his being ingested by the wall by the end of the play. This fate differentiates him from other characters and also promotes change for other characters in the play. Because of that, the present investigation focuses on this character and his relation to masculinity, aided by a brief contextualization of contemporary discussions on masculinity in the post troubles uh, Belfast, or in general, Northern Ireland. Sarah Edge discusses the relation between representations of masculinity in the context of pre and post Good Friday, uh, Good Friday Agreement. She states that Northern Irish masculinity can be defined in terms of both Irish and British identities forming a complex notion of subjectivity that has its origins in the 19th century image of the British soldier, which was reinforced in Northern Ireland because of the Troubles. While in the Republic of Ireland, more plural notions of masculinity could develop, according to this author. 
Dominant ideas of masculinity were also associated to sectarian difference and violence, as the conflict was represented and explained externally in the media through the same characteristics applied to men of Northern Ireland, and I quote Edge again, uncivilized, bestial, tribal. After the Good Friday Agreement, such representations of masculinity, that is, as intrinsically bound to violence, gave way to a less traditional, transformed masculinity There is more domestic between quotations. According to Sarah Edge, the recent shift in masculinity in Northern Ireland has taken place within a larger transformation of what masculinity and femininity means in a global context. The demands of feminist movements seem to see the emergence of a hybrid variation of Irish masculinity, more suited to the transition implied in the peace process. The valorization of so-called feminine qualities, mainly associated with fatherhood, has also been discussed by the author as a feature of this new masculinity, which is more easily adaptable to a neoliberal economic and cultural paradigm. And this is exemplified by the prelude of Schiller, uh, in which Obama's speech is presented, pointed to this global context in which Northern Ireland is positioned as a blueprint for peace and change. Changes, however, that reach and affect different, different clusters of Northern, Island, Northern Irish society in different ways, as is exemplified by the group of working class males in Shibboleth. So focusing on Mo, the character of Mo, different from, differently from the other Belfast construction workers, Mo is presented in relation to Alan's family. His interactions with Alan, wife Ruby, and their 10-year-old son Darren serve to present the issues of and the characters clashing views on immigration, border, border control, integrated schooling, and gender expression. In scene one, these interactions, and, and also the interactions between immigrant Yuri and his teenage daughter, Agnieszka, are interwoven as both Alan's family and Yuri get ready for work on the construction site and school, etc. So when these characters discuss integrated schooling for Darren, Mo and Alan share a similar stance at first although for different reasons. By the last scene of the play, Alan agrees to Ruby's idea of sending their school, their son to an integrated school, a changing attitude that can be attributed to Alan's critical observation of violence that culminated in Mo's suicide. After the suicide and the silence that ensued among the construction workers, he decides to further diverge from sectarian values by sending Darren to an integrated school and arranging for him to have dance classes with Yuri's daughter, Agnieszka. Mo, Cora, and Darren can be seen as representatives of younger generations that did not have their fair share of trouble in between quotations, having been born just a little before or many years after the Good Friday Agreement. Morrissey, Morrissey and Smith uh, points out that since 1969, gender roles mark the experience of young people in Northern Ireland differently, because young males have been more victimized by trouble-related violence, whether directly or indirectly. And the specific issue of education and school integration is also gendered, as unemployment and violence are put forward as interconnected issues in post-conflict Northern Ireland. In this regard, Felicia Garcia points out that, and I quote, unemployment and employment uncertainty, that is the fear of being next in line to lose one's job, are highly influential, highly influential factors for mental ill health and suicide, particularly for men. Uh, commenting on how educational performance and activities such as reading has been, have been associated with femininity, Morrison and Smith discuss how educational failure 
fear of unemployment and violence can be observed as consequences of gender-specific problems suffered by young men in post-conflict Northern Ireland. And this is also uh, very obvious when Mo is directs his rage at Yuri, which is uh, an immigrant worker. Education and homosexuality are also conflated with integrated schools. As in Mo's opinion, Alan should not allow his son to get in contact with demons as opposed to others in the educational context, associating the school environment with ideological and sexual contamination. Mo's aggressive stance after he mistakenly takes Philistine for Frankenstein at the same time reinforces his lack of formal education and exemplifies how sensitive the issue is for him. Because the interaction is presented in a comedic manner, the audience may mock from a co comfortable distance. By scene 12, the audience witnesses Mo's suicide monologue while being ingested by the wall. By having Mo as a sole voice, the play centers on his narrative and offers the audience the possibility of shifting to a more empathetic perspective as he retells the events that led to his death. And finally, as a final remark, uh, Eva Urban calls attention to the fact that the mantra, looking out for the lads, repeated throughout the play by some of the construction workers and the chorus of Britties, turns out to be contingent and even ironic as the, and I quote, lads turn out not to look out for the lads at all when the shifting target from Yuri, the outsider, to Mo, the insider, takes place. Uh, and that's it. Uh, finally, just to, to close the, the presentation, group identification is in the, in the play represented as fickle and alliances as unstable, which highlights the difficult positions of characters in post-conflict Belfast. The outsider is not easily identifiable and in-group violence can happen. Again, as uh, Greg commented on, boundaries are not stable entities, right? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. Do we have any questions? Let me check here on the YouTube. So far, nothing. Don't be shy. I guess then we can go to final check. Yeah. So I guess we can go to Kathleen, right? Yes. <laughs> All right. So Kathleen Mara Hause is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Film Studies, Trinity College, Dublin carrying out the research funded by the Irish Research Council on Urban Conflict Cinema in Northern Ireland and Brazil. She holds a master's and doctoral degree in English, linguistic and literary studies from Utsky. Her research emphasis is on war cinema, having worked with films that portray World War II, Afghanistan and Iraq wars, and currently late 20th century urban warfare in Northern Ireland and Brazil, analyzing embodied violence and the possible meanings it conveys in cinematic representations. So, yes. Kathleen. Okay, so I'm just going to, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen here and you just tell me if, can you see my screen? 
Matthias, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, so hi everyone, my name is Kathleen and uh, uh, the title of my presentation today is Making Sense of a Divided Belfast 71 and the Sensorial Journey of Embodiment. Um, so the issue of the troubles in Northern Ireland has been massively present in films that represent the contemporary political situation of the country at times foregrounded as a central point of the narrative or as a historical backdrop for action, thriller films, and other genres. But the relevance of the continuous conversation about the topic is raised by the appearance of contemporary films that although years apart from the Good Friday Agreement, they continue to explore uh, different facets and interpretations of the events. So films um, uh, such as 71, um, as you can see here, uh, films such as 71, directed by Ian Demange uh, in 2014, they help establish the flow of dialogue, which is an important thing uh, regarding the troubles the memories of the past and their consequences in society. So this paper is part of a more comprehensive study that's funded, as Matthias mentioned, by the Irish Research Council on films that deal with urban conflicts, both in Northern Ireland and Brazil. But today I'll be discussing how the film 71 conveys images of violence to the body and illuminates potential significances related to identity and to memory, uh, all in the process foregrounding the sensorial perception of the characters as a major catalyst of experiences and of meanings. And by focusing on a chain of characters whose lives are in different proportions touched by violence, the film attempts to represent an urban and sectarian context that relies on unrestrained violent acts from all sides. Such complex environment is portrayed in a way that appeals to the senses in a deep engagement with the body and the immersive effects of violence. The representation of the violated body and its sensorial spectrum adds to the notion of conflict cinema as an intimate portrayal of trauma and urban warfare. Now, just to give you a brief idea, the main narrative arc in 71 is Gary's story and Gary is played by Jack O'Connell. And he's an unexperienced British soldier who is dispatched to a stop and search raid in Belfast in the 1970s. And he's left behind to fend for himself. By delving into the cityscape, his life is both threatened and saved by interactions with multiple local characters, such as IRA members, British undercover officers and loyalists. Uh, just to help you visualize the, um, you know, what I'm explaining here, I brought a couple of images, uh, screenshots from the film. So the first one is, um, well, it's this one. Uh, so as the British soldiers enter the intimate social fabric of Belfast by driving through the city, the military disrupts the daily flow, merging public and personal spaces. While passing by the houses, the mixed environment of burning cars and playing children is perceptible. The soldier's presence flags a different behavior from the population who switch from daily life to a communal state of alert. This is done particularly through an aural alert system uh, of clattering lids uh, on the ground. As the soldiers drive by, people place themselves on the sidewalks, and here I have an image, um, communicating the military's appearance. The auditory sense is used to inform the presence of danger in the community to those who cannot see the events. However, the loud cacophony of clattering lids 
transforms itself beyond its communicative power into a, a form of auditory domination, as the sounds are also meant to disrupt concentration and to create an antagonistic ambience. According to the author Paul Rodaway, and here I quote his words, uh, dominating space with sound, such as through the use of excessive amplification of a single source of sound, literally destroys auditory geography, since it reduces or submerges the pre-existing soundscape under the blanket of the dominant sound, end quote. Disorientation also becomes a goal in this case, along with the demonstration of a communal power of articulation without words. A strong sense of unity is displayed here as the baffled British soldiers watch young and old women and men ceaselessly use the lids as a form of resistance to power control. Now, the relationship between touching and violence in 71 is intensively showcased in the sequence in which Gary and his teammate Private Thompson, and here I have an image, Gary's on the left and Private Thompson on the right, played by Jack Logan, uh, when they engage in one-to-one -one combat with the locals at the stop and search site. Uh, an IRA member called uh, Paul, he, he's played by the actor uh, Martin McCann, walks up to the soldiers and without hesitation points a gun to Thompson's head and shoots him at point blank range. Violence is displayed in its most graphic way as blood spatters on the window behind Thompson's head and the sound of the shot can be heard alongside a viscous sound. Thompson's lifeless body is explicitly shown, particularly the hole on his face and Gary's bloodied hand as he holds his teammate's head. The violent act is emblematic of a much larger frame of political and religious oppression by the British government and military and stands as another step in the circular framework of brutality. Thompson's execution sets the tone of hostile environment where Gary will navigate in the narrative. Another issue in the film is spatial disorientation, which becomes the major focus of the film once Gary runs away into the streets of Belfast, being followed by the IRA members. The chase scene features a shaky camera that accompanies Gary as he enters back alleys, climbs walls, enters random houses, all of this without any sense of geographical localization, only an instinct of survival. At this moment, the, the film does not allow a bird's eye view of Gary's location, only an immersive tag along of his escape. And I have one particular shot here is the one that you can see. Uh, that demonstrates how engulfed Gary is by the city. He stands alone in the middle of the street, a rubble barricade behind him with the burning car, rows of two-story houses towering over him on both sides of the frame. He looks small, imprisoned by the urban features of the city and by the context that he little understands. But in his wandering through the city, Gary comes across a loyalist boy. The boy attempts to help Gary find his way back to the barracks and takes him to a local pub. A bomb is accidentally set off inside the pub and the film depicts Gary standing outside looking at the boy who sits by the counter. The sequence is filtered through Gary's senses by focusing on oral and somatic violations highlighting the individual destruction and particularizing the violent act. It is no longer a general violent act. It's very particular. The blast illuminates the inside of the pub and propels Gary far away. This is an image of him already after the blast. The camera is lowered on ground level, showing his efforts to come to his senses and stand up. 
As Gary's face becomes the focus of the shot, a ringing sound takes over the sensorial spectrum as if emulating a hearing condition affected by the loud explosion. The camera then walks alongside Gary, losing focus of the image, a representation of his temporary sight impairment. The moment he enters the pub, the excess of smoke leads to an overpowering smellscape that causes him to cough. He picks the boy up from the floor and takes him outside, since now the indoor space has turned into a more threatening environment than the outdoors. The boy has lost his left arm and parts of his right arm in an environment in, in a graphic portrayal of the consequences of violence. In this case, an accidental explosion, but still part of the cycle of destruction. The camera offers a prolonged gaze at the disfigured body of the boy, highlighting corporeal violation, not as a celebration of courage and honor, but as a waste of life, a disenchanted um, view of the conflict. Gary's touch has the purpose of, I'm oh, sorry, Gary's touch has the purpose of uh, helping, although he's able to do very little in this situation, demonstrating his helplessness against a much more complex context. His four senses are foregrounded in this sequence to demonstrate his somatic navigation through the landscapes of violence and his role as a witness to the hurt body. After the boy is taken to the hospital, Gary walks the streets as if in a daze, moving forward but stumbling his way into alleys. The expressionist camera movements and shadowy spaces provide an atmosphere of horror as Gary reaches extreme emotional fatigue and physical debilitation. His body is no longer able to properly function in a threatening surrounding his corporographical instincts marred by the violence of the explosion, and he collapses on the sidewalk. The film ends as Gary leaves the army as a result of witnessing internal machinations of the military that led to unnecessary violence during that turbulent incident in Belfast. Gary is told by the command to forget what happened ultimately depicting the British military as an institution functioning in the format of a larger organism that is more interested in self-defense mechanisms and keeping hidden agendas. Gary chooses to be reunited with his family and gets together with his younger brother. The retreat into the personal sphere due to the overwhelming weight of violence in the streets signals the lack of a conventional solution for the troubles, as the film does not attempt to bring an upbeat ending to a chase story, but a reflection on the traumatic state of those corporeally and psychologically touched by violence. Now, just to conclude, in 71, the representation of the senses plays a major role in identifying the corporeal journey of the characters and their immersion into a hostile environment of violence. The violated body is placed in a context that takes into consideration the complexity of the troubles, not as a clear cut conflict between two ideological sides, uh, but a struggle for domination from varied, subtle, uh, from varied subtle directions. The film highlights the corporeal violation and psychological devastation that entails such traumatic events, but it does not offer a definite solution to the issues presented in the narrative. And as Sarah Cole remarks, as you can see from uh, my slides, um, violence leaves its stains in the long march of years, despite efforts at redemption or revisionism, will often fail to obscure them. So 71 does not attempt to solve such communal traumas experienced in Belfast. Nevertheless, 
its effort to stir up the memories of violence is significant as an investigation of issues of control and supremacy in Northern Irish society. So thank you so much for listening. That's it. Thank you very much, Catherine. So um, a minor correction on my part, we will be having the questions after this last presentation by Fabricio. All right. So now Fabricio Leal Kogo is a PhD student at the postgraduate program in translation studies at Ulski Bejanci. His research focuses on theater translation and translation as recreation. In his masters, he recreated the Northern Irish play Cypress Avenue by David Ireland into Avenida Beira Mar. He has been part of Núcleo de Estudos Irlandeses since 2017. Are you ready, Fabricio? Yes, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, man. All right, so I'll just upload my, share my screen with the slides and I start. All right, can you guys see it? Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Just a second. All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers of the event for this opportunity to share our research. I'd also like to thank the other members of this panel. Uh, my presentation today is about the translation project I conducted as part of my recently defended research masters founded by Capis. The title of the presentation is Avenida Beramar, a recreation of David Orland's Cypress Avenue, uh, which included not only my, my, my research included not only my translation, but also reflections on my translation practice. I decided to recreate the play Cypress Avenue by the Northern Irish playwright David Darland into Brazilian Portuguese having it set in contemporary Southern Brazil. Before I go on to the play, it's important that I explain a little bit my translation practice and why do I call it recreation. Although, uh, Although there, were, there are several terms that describe the métier and all of them touch the complexity of what it is to decode and recode a text in an entirely different context, I call my practice a recreation. Reading Aroldo de Campos' text on poetry transcreation and his reflections on the translation, the translator, I'm sorry, having to almost become a poet to understand what it is involved in the process of the creation of a creative text to then be able to translate and recreate the poem in another context. Based on these reflections, I thought about the, the creation process of writing Cypress Avenue. I tried to put myself in the place of the playwright. This investigation wasn't based on Arlen's actual creative process as I didn't have access to that, it was based on my interpretive studies of the text. I reflected on its possible effects on people to then think about how I could recreate them in a Southern Brazilian context. I became the recreator playwright of Cypress Avenue and through this process, Avenida Beramar was born. Cypress Avenue follows a radicalized Protestant unionist from Belfast who in a crescendo of violence ends up killing his wife, daughter, and granddaughter, whom he believed to be Catholic, the Catholic leader, Jerry Adams, disguised as a no board. Eric is a 60-year-old man who has lived through the worst and most violent years of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, but now doesn't know how to deal with this legacy in the post Good Friday Agreement Society. The action of the play opens during a mandatory therapy session with a counselor named Bridget. During the session, we are thrown right into the middle of an analysis of the constitution of his troubled identity, pun intended. At this point, Eric's flashback in therapy takes over the stage to include what led him to that situation. 
In my reading of the play, the audience is involved in a theatrical vortex in which the roles of observer and observed get blurry. The play made me think about my own identity and what it means to be who we think we are. As any, as any therapy session does, it puts us in front of ourselves. The project uh, uh, was born when Rita, who's my doctoral advisor now, showed me Cypress Avenue. It was love at first, uh, at first reading. I felt it in my body. It is important to say that Brazil is going through a very complicated political moment, which culminated in the present political crisis. So of course, the reader I was back then in 2016 was very much invaded by all those issues. As an undergraduate under Hita's supervision, we performed the research to build a glossary with all the political, historical, geographical, and cultural citations in the play. Little that I knew it would already be the roots to the yet unknown project that would come to perform during my research masters, resulting in the recreating translation. I'll present some excerpts in a moment. The reason I'm saying all these things about the context of the play and my own is pivotal to the, to the recreating project I cared out. The power of Cypress Avenue to make one face and question themselves as their background and their background made me think about the Brazilian political issues undergoing back then. And it made me realize some similarities between both contexts, the alleged partisan sectarianism growing in Brazil and the one between Republicans and Unionists in Ireland, and how these conflicts interfered in the constitution of political identities and my own political identity. So I decided to recreate it in my own context. Uh, here now are some key recreating choices I made during the process. The first challenge was, to concern, was concerning the recreating of the main character, Eric, who is, as I said before, a very radicalized Protestant unionist. Therefore, in the words of the character himself, he is exclusively and non-negotiably British. My questions regarding the Brazilian version of him were, where would my Eric be from? And what would his background be? Thinking about the latent sectarianism in Eric's identity, I decided to make my Eric a Southern Brazilian from a German immigrant family that came to the south of Brazil in late 19th century and colonized part of the state of Santa Catarina, which the descendants of these families do not feel or recognize themselves as Brazilians to this day. With the increase about the character, other issues emerged, such as where the Brazilian version would be located, in which city, on which famous street or avenue the Brazilian Eric would reside. And what would the title be then? One very important aspect of my translation was who and where I was during the translation process, the recreating process. As it usually happens with all the translations to an extent, the person that the translator is influences the final product. In my particular case, it was further enhanced. That's why I decided to make my Eric, a son of German family from the countryside of the state who came to the capital, enriched and bought an apartment on the most expensive avenue of Florianópolis, Avenida Beramar, which became the title of the Brazilian recreation. The choice to localize it on Avenida Beramar worked to compose a powerful image, especially for those familiar with the city of Florianópolis. Apart from being the most expensive place to buy a property, it was also the stage for very important and very symbolic events. One of them were the rallies against the president, Juma Rousseff in 2016, and more recently, the ones in favor of the present government. Another horrendous episode happened last year when a resident of one of the buildings hold and waved a Nazi flag. All of this helped, uh, all of this helped me to recreate in my version of Eric this paranoid character who firmly and irrationally believes that not only his family but also his country is being attacked by a communist force that needs to be stopped at all costs. 
Another pivotal choice I had to make was to decide who would replace Jerry Adams. And being candid, my entire project was born because of this choice. Usually I say that it wasn't much of a choice I made. It was more one of those moments where reality overcomes the absurdity of art. Uh, the Brazilian former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, had become one of the most hated political figures in our recent history. His persona created by the public and part of the media fitted right in the same place Adams occupied for Irish Eric. Eric, the Brazilian one, believing that his newly born granddaughter was Lula disguised, set the tone chord to the experience of the play. His hysterical and absurd belief on the possibility of an elder man being able to infiltrate his family as a baby girl, as bizarre as it sounds, has a very strong possibility to make readers or the audience connect Eric to unquestionable real contemporary characters. At this point, I strongly believe that every one of us have encountered a similar figure either on social media, family, WhatsApp, chatting groups, or even unfortunately in person. Uh, Arlen's play is fulfilled with not only political icons, but also with several cultural ones. These icons are really important in the symbolic construction of national identities. It is through the symbols that we, the public, get in touch with the cracks on Eric's self-projected image. And also it is through the way he interacts with these icons that we can access the endless influence cycle that culture has on us and we have on culture. With all this in mind, I faced some recreating uh, issues, questions. At a moment in the play, Eric describes a business trip he took to London and how in this trip he had to face his own Irishness. One night while in London, he goes out to have a drink. He ends up in a very Irish pub, his words, celebrating out of this, all of the symbols that he rejected. Then in a soliloquy, he starts uh, to talk about his identity with some doubts for the first time. He asks himself if he really is what, who he thinks he is, or if he has been alienated from himself by his environment. He talks about what it means to be Irish, he, uh, and he cites icons like Riverdance, Liam Neeson, and U2, and how these pop icons changed, uh, changed people's perception of Ireland and the Irish. Well, to uh, substitute Riverdance, a uh, folklore dance group, I decided I chose uh, Ashe music, not one group specifically, but the genre, which for a long period was very popular and is a generally Brazilian rhythm. And to replace Liam Neeson, oh, so sorry, uh, who Eric says to be Catholic, which for him is a problem, I chose the actor and move director Wagner Moura. I chose him because he's very vocal against the present government and he was considered a dangerous communist figure by those aligned with the government ideologies because of his last movie, a, bio a biographical film about Marighella. Uh, Marighella was an important character in the armed fight against Brazilian dictatorship. Then finally, to replace you two, I chose the performer Pablo Vittar, who's, uh, who's an internationally known drag queen singer. I chose her because she was also an important character to this extreme right group, especially during the 2018 presidential elections. She was subject of many pieces of fake news, especially related to supposedly gender ideology, ideology that was part of the workers party, uh, Lula, former Lula's party. It was a project to be implemented in Brazil. It was supposedly to be implemented in Brazil. There was even a rumor going around uh, WhatsApp groups saying that Pablo Vittar would be a candidate to Lula's VP, to be Lula's VP. Well, although there were thousands of other interesting choices I had to make during the recreation of Cypress Avenue, I went the presentation here uh, due to time. But if anyone wants to ask me further questions, you can connect, contact me via, uh, via email. And here is the address. Thank you very much, people.
All right, thank you very much, Fabricio. And now we open up for questions. Now I think, do I, do I leave my camera on for now? I guess maybe if you're going to answer. All right. So we have some questions already. A question for Catelyn here. It's Catelyn, in your opinion, do you see any parallels between 71 and other films that take place in Northern Ireland in the context of the Troubles? Mm, okay, all right, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, actually, um, there is a film called Odd Men Out which it's directed uh it was directed by carol reed in the in in 47 uh and it also tells a chase story um in the backdrop of the troubles so you can see this uh, the main character because there are lots of parallels between 71 and this film and these are, uh, you can see that in, 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 in film literature uh, about Northern Ireland. So it's, it's similar in the sense that the main character runs away from the police and um, uh, hides from place to place in Belfast. So he's also helped by the locals to go from place to place. Um, his name is Johnny, Johnny McQueen. And uh, um, this has been pointed out uh, previously by other academics. But I would say I would add as, as, as something else um, that both films foreground the, the census as a tool of, of survival. So the characters use their sensorial abilities in order to navigate a very hostile environment from their perspective. And uh, for example, in Odd Man Out, um, Johnny, uh, he just left prison. So he has hallucinations. He's very disoriented in terms of his vision which is one of the senses, right? So that, that exposes his life to a lot of danger because he completely loses in the middle of the street or in, you know, in public places. And, uh, uh, and sound is also a very important uh, tool in the film because it's a generator of, of danger and approaching cars, you don't see uh, the, the source of the sound, but you can hear the sound. Approaching cars, slamming doors, shots being fired, you know, and all of these are threat indicators. And all of this creates a hostile environment. So I'd say, yes, very similar to 71. Yeah, so thank you for the question. Would anyone else like to ask any other questions? If I may oh, <laughs> ask a <of> question, <laughs> please. Um, my question is to Jessica. So Jessica, um, I remember your your paper from the inception, the inception of your paper. Um, so, is there anything that you think um, uh, was transformed from that moment that you initially thought of the theme 
and uh, uh, the work that you wanted to, to analyze, was there any transformation that you thought, oh, this, is, this, is, this has become a really interesting topic and I'm going to base my paper on it? Was there anything like that? Yes, uh, I, I guess my sound is bad again, but sorry for that. Um, I not only was I informed by this talk today by Stacey Gregg, but my readings recently about masculinity have given me a lot more nuance to, to this category, which is not necessarily a category, right? It's a construct, it's an idea. So I think this is the, the central transformation <laughs> since the inception of the, the investigation on masculinity. Um, I still need to have more insights on violence, but definitely masculinity uh, has been more complex for me in a good way. Thank you for the Thanks. question. Thanks, Jessica. So Fabricio, we've got a, a question here for you. What was it that made it click for you that um, the connection between Gary Adams and Lula? Uh some things but i think the first one would be the beard the white beard no, i'm just kidding um but of course the image they are very they are not very but they are similar and uh the place they they occupy in uh, collective imaginary of everybody like for me from what i read jerry adams represents all this for a, a, a specific group represents of like everything you have to fight against. And I think Lula became this image here in Brazil. Although when he finished his uh, second term uh, here, his approval was very high because of the way the scandals, the, how can I say this? the corruption scandals were shown in the media and how the, the story was told. He became, I think, one of the biggest enemies of a group as well. So he represents everything that you should find a fight against, especially this communist ghost that goes around Brazil since the 60s. Yes, I think that would be, and the, the comical uh, factor, when when he says in the play that like, oh, my granddaughter was Lula, you connect to this group, you connect to this idea like out, automatically. There's no way you can't connect with it, especially, oh, of course, if you are a Brazilian person uh, watching or reading the play. Yeah, I would say that. Right, so we have one question here for Kathleen. Kathleen, do you think 71 is in danger of giving sympathy to individual soldiers rather than dealing with their role as an instrument of the British state? Okay, yeah, Lance, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, that's what I thought at first because you have the British soldiers suffering throughout the film. You have the British soldier's body being the focus of violation for most of the narrative, you also have other uh, locals suffering violence as well. We cannot forget that. But uh, because of the ending, I think that there is, there is a more d diluted idea of, of, of giving sympathy to a British soldier because he leaves the army. 
So by leaving the army, I think there is, there is a very strong connotation of going against that ideology. Um, and by the film depicting that those images of the British military sweeping the dirt under the rug um, and him and Gary witnessing that, I think in a way, uh, you know, shies away from the idea of just the hurt British soldier and putting a bit of the guilt on the British military. So, yeah. Thank you, Lance. All right, it's three o'clock now. And so we officially end panel two. Thank you everyone for the questions, for the great presentations that we had and for participating. And we will have a coffee break now. Take care to everyone.
Hello. Now, hello. Well, hello, Beatrice. Can you hear me, maybe? Hi, Barry. We are online. Yeah, sure. Uh, we are online in YouTube because there is no real break. That's perfect. <laughs> but good to see you. Yes, good to very, see you. Very, very well. We are online. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, we are online in YouTube because there is no real break. <laughs> but good to see you. Yes, good to very, see you. Very well. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay.
So, uh, good afternoon, good everybody. everybody. And I'm waiting and for, for Mary, Mary to join us. Uh, uh, Professor, your sound is a bit echoey. Yeah, because yeah. apparently, apparently I've, I've, joined I've joined twice. twice. So I'll try to. There we go. So uh, fine, yeah. Thank you. Good to see you, Barry. And uh, it's been a while since we last saw each other in person uh, in Galway. Uh, since then, it has been only online events. Uh, the last one, I am still uh, in, po in Poland, but virtually uh, this July. So I am really pleased to introduce our third uh, guest today, Dr. Barry Hulihan. He is a theatre act activist at the National University of Ireland, Galway, where he lectures in Irish theatre history and digital cultures. Barry's monograph, Theatre and Archival Memory, Irish Drama and Marginalised Histories from 1951 to 1977 is recently published by Paul Grave Macmillan. He also edited Navigating Ireland's Theatre Archive, Theory, Practice, Performance, and I have it here uh, with me. Published in 2019 and co-edited Shaw and Legacy, a special issue of Shaw, the Journal of Bernard Shaw's Studies. He has recently curated digital theatre exhibitions on the work of theatre designer Joe Vanek and of the actress Genevieve Lyons. Uh, I first met, met Barry when I was in Galway as a visiting, uh, as a visiting researcher. So I know well what it is, what a, a pleasant and rich experience it is to do research uh, from the archives in uh, the National University of Ireland, Galway. The title of his lecture today is Sound and Vision, the Technology of Memory in Contemporary Irish Drama. The lecture investigates the role and the means by which memory is represented and digitally reconstructed in contemporary Irish drama, focusing on works by Dead Center Theatre Company. So, so much looking forward to uh, your lecture, Barry, and learning more about the technology of memory. Welcome to mm -hmm. Florianopolis, even if digitally. Great, great. Thank you so much, Beatrice, and, uh, and to all your colleagues there. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure uh, to be joining you this evening here from Galway and from Inuai Galway uh, campus. And uh, I, I only wish we were able to welcome you all to Galway uh, at some point in the future, or else we can reconvene in the real world, at least, as well as this online uh, realm. But it's such a great pleasure to be here. And again, my thanks to the wonderful Beatrice Bastos and all wonderful, equally wonderful colleagues there for hosting and organizing um, this event. So uh, I will just begin by sharing a screen here. So just bear with me for just a second. Okay. Now, so hopefully all is, oops, let's go back one. All is hopefully live. So if I'm on mute or anything like that, please let me know. Okay. Well, as Beatrice introduced, um, my, my talk today is at that point of intersection between theatre uh, and technology in contemporary Irish drama. Um, and part of the issues and questions I've been interested in researching in recent times is that means in which memory is presented on stage, represented on stage and digitally reconstructed um, in many numerous recent works. And I'll give an overview more generally on that place of digital technology in Irish theatre and focusing, as Beatrice said, on works by Dead Centre Theatre Company um, from their Irish Times Theatre award-winning play Lippy in 2013, true to their Chekhov's first play in 2015, uh, and also mentioned some other uh, recent works in contemporary Irish drama that have really been so enriched and made so fascinating by um, the place and role um, uh, and exploitation, really, of, of digital means and technology to create a new form of, of witnessing. So within all these plays are various modes of memory, digitally reconstructed and animated for audiences to witness and to re-witness. 
And this dual presence and absence of experience made live once more on the stage um, happens through that technology of memory. But so then where to begin? And for an example that set me thinking about the role of technology and memory and our own means of archiving and the digital artifact of live and digital theater, uh, I actually first turn to uh, the singer David Bowie. Um, now the Bowie fans among you might have spotted uh, sound and vision in the talk in the title of this talk as being the, the title of a Bowie song itself. But if you can indulge my fandom for just another moment. So in 2016, after David Bowie died, British music journalist David Hepworth recounted how his own internal memory was, was casting doubt over his memory and recollection of when and how and where he first heard and encountered David Bowie. He had a memory in his mind that it was on television sometime in the 1970s and how the medium of television affected his witnessing of Bowie's performance of the first time he saw Starman. So in order to solve his own lapse of memory, Hepworth turned to the online video platform YouTube and said, I went to YouTube just now to see if the memory I've kept in my head for the last 43 years is correct. When David Bowie appeared on Top of the Pops in July 1972 performing Starman, did he really point at the camera on the line, I had to phone someone so I picked on you? He did. In the glory days of Top of the Pops on television, you couldn't watch things again. You retained them in your archive of memory. People watched hungrily, believing it would be their only chance. And Hepworth's point here relates to how we all behaved pre-COVID-19, but thankfully still do, of course, in live theatres again, as we gather as theatre goers and gather as an audience, um, and how people did as viewers of television in days before digital media. So we all gather and watch as a collective audience, in collective silence, in darkness, in a theatre, as the labour of performance unfolds before us. And that memory re we retain from that is both live and an embodied one. It's recollected afterwards and brought back in pieces responsive to our emotional, physical or sensory memory and their associations with parts of the play. What did, for example, a particular scene feel like? How was a line delivered? How did others in the audience react? All parts of what you recall, but which is never total. And that process itself has changed over the last two years, where the space of witnessing has become a dual one. The onset of COVID-19 has meant we became present and live in different ways. Present and live online as part of a global audience, as, as indeed we are today, and yet still within our own private spaces, watching live theatre from kitchens and bedrooms on various electronic devices to a live performance somewhere else in another country in an empty theatre. Live chat functions allowed real-time conversations to happen among audience members and conversations and reactions continued afterwards on social media. You can even watch theatre on demand after the play has ended. So for contemporary Irish drama, it has become uh, something like a dual space of a digital and physical encounter with the Performance Act. So to expand a little bit further on what I mean and what I've been drawing on on this topic of the technology of memory uh, in performance, the, the personal archive of memory that, that Hepworth mentioned uh, is synonymous with entering a new territory of big data and of artificial intelligence supported by vast in, interconnected data centers, each housing in itself, mass data, mass data servers, which collect and preserve our data. Every website we click on produces a digital footprint, the cookies, uh, as they call them, that we click and accept without a second thought in most cases, all end up housed and preserved in these data centers. But as humans, we've always outsourced our store of memory beyond our human technology of the brain, from the earliest oral cultures to the earliest forms of documentation, from cuneiform tablets to papyrus, vellum and skins, from paper to glass photographic negatives and wax cylinders, through to cassette tapes, CDs, mini discs to the digital MP3, and countless other now obsolete analog and even obsolete digital media by now. Our memory has always been augmented, enhanced, retrieved, and displayed back to us in a reperformance of our past selves. So, oh yes, I'm sorry, that was that was David Boy from the earlier discussion. But John John Cheney Lippold in his book We Are Data traces how the power and potential of our personal data archives are essentially a, a digital performance conducted for corporate gain within the neoliberal consensus. Uh, to quote Lippold from his book, 
algorithms transcode concepts like gender, race, class, and even citizenship into a quantitative measurable type and form and recognizes how these measurable types reconfigure our conceptions of control and power in a digitally networked world. In their book about new media are entitled New Media Dramaturgy, uh, Performance Media and New Materialism, Peter Eckersall, Helena Graham and Edward Shear have tracked the practice of technology and new media dramaturgy over the last two decades. The authors survey new performance works internationally thought to have uh, and have reflected, sorry, how technology and performance has improved or expanded on a, dra a new form of dra dramaturgical process, all the time communicating a message and image through live theatre. And in the book, the, the editors discuss elements from digital projection to light, atmosphere, sound, acoustics, robotics, Android actors, machine design, and a range of other facets of this new media dramaturgy, all uh, exploring that notion of liveness as well as the questioning of form and digital liveness as part of what is theatre today. And perhaps just one other final example is Mark O'Connell's recent book on transhumanism, To Be a Machine, which, be in, which in itself became a digital play in 2020 by Dead Centre at the Dublin Theatre Festival. And in the book, O'Connell questions what happens when the jump into digital identity becomes such an obsession that for those who seek to bypass even their own biological humanity, and to exist as a machine. Uh, and O'Connell outlined the rationale for his book by saying, I wanted to know what it meant to think of yourself as no more or no less than a complex pattern of information. I wanted to know how you might upload your mind into a computer or some other hardware with the aim of existing eternally as code. I wanted to learn what it meant to be a machine or to imagine yourself as one. So again, with all these thoughts and background and contextual writings, uh, among many others, the point of digital performance or digital technology in itself is, is very hard to singularly quantify or define. Moving on to one other aspect of this is about theatre and social media. And in a book entitled Exactly That, Theatre and Social Media, Patrick Lonergan has defined social media websites and platforms as sites where people perform identities, becoming an inherently theatrical space. And Lonergan also comments on the transience of the form of social media and the social media artifact, adding that the video itself may be altered either by, by the original creator or by someone else. Different banner ads may appear as I log on from one day to the next. The comments on the website are likely to be added to. To watch something on YouTube involves seeing not just the video, but also the various frames that contain the video. So then I, I try to add to, to Patrick's talking and framing of digital performance and the memory of the digital artifact um, through various work here at NUIG and within our own digital theatre collections. And a, a kind of strange irony arises where the stability of the digital object and the digital recording is becoming perhaps more unstable um, uh, through their online form. Um, but looking at a recent example of all this within Irish theatre was in 2014, as Ireland was then in the early stages of the marriage equality referendum that would pass in the following year and make full legal recognition for same-sex marriage in Ireland. At the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, James Plunkett played The Risen People, which depicted the 1913 strike and lockout in Dublin, which was a citywide working class strike in 1913, was followed in each night of the performance uh, by a, a noble call, an event to a post-show response by artists, singers, poets and activists and others to the theme of Plunkett's play. On one night, Panty Bliss, the drag artist and the official Queen of Ireland and self-declared gender discombobulist delivered her noble call in the form of a speech from the Abbey main stage in February 2014. And in that speech on the Abbey stage, uh, Panty Bliss outlined incidents of homophobia that she encountered in Ireland. Um, there was a particular refrain as each incident was recalled, a refrain was said each time, that feels oppressive. And it related back to the personal experiences of homophobia in Ireland by both Panty Bliss, but also her alter ego of Rory O'Neill. Now the speech was recorded and it became a viral video on social media in the days that followed, attracting a global audience. And it had a definite impact on raising awareness on the marriage equality campaign in Ireland. But it also wasn't a play. It was recorded, but it's not included in the digital archive of the Abbey Theatre, which we hold here at NUI Galway. And that speech, hugely important as it was from the stage of Ireland's National Theatre, 
exists only on YouTube, and it does so for now. So that speech and its powerful refrain, that feels oppressive, may yet prove to be among the most important words ever spoken on the Abbey Theatre and on, our, on the stage of Ireland's National Theatre. But its digital memory and our ability to access it into the future at the moment depends on YouTube as a medium to preserve it. So this commentary on the ability or the, or the perhaps risk of social media as a, as a supporting medium for performance memory has also been explored by people like Tracy Davis, performance scholar, who said, the communal act of viewing normally helps us forge a public realm, connecting private experiences from the private to the public. And we reckon with our own reactions privately, but do so literally in public. So there's all these blurring of the private and the public, even our own identities and how these meet the public space. Um, which all converge in the online world of social media. So to look a bit more on a, as a brief survey of some really key works in contemporary Irish theatre that have incorporated technology uh, and digital memory in various ways into their work. So Pan Pan Theatre Company, uh, a company uh, uh, ongoing in Ireland, doing really, really fasc uh, fascinating and interesting work since the early 1990s, and thankfully whose archive is also with us at Inu Galway and being uh, preserved at the moment. But one of their works, um, or one of their areas of focus has been on the audio and the radio plays of Samuel Beckett um, from All That Fall in 2011 to Cascando in 2020. Both audio plays in which the audience experience was encountered in a, in a biological co-rhythm between body, technology, space and place. Uh, I think I have these images just in reverse here, so I'll jump forward to this is All That Fall. And in All That Fall, audiences were seated in a darkened space, illuminated by strips of spotlight along the side walls and back wall. Each member was seated in their individual rocking chair, allowing each audience member to physically move in the darkness, mixed with the sound like bodies gently floating by each other in rhythm. In Cascando, as part of the 2020 Galway International Arts Festival, which was restricted owing to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, Individuals walked dressed in a hooded robe, wearing a set of headphones connected to an iPod that was preloaded with the audio of the play. Led by a company member, the single file procession of all audience members walked their way through the mid-afternoon streets of Galway and saw everyone experience the city at a slow, steady pace on foot where each stride was never broken throughout the 40 minute walk around the city. All audience members passed through um, the winding city streets, returning an agency and a central point of power to the pedestrian over the, over the mechanics of cars and buses which choke up the congested city streets. So at every junction, at every crosswalk, uh, at every traffic light, stewards and company members of Pan Pan were already there with prior permission to close off the, the, route, the right of way to traffic. So the pedestrians, the walkers, had a constant flow um, of, of, um, of ability to move around the city at all times. So while your mind was listening to the audio coming at through and in through your headphones, your body was moving through a digital space and time with the speech of Beckett's audio grounding you in the present environment. Again, we've seen different ways through uh, contemporary Irish opera embarking on new engagements with technological performance. Operas composed by Donica Dinehy and written by Inda Walsh, for example, which have premiered at the Galway International Arts Festival and the Dublin Theatre Festival, respectively, in recent years, are further examples of such intersections of technology uh, and contemporary Irish drama. The second violinist, starring our actor Aaron Monaghan, uh, in the role of Martin, in the, in the title character of the second violinist, exists as a loner, an isolated figure, who exists online under various names and guises through his various online profiles, and which, as he edits them on live within the play on his phone, we see him curating his avatar existence displayed onto the vast back wall of the digital LED screen, which spans the entire rear of the stage set designed by Jamie Varton. As the domestic relationship of the married couple in the play reaches a violent and bloody end, it is contrasted with a digital display of nature images broadcast onto that vast uh, screen at the back wall, a jarring reminder of human brutality against both the natural world as against itself in the human world and against the Anthropocene. Irish National Opera have continued their remarkably ingenious stagecraft recently by infusing further technology and questioning of the self and the performance archive, uh, or sorry, of the personal archive and identity at the heart of other works, such as Least Like the Other, an opera that told the story of Rose Kennedy, 
of the uh, Rose Kennedy of the American political dynasty who endured a lobotomy operation in 1941 when she was aged just 23. The play utilized this sense of lost personal agency through the digital projection and the physical placement of historical documents and filing cabinets on stage and also projected around the performance space. And again, these symbols of the archive and of the filing cabinets and of the locked hidden records signifies the Kennedy family's own hidden secrets regarding their forcing Rose to undergo the lobotomy at such a young age. Perhaps just one final example is that of Incantata, the stage adaptation of Paul Muldoon's poem written in grief and loss in the wake of the death of his partner, the American visual artist Mary Farrell Powers in the early 1990s. In this recent example, again produced at the Galway International Arts Festival and later in New York, Stanley Townsend plays the grieving character in the one-man play, where he creates a live cyborg character from an old video camcorder, which he attaches onto a chair and dresses the object tenderly in a hat and coat, while he talks to this technological recreation of his lost lover. Townsend live broadcasts himself as he speaks to the lens of the camera, and it becomes broadcast, as you can see on screen around the theatre. It's a remarkably effective portrayal of working through grief when the only tangible remains are now digital memories, photographs on a screen, and raises questions of how we can connect with our lost ones and loved ones. How can we love instead a piece or fragment of technology? Is it still our loved one when their voice, image and presence is recorded and displayed back to us? Where is their liveness? It is still our loved one. It is still their voice and image. But does it fool our senses into believing that they are still present, or is it a digital avatar? Again, as Stanley Townsend added in an interview about the play and about his role in portraying the grieving poet, he said, what it is primarily for me as an artist is wrestling with grief. It seems he is trying to make peace, make a piece of art to remember her, and he's conflicted about doing it. He remembers her then and all the things they shared, moments, arguments, picnics, people, walks, drinks, travels, if he finds anything through the poem, it is simply to remember her. So all these examples are plays or operas or now digital plays, if, if we can define them as such. And they've all incorporated the facets of new media dramaturgy as outlined by Ecker, Sal, Grahan and Shear. And again, position contemporary Irish drama firmly at this intersection of theatre and technology. So then to move on to uh, a case study of Dead Centre, theatre company who've been producing some of the most really truly fascinating work in recent years, uh, if not also the hugely, most hugely technologically demanding of new theatre works also. So Dead Centre itself was founded in 2012 uh, by Bush Marcuse, Ben Cade and Adam Welsh. And Dead Centre's first project, Souvenir, was created for the Dublin Fringe in 2012, where it was nominated for three awards. Its next work, Lippy, which I'll discuss in, in detail, was premiered at the French Festival again in 2013 and won the overall Irish Times Best Theatre Production Award. As stated on their website, perhaps quite modestly, Dead Centre make things in theatres. Uh, but it's perhaps how they make things and the means by which Dead Centre utilise digital technology and design fully integrated as part of their performance work, not merely as an adornment or a backdrop, which makes their work so engaging and on a new uh, a new digital realm. So Lippy was written by Marco Halloran, with, uh, with, by Bush Marcuse, sorry, with Marco Halloran, noted as being a dead center text. The play is based on events which took place in 2000 in Leakslip, County Kildare, a commuter town less than 40 minutes from Dublin city. An elderly woman in her 80s and her three nieces barricaded themselves into their home, blocking their house door with a fridge, turning the heating to full temperature during an already warm summer period and entered into a suicide pact to starve themselves to death, which lasted 40 days. Their bodies were found by the owner of the house who was coming to hand deliver a letter of eviction to the family. They had not been seen or heard locally for months beforehand. It is a tragic and horrific event involving a vulnerable group of people who, are, who were already on the periphery of society, who are unseen, unheard, left alone and isolated by those around them in the community, by all, but also isolated by the mechanisms of the state and its many layers of social care bureaucracy. And in the age of our hyper connectivity of round the clock, instant messages, email, checking and geotagging our locations, the saturation of communication technology has actually ironically contributed to our being less present and less attuned to the events unfolding 
uh, in our own communities, as examples as in the house in Leakslip in County Kildare. The Aid Centre created an intermedial performance piece, Lippy, about a lip reader's interpretation of recorded memory, which is ironically underpinned by the digital voice and its counterpoint of silence, and how documentary material of one's identity, be it physical or digital, presents only fragmentary evidence of ourselves in reality. What we leave behind does not accurately portray our existence, our well-being, our mental, physical or emotional health. The play Lippy then offers a version of the final hours of the women in the house in Leakslip. The play's creators, Marcusel and O'Halloran, stated that we weren't there, we don't know what they said, this is not their story. But as the play is described as not being the women's story, well then whose story is it? And how is it retold? And a key element of this retelling and of much of Dead Center's work is about digital documentation the records and information that form our own story and our own identity. And these are then made live digitally on stage to tell our stories in new ways into production of a performance of memory. Lippy was directed by Marcusel with Ben Kidd, and the play includes characters of an interviewer who is conducting a, a so-called live post-show talk for a play, which you don't see and which we arrive at as the real audience, but the play is already over. So when we arrive in as audience members for Lippy, we are met with the characters of an interviewer uh, waiting for his actors to arrive back out onto the stage from a performance we don't see. The, the, the show is already over. A technician's sound desk sits at the side of the stage and that becomes in itself a key character. The technician is a stage manager for the digital soundscape of the play. The technician's table is covered in wires, laptops, a sound desk, a projector is being plugged in. There is music playing and the atmosphere is fairly casual. The interviewer uh, and the technician are waiting for the others to arrive for the post-show talk to begin. Once the real audience have all, began, have all entered, it has become apparent that the show needs to get started. The technician whispers in the interviewer's ear, they kill the music and the show begins. So all is framed in a very meta-theatrical way, as we the live audience are filing in for an absent, filling the role of an absent audience in a fictional post-show talk for a performance that's never actually happened. In Lippy, the character of the lip reader is being interviewed on stage and he explores the background of how he was researching the play himself, uh, describing re uh, watching YouTube videos, um, searching online images, online articles, the steps all of us nowadays find and begin our own information and research in the digital infosphere rather than beginning work on paper. Yet the very documents that define our existence and mark our memory in society begin on paper from your own birth certificate onwards. As the lip reader says in the play, the idea of basing the play around documentation, he says, was came one day from one of the actresses as who was emptying her handbag, all her receipts spilled out. And in the end, it was the idea, as you saw, that we were defined by our documents, that our lives are lists, sort of shopping receipts. So that power of lip reading within the play is about uncovering a hidden speech, a speech unheard by others. And as the lip reader and the interviewer are talking about, uh, about that idea of hidden speech and how they research this idea, they themselves screen various YouTube clips. For instance, they screen or show a clip from Casino, the Martin Scorsese movie, where gangsters cover their mouths when speaking to avoid being lip read by watching detectives as a form of manual, uh, as a sort of manual block against sound distortion. Another clip showed British footballer John Terry uh, within the play, who was in a, in a well-publicized event at the time, directed racist abuse at a rival player in the middle of a game, which wasn't heard or recorded, uh, which wasn't heard at the time, but which was recorded by live television cameras. The racist speech was lip-read uh, on a television replay and reminded us, as the play's message and of Dead Center's examination, around the power of documentation. As the lip-reader says in the play, the power, lip reading is the power of putting words in people's mouths. The lip reader goes on to explain that in reference to the house in Kildare and to the family who were part of the suicide pact, who, the, the Gardaí, the Irish police, who were investigating the deaths of the four women, approached the lip reader to study CCTV footage of the surrounding areas in which the women were last seen in. The lip reader's task was to listen back and listen in to their silent but recorded speech captured on film. 
And while CCTV of public areas carries its own ethical and data protection concerns, the lip reader explains his work as providing an interpretation, was providing meaning to the silent words on screen. He further adds that the mistake everyone makes is by concentrating on just the lips. The words are in the face, he says, realizing as a form of facial recognition, another technological layering upon the body used by social media and public security, by which is being heavily criticized by data protection experts. And recently, Facebook or Meta, as now the parent company is known as, have backtracked on its use of facial recognition software as it had used on previously millions of Facebook photographs as a means of identifying us all in the digital realm. So towards the end of this sequence in the play, a noise begins to uh, be emitted from the sound desk to the stage left, a hum or a whine of a machine, and it starts to build in intensity. And we notice that the technician is gradually lowering the volume on stage, the microphones and headphones of the interviewer and the lip reader. What is left is that both characters continue to talk to each other, but in silence, their lips are moving, but no sound is audible to the audience. They then stop, the machine now stops, and the technician begins singing into his microphone. He sings the following lines. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. An old Cherokee song. He finishes and begins again, but this time he loops it. He loops his own voice, recorded it, and adds it and layers the sound. This happens a second time and a third time, so that his singing of these lines is looped with four voices on top of each other. At this stage, the sta or at this point, the stage is cleared. The lip reader is alone on stage. Once this is finished, the lip reader speaks into his microphone and he starts to tell the live, the live audience that he was working investigating the case of the women who died in the house in Leakslip. So at this point, I might just play a short clip, a video clip from Lippy, just to see and indeed hear um, some of these points. So just while I minimize this and hope that technology uh, will uh, play ball. Let me just see, sorry. Uh, I might just load up again. And just simply get the trailer for the, the show, which this is it. Hello, everyone. Thanks for staying behind. It's great that so many of you have stuck around. When you were born, you cried, and the world rejoiced. Live your life so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. When you were born, you cried. When you were born, and you cried. When you were born, you cried. Live your life so that. Live your life so that. Live your life so that when, when you die, so when you die the world rejoice. rejoice and you rejoice. When you were born, you cried. When you were born, and you cried. When you were born, you cried. Live your life so that. 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 Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, great. Okay, so the lip reader begins in the second part of the play, uh, or just before the second part of the play, to tell the audience his version of the events, his memory of what he has recovered from investigating it. Um, just to read a little bit from the, the lip reader's statement. It was July the 12th when their bodies were found, back in 2000. 
They didn't want to be found. The Gardaí found three of the women in the front room wrapped in a duvet. They appeared to be wearing nightdresses, but the fort was in the kitchen, sort of sat, sunk, dead, and a pile of bin bags. It was the Mulroonies, the aunt and three nieces, and they had made a decision to die. The last time any of them were seen in public was two of the sisters, Catherine and Josephine, on a shopping trip to Dublin. They got them on CCTV. I read their lips. I saw what they said. So within the house, and as you can see in this shot on screen, as well as committing themselves to this final act, the women destroyed all records they had belonging to themselves in the house, shredding every document that would have identified them to whoever would have discovered them. In the play, this is described to the audience as the women made all paper wet, so it was all mush, almost papier mache, totally unreadable. It's like they didn't just want to die and leave this world. They wanted to get rid of any trace of their existence. They wanted to make it like they were never here, completely cover the tracks of their existence. So this becomes more of an act of self-deletion from the, from the human world to prevent future memory of their existence and it is incorporated into the staging, as you can see on the screen here. The estate, the housing estate in which the women lived and died in Leakslip, County Kildare, uh, was referred to by the locals as Cyber Plains. It was a number of new estates that housed the workers at the local multinational computer plants, Hewlett Packard and also Intel. The latter, then one of Ireland's largest private sector employers with over three and a half thousand full time employees, the economic crash of 2008 and 9 greatly affected the jobs uh, and many, with many, many losses at these plants in the so-called cyber plains in County Kildare. So in the second part of the play, the action returns to what you can see on screen, the internal, sty, uh, internal uh, view of the Mulroonies house, where the sisters are about to begin their pact. The forensics team arrives and assesses the scene while the sisters' bodies and the evidence are lying strewn around the stage. As this continues, the voice of the lip reader from Act One is digitally looped back on in repeat. And in this second act, it reminds the audience that as the women destroy both their human body and of their documented paper remains, the lip reader witnessed all of them still as a digital recording, their last surviving record. He saw their words. Over the final scene of the play, the sisters enter their final liminal phase of dual presence between this life and another life. In the present and towards their hope, spiritual permanence in heaven, which they were hoping to reach. And like Mark O'Connell in his book, To Be a Machine, exploring transhumanism and the digital technology that preserves the human mind rather than the human body. As one of the nieces in the play, uh, says in the play, uh, her name is Bridge Ruth. She says, we must cast off these dense physical bodies, which to me are like great overcoats, which our soul inhabits. And when worn out, we cast them off and ascend into the higher realms in my opinion, our true home. This is, after all, what our saviour, Jesus Christ, came to teach us. The play concludes with a lengthy prayer-like incantation, which begins with the following words, which is again said by Bridge Ruth, one of the nieces. She says, me, hear, my voice, this voice. And it continues. Until it reaches the final stage directions, the mouth that was projected onto the backstage, showing the lips um, speaking the words, has now been, is now gone. Everything has gone. It is a completely bare space. No room in leak slip, no paper, no debris, no bodies, an empty theater, the lights fade and black out. And it's a fitting end to what is a, an unbelievably brutal and tragic story, um, but Jet Dead Center did something really quite innovative in trying to show the humanity in their story, in the, in, in the Mulroney story, but put the, the bleakness of existence back onto those who survived who were completely unaware, living next door to what was happening behind the walls of the house. Just to move into one final piece by Dead Centre to, to, to talk about before I finish up, which is Chekhov, a play called Chekhov's First Play, again produced by Dead Centre and adapted from uh, Lauren Senelec's translation of Chekhov's untitled play, most commonly known as Platonov and most agreed by all to be utterly unstageable. Um, the play was left behind and found in a safe deposit box, um, and as I said, generally dismissed as being unstageable. Um, Chekhov's first play, oh yeah, that's the, the final scene of, of, uh, of Lippi. Um, two other pieces by Dead Centre, Hamnet and Beckett's Room. I just won't have time today, so I'll, I'll move on to, to Chekhov's first play. 
Uh, and it opens with another meta theatrical framing with the director Bush Marcuse playing the role of a director coming onto the stage to address the audience. And he explains why all audience members are wearing headphones. They're going to watch a play, but listen to the director's commentary through their headphones. As Bush, as the actual director, he raises the principle of Chekhov's gun, that if a gun is on stage in the first act, it must fire in the last act, or that in the elements of the play must all contribute to the resolution of the drama, which all makes sense in a realist traditional uh, play. In the digital post-dramatic form, as outlined by Hans Thies Lehmann in his book on post-dramatic theatre, the elements of performance do not form a logical sequence. In the digital space, they can be paused, upgraded, live like a piece of software. And this is what happens in Dead Centers, Chekhov's first play. The action opens in a traditional Chekhovian rural estate with Russian gentry waiting the arrival of Platonov. Through the headphones, the audience hear the actors, but also the director's commentary, which is very funny, very you know, revealing gossip about the actors or who messed up in rehearsal, things like that. It's also explaining the often dense nature of these classical texts uh, so it becomes like a director's commentary, one of the added features we all came accustomed to in, in DVD life when we, were, when we were all buying DVDs. So the characters are waiting for Platonov, but like Godot, he never arrives, or almost. Each night, an audience member plays Platonov. And on the night I saw the play, Platonov happened to be me. Not that I was prepared for that, but there was no prior notice until about 15 minutes prior to the curtain. I was asked by the director, picked at random from the audience, to wear a red corduroy jacket, sit in an assigned seat and wear a specific set of headphones given to me and simply to await further instructions. So 20 minutes into the play, where my headphones were set onto a different frequency, those instructions did arrive and came from the co-director, Ben Kidd. I followed those instructions dutifully, if not also quite terrified, as I was instructed to stand up in the middle of the play at the packed Samuel Beckett Theatre during the Dublin Theatre Festival. I'm spotlit and I follow the instructions of my co-director through my headphones and I walk up onto the stage. The play is essentially after being pressed pause on. The action stops and arguably this is where Chekhov's play stops and Dead Center's new play begins. A new character has arrived. I become a digital puppet on stage for the next 30 minutes or so, interacting with the characters, handing them items to use, drinking shots of Russian vodka, which sadly was water, still a play after all, um, and through my form of, of, of physical avatar, I was playing Platonov in a live play. But I'm still completely unaware of what is being said to the real audience sitting in their seats listening to their headphones and who are still being spoken to by Bush Marcuse. In the final moments of the play, it, ta it takes the form of a game of Russian roulette. All the guests at this party, including me, sit around and pass Chekhov's gun until it rests with me. And I won't spoil all the action, but as the curtain later falls, I am the sole character left on stage. And I am a character. It's not me. It's not Barry. It's, it's, it's this human avatar. The published text of the play reveals what is heard by the audience in their headphones at that moment. And this is what it said. I wonder, will this voice ever stop? The voice in my head, this commentary, commentating on everything. Will it ever go away? It doesn't even sound like me. Where would I go if I could go? Who would I be if I could be? And what would I say? Start with one word. Which word? In my head, or at least in my headphones at least, Ben Kidd tells me that one word which I am to say into the microphone in my hand. It is the word hello and then blackout. So the play is a truly unique experience and a technological feat of suspending not just disbelief but suspending physical reality as my actions are directed by the digital voice in my head. The play ends on a powerful note to make present Outside of all the other concerns of the play and themes discussed from society to debt to relationships to housing and finance, the word hello was the only word I spoke or my character spoke. And it declares you present and it declares you live. By staging digital absence, Dead Centre creates a performance space inhabited by the stories, experiences and realizations of human form and contact through digital means. So to conclude then, all these records, um, all these memories, all these digital memories are all in some way made navigable by the application of order, a hierarchy of systems or arrangements, like, like how you would organize your My Documents folder on your laptop. 
It's a catalogue, and such catalogues serve as search engines through limitless levels of information, endless metadata, the descriptions and context of historical records. And while uh, writer Brian Dillon describes the creation of such lists and catalogues in his recent book about essays called Essayism, he calls the creation of lists and catalogues a form of prose in itself that does not accommodate any sort of flux. Memory, as, as Dillon writes, must start, tell, and stop. The archival space, the memory space then, made navigable, navigable by technology, is built upon such processes of ordered memory. So from virtual memory to augmented reality, the layering of technological performance upon our minds and upon our bodies as theatre goers will continue to bring us new experiences to superimpose a computer generated image upon the user's view of the present real world in order to create a composite dual reality, a digital present that is still live and present. All this work tightly embraces the aid of digital technology with painstaking video, video and sound editing, mixing the recorded and pre-recorded in the midst of a live feed. As the framework of truth and believed conceptions of what we know to be reality are dismantled on stage before us, it becomes apparent that the importance of this work will be to keep challenging what exactly we define as live in theatre and what we define as a play. And perhaps most importantly, we will continue to redefine how we assemble as an audience to listen and to witness. Thank you. So thank you very much, Barry for this uh, fascinating lecture, uh, bringing us recent scholarship on theater and technology, and uh, these beautiful illustrations, uh, slides of uh, recent uh, new media drama dramaturgy, and also your reading of uh, that center's plays. Uh, most of them, or perhaps all of them, kind of new to me and probably to most uh, people watching us uh, at YouTube. I would like to congratulate you and your colleagues at uh, in Galway for the wonderful uh, work you do with and around the digital archive, the theater digital archives at the university, and uh, which I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, will celebrate its 10th anniversary next year. So that's uh, great that we've been having this this uh, this to to work with uh, for, for 10 years now. And uh, as I said, I was fascinated with uh, a couple of uh, things you mentioned, one of them being audiences and how audiences relate to these uh, new media plays. And uh, I mean, it's difficult to, to pinpoint. There's so many interesting things you've brought, like uh, what it is like to be a machine. And I wonder if we have somehow experienced this uh, a little bit, what it is like to be a machine. And uh, the Lippy play, uh, I saw what they said. It's, mm. it's just another fantastic way of putting things in these new, uh, this new frame of uh, digital performance. Uh, I, I, while we wait for, for uh, questions from the floor, I was having a look at, at the book I have. Unfortunately, I don't have your most recent books, your most recent book, but I have the one I bought in the last in-person ISO. Mm. And uh, yeah, there was only one copy. And uh, I think I was the one who bought it. <laughs> but anyway, in the introduction, your colleague, Charlotte MacGyver, she, she mentions that uh, there are debates about the responsibilities of open access of archives and how, who and how we allow to access the collections in line with legal obligations to privacy and confidentiality. So this is a question that uh, people always ask me and I always ask people there, how we can possibly have access to these archives working from where we work from, from, the glo from a global perspective of the Irish studies community. Yeah, thanks so much, Beatrice. Um, all, all really fascinating questions and things to, to think about. Uh, working uh, working as a, as a theatre archivist, we're constantly um, trying to run to, almost to catch up with ourselves, really, in terms of digitising what is the physical record. And one byproduct of the last year and a half of, of the pandemic going theatre going 
is that there is now more digital theatre made and uh, it is in a way perhaps more accessible. I know Dead Centre made all their past works available to watch online. So did um, Pan Pan Theatre Company did that. And it was a way while theatres were closed to maintain a relationship with their audience. And it was a very uh, generous thing to do as well. Um, but a way, it was a, a way for theatre to stay visible. So in a way, hopefully this year, this past year, we'll be able to work to collect and maybe share those continued uh, productions. Going back to the collections we have here, we're, we're dictated so much by copyright um, and what can go online. Even things like making video performances themselves online depends clearing huge amounts of rights. Um, the digital, or sorry, the, uh, the texts, photographs are not without complexity, but easier to work with. Um, you know, I would see my ethos as being to open up as much as possible to as, as vast democratic means as, as possible to share these collections with whoever can access them. Um, it's 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 expensive work. It's it's uh, it's labor intensive work for the university to do that. Um, but we're doing that bit by bit. In the last year, we've released the Jovanic design um, exhibition online, which is a, a digital archive of, of 300 pieces by Jovanic's theater design from Brian Friel's Dancing at Lunasa. Um, to more contemporary work, wonderful, beautiful work. And we'll be doing that likewise with Pan Pan. Um, thanks to my, my colleague, Afka Van Pelt, who is with us as a research student this semester, and she's doing amazing work digitizing um, uh, the Pan Pan archive. And it's thanks to them, we, we will be having permission to share them online in the, in the new year. So we still are, have a lot of work to do, but the more we can share online, the better. Yeah, you were right. Uh, the Joe Vanix uh, archive was made available. And uh, mm -hmm. it's really valuable for us here, for instance, because if I'm not mistaken, he worked with Hugo Hamilton in the Speckled yeah. People's Play. And it was uh, staged here as a staged reading uh, in Portuguese mm -hmm. uh, some years ago. So there is a connection. And it's also in your mother writes, it's saying that uh, in spite of all the difficulties of the pandemic, uh, many uh, theater companies made their plays and uh, available and uh, they were produced uh, with uh, universal access. And that mm. was uh, really generous of them. We have one question here from uh, José Alberto Boche, our colleague at uh, the university. Thanks, Barry. Enticing paper. Can I hear you on what mediatized drama may do to the long-standing maxim of the allegedly indispensable rapport between live action and live audience in theater? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much. That's um, yeah, it's, it's it's such a great question because in some ways we're in the midst of all that in the last, especially in the last year. The, you know, we've all watched plays online and, and logged in to join theaters from around the world and be present in our home place. And yet we're watching these performances and it, we connect in different ways. We experience it in different ways. I, I see companies like Dead Center incorporating the digital liveness into a live performance, which is a slightly different thing from live streaming a play. And what Pan Pan do so well, what Dead Center do so well, is just create a sensory experience, a multi-sensory experience from, from sound, um, you know, even from darkness with light, you know, how they play with all these different elements of dramaturgy from um, like, like Beckett's All That Fall, where the lights were dimmed, everyone is sitting in a rocking chair, and you simply let the audio almost wash over you, and you become immersed in it. Um, the, the Cascando piece I talked about, I, I walked that. And as someone who's lived in Galway for the last 11 years, I, I've never walked a city like that before where you were in control, um, all traffic stopped and you were in a procession one by one walking through and across the busiest roads of the city. Uh, and it was an amazing way to experience a local environment that I could walk blindfolded, but yet it felt like I was doing it in a completely new way for the first time. So we're still, I think, learning from all these different multimedia performances uh, and uh, uh, who knows where it might go in, in the future. Yeah, thanks, Barry. We've just been joined by Lance Patchett. Mesmerizing stuff, Barry. Beckett seems to haunt your paper. To what, mm. to what extent in Krapp's last tape, Analog was B anticipating all of the digital issues you so brilliantly outlined for us? Okay, thank you, Lance. Good to see you virtually. Um, but but crap, crap, I think, is an archivist himself. I mean, when he's calling out all the different spools, that's what he's doing. I mean, in a sense, I hope I'm not doing that and I don't look like that as an archivist when I'm working. Um, but I think Beckett was a, a, a bit fascinated by that. Uh, and it was a recent conference and I think a great book published afterwards on Beckett and technology 
um, which I've, I've heard snippets of, and it's a fascinating um, topic to look into. But if, you know, I think you said, Lance, you know, Beckett maybe haunted that paper, and I feel Beckett haunts Dead Center's work, and he's there present in so many ways. In, and they did a piece called Beckett's Room. Now, that started off as, like Chekhov, it was called Beckett's First Play, and that changed to being uh, Beckett's Room in, at the Gay Theatre in 2020. Uh, 2019, 2020, 2019 it must have been, where there was no actors on stage at all. And we had the props, we had the stage, we had the mechanics of theatre, but no aliveness, we had no actors. Um, and it depicts Beckett's, uh, his apartment in Paris during the 1940s, and when he was fleeing um, uh, as a member of the resistance, fleeing Nazi, um, uh, being, being um, arrested by the Nazis for being a, a member of the resistance. And it was an absolutely amazing piece where the actors' voices were broadcast into that theatre space, um, all the props moved on wires. You can see very, very, very fine wires um, through the theatre. So as chairs moved, as a character was boiling a kettle, the kettle would magically float and water would be poured into it. Um, so it was all done like a giant puppetry set, just technologically mind-blowing. Um, so Beckett is, is a big piece, or a big factor, I should say, for, for Dead Center. And uh, I think how crap and how Beckett and how all these works combined a question of memory is, is, is a sense of, of recalling what is at risk of being forgotten. So as those analog tapes are being wound and rewound re by, by crap, in some ways he's trying to preserve or prevent a, the memory from being lost. Uh, and that's maybe what Dead Center are, are doing as well. Yeah, thanks, Bear. In our group, in our cluster at university, we read, and, and I think Alini mentioned in the beginning, crap's last tape, and we watched that, uh, the clip that is available uh, online. And uh, it's all about... Uh, the materiality of, mm. uh, of language in, in some ways. But anyway, we also have Claire asking you a question, Claire Lynch, to go back to Panty's Noble Call. Would you be happy to describe it as a play? Uh, yeah, hi Claire. Um, I've wrestled with this question so many times in my own head. Um, in a sense, it is a performance. It's Panty speaking and Rory O'Neill you know, is, is Panty's alter ego, but yet there's so many blurred distinctions there. Both Rory O'Neill and Panty have experienced homophobia in both their personalities. Um, it was Panty speaking in the moment. It was, I assume, a scripted piece that was performed and delivered um, so eloquently and so powerfully on the stage that night. Um, is, it a, is it a play? I, I perhaps don't have an answer. And uh, it is. It exists on YouTube. I think basically because a documentary maker was making a, a documentary about Panty at the time, which was which went on to be called the Queen of Ireland. Uh, I, it, it's been such a piece, or it's now so significant in Irish cultural memory that the dress Panty wore on the stage that night was donated to uh, the National Museum of Ireland, and it's on display at the moment. Uh, or at least I know it was donated and was on display. Not sure if it is currently. So it's become a part of the cultural fabric already as an archived item. Um, so uh, hopefully the, the, the speech itself will be available um, on YouTube for, for some time to come. Uh, thank you very much, Bear. We have two minutes before the next panel, next, the last panel. I can't thank you enough for this uh, fascinating uh, presentation of uh, Irish theatre technology memory. And uh, I look forward to seeing this perhaps published or anybody who wants can, can go back to Barry's uh, lecture, it will be available online at uh, PPGI UFSC's YouTube channel. Thank you, Barry, and hope to see oh, you again you. in person soon yes, again. Beatrice. I hope very soon, and thanks to everyone there and to all your colleagues. Bye. Bye now.
Okay, okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? I don't know if I'm online. Yes, okay. So it's kind of lost there because uh, for a moment my mic was muted, my camera was off, but here we are. Okay, um, good afternoon to everyone uh, present here, to the panelists, to, um, to everyone watching us on YouTube. Uh, my name is Jorge Aires Mozinho. Uh, I'm a professor of English language and literature at DLLIE UFSCI. Um, and I'm going to be chairing the next panel uh, called Contemporary Irish Theatre, okay? Uh, we have our panelists who are present here, uh, Luana, Jessica, Vinicius, um, and Larissa. And I'm going to present all of them, to introduce all of them to you uh, so that we can start the presentations uh, right away. Beginning with uh, Vinicius. Um, Vinicius Garcia Valin is a second year PhD candidate at PGI, PPGI UFSCI. During his uh, master's studies at the same program, he concluded research on British and Irish poetry of the Great War with an emphasis on national allegiances and loyalties present in such texts. He is currently researching the five volumes of the Field Day Anthology of Irish Writing, seeking to analyze their editing and critical interaction with the texts they produce, they reproduce, I'm sorry, as well as how the anthology relates to the Irish literary field. Uh, Vinicius, feel free to start the presentation. The floor is yours. Vinicius, uh, we can see you now, but the audio is still uh, mute in case you're wondering. That's all right. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just uh, having a bit of a technical problem trying to juggle all of these technological screens here. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, that's no just... problem. I would just like to ask you whether you are able to see my screen right now, uh, the PDF presentation, I mean. Yes, it's visible. Okay. Um, what am I sh right? Um, okay, uh, can you see it in full screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of our guests, everyone who is watching us right now. Thank you for your attention. Uh, my name is Vinicius, and today I'm going to talk about uh, a play called Jack Duggan's War. So the title of my presentation is Jack Duggan's War, Documentary Theater and Remembrance of the Great War. And what I'm going to talk about, I shall begin my presentation then by discussing, wait a second, I'm, I'm having trouble with the screens, I'm sorry. I guess my computer is in some kind of trouble. Oh, yeah. just a second, excuse me. Oh. Okay, and we're back. <laughs> so uh, I shall begin my presentation by discussing what is meant when we talk about documentary theater. Then I shall turn to the work of Colin Murphy, who is one of Ireland's main dramatists in this genre. I will talk also about Ireland's participation in the Great War, and I will present an analysis of Murphy's play, Jack Duggan's War, which is, of course, connected to that conflict. The term documentary theater, however transparent it might seem at first, is a 
poses is a, is a term that poses a variety of challenges for definition. Gary Dawson, for instance, writes that deciding on this definition is not an exact science and that the multiplicity of attempts that have been made to achieve this definition certainly do not help. Dawson himself defines it as that documentary theater is a theater genre in which primary source documentation is directly incorporated into the dramatic text, which is to say that documentary theater makes use of historical documentation as source material and as a crucial element of plays and productions. He adds that a documentary play is one that has had conferred upon it by the institution named theater the status of a documentary play for the purposes of learning about, recalling, interpreting, or responding to a historical moment, which indicates an engagement by necessity of documentary theater with historical events, whether responding to them or simply bringing a wider awareness to hitherto ignored or underrepresented elements of history. In their introduction to contemporary Irish documentary theater, one of a limited but growing number of works focusing on Irish developments in the genre, Beatriz Bastos and Sean Richards provide a brief historical overview of documentary theater, charting its development in left-wing European theater's response to the political conflicts of the early 20th century, and also its growing popularity in countries such as the United Kingdom and the United States. The genre has, however, blossomed in Ireland only recently, although a few 20th century productions did anticipate elements of this kind of theater. The others further argue that, owing to the absence until recent times of documentary theater in Ireland's mainstream theater circuit, most notably at the Abbey Theater, there is not an established tradition of criticism regarding the Irish expression of such a genre. This situation, however, is changing as productions and practitioners of documentary theater gain prominence, and possibly as a result of documentary theater's intrinsic connection to questions of fact and witness, with plays such as Mary Raftery's No Escape, based on the Ryan Report, galvanizing discussion over traumatic events or turning points in the country's history. One playwright who has been working within the documentary theater genre is Colin Murphy, who has authored several plays dealing with historical moments as distant from each other as the Great War and the 2008 banking crisis. For his plays, Murphy combines factual material resulting from documentary evidence with imaginative reconstruction. With the decade of centenaries in Ireland, remembering key events between 1912 and 1923, Colin Murphy wrote two plays engaging with the commemorations, Jack Duggan's War and Inside the GPO, the latter concerned with the, with the events of Easter week 1916. Jack Duggan's War, which is the focus of this paper, deals with the subject of Irish participation in the Great War, and tells a story which might, like so many others, have been lost in time, if not for the preservation of documents. The play was first staged by ANU Productions in August 2015, marking the centenary of Jack Duggan's death. Murphy wrote the play based on letters between Jack Duggan, an Irish soldier who fought in Gallipoli, his sweetheart at home, Beatrice Simmer, and Mervyn Pratt, a friend and fellow soldier of Duggan's. The letters are today held in the Irish National Archive, and some of them were included in Our War, Ireland and the Great War, a volume critically assessing Ireland's role in the war and the effects of the conflict on the country, edited by John Horne for the Royal Irish Academy. But rather than exploring only the correspondence between these people, Murphy also draws on a witness statement given by George Chester's Doug, Chester Duggan, Jack's older brother, to the Irish Bureau of Military History in the 1950s recording an event involving their father's life during the Easter Rising. The play emerged in a climate of wider cultural reappraisal re re of Irish involvement in the Great War. Um, according uh, in why, uh, involvement in the Great War, Ireland was divided over participation in that war before, during, and after it, owing to the dichotomies it exacerbated between unionism and nationalism, as well as ambivalent attitudes towards Britain. According to Fran Brereton, even though Ireland participated intensively in the Great War, it was also a country with divided loyalties that was on the verge of civil war when the Great War broke out, and which dissolved into civil war at its close. With independence and the Irish Free State, the role of Irish combatants in the war within the British army was largely ignored or sidelined due to its not fitting in with the predominant narrative of independence. It is worth noting that in Northern Ireland, there was also an opposing status conferred to Irish involvement in the war, 
of the exploit of the Ulster Division on the Somme, frequently held as subject for commemoration and remembrance. Emily Pine writes that while these are two very different and indeed mutually exclusive mythologies, they emerge from a very similar decision to construct and commemorate the past in political terms. This ostracism and reticence in the Republic over the Irish who fought in the war would continue for much of the 20th century before the movement of revisionism in recent decades. The downplaying of the Irish role in the Great War was also a consequence of the Easter Rising taking on the role of a foundational myth for the Republic, so that the 1916 rebels, rather than the soldiers on the continent, were glorified. Tom Caro, a nationalist MP and one of the few Irish soldier poets of that war, killed in action in September 1916, is quoted as anticipating the terms in which those who took part in the, conf in the two conflicts would be remembered for the following decades. These men will go down in history as heroes and martyrs, and I will go down, if I go down at all, as a bloody British soldier. The objective of, the, the objective of this paper, then, is to explore how Jack Duggan's war dramatizes these mutually opposing 20th century attitudes in the Republic of Ireland to the Great War and the Easter Rising, especially regarding the different statues given to the two conflicts. Even with the controversies and dichotomies that loom over the Irish experience of the war, there is nevertheless a canon of Irish plays dealing with that experience. George Bernard Shaw, for instance, wrote of Flair TVC in 1915 in an attempt to boost low recruitment numbers. A decade later, Sean O'Casey premiered this staunchly anti-war play, The Silver Tassie, with the use of expressionist techniques and the depictions of horrors of war and returned veterans with disabilities, the play was rejected by Yates for the Abbey Theatre in 1928 and instead premiered in London the following year with an Irish premiere occurring only in 1935. In a completely different context and climate, Frank McGuinness wrote in 1985, observed the sons of Ulster marching towards the Somme, dealing with the war and the terms on which it was remembered, particularly in Northern Ireland. Jack Duggan's war takes place at three different historical moments. Uh, the present in which George Chester Duggan addresses the audience as if a ghost, the stage directions indicate. Second, in 1956, the time of Chester's statement to the Bureau of Military History. And third, in 1915, when the correspondence takes place. The play makes use of a series of ghosts. The initial ghost of Chester conjures the ghosts of the Bureau employees which are then in turn inhabited by the ghosts of Jack, Beatrice, and Mervyn. The play begins with Chester entering the stage, looking at an archive box and collecting letters from the ground before addressing the audience, claiming that he has been waiting for the spectators. Here, the ghosts of 1956 come in, two employees of the bureau, a woman and a man, and a soldier stationed there. Chester is visiting the bureau to give a witness statement on an event that occurred during Easter 1916, his father, suspected by the British of harboring snipers, was close to being shot by a British surgeon. He was saved when the officer in charge saw photos of Jack and their other brother in British Army uniform, prompting the officer to order the soldiers to leave the house. But before explaining this, Chester wants to show the correspondence between his brother and the other two people and tell them of his brother's service. While the war emerges in the play through the letters, it is inside the frame of 1956 that remembrance of the war and the Easter Rising's greater prevalence in public memory at that time become visible. This begins to become clear after the woman welcomes Chester to the bureau, explaining that she and her colleagues are seeking to assemble material to compile the military history of the movement for independence. This is the first demonstration of the greater public interest in the story of independence rather than in the Irish involvement in the war, as there was no similar institutional movement in the 20th century to compile the history of, of Ireland in the war. A few moments later, and after the bureau employee has taken Chester for a British soldier due to his accent, Chester hands the men and the woman pictures of his younger brothers in uniform, to which the woman replies, British soldiers, Mr. Duggan, with Chester correcting her, Irish soldiers in the British army. This could in itself be interpreted as a simple misunderstanding, but the stage direction that instructs the men to reply yes with a doubtful intonation suggests a questioning of the Irishness of those who fought in the war. 
Another and perhaps the most striking questioning of relevance of the Irish Great War experience happens shortly afterwards. The Bureau employee, increasingly impatient with Chester, loses his temper when Chester reveals that the letters are not exactly about Easter week, but about the Dardanelles, to which Jack Duggan's division was sent. The man reacts by saying, I've had enough of this time wasting. Sergeant, will you please escort Mr. Duggan out? Dismissing the relevance of the story Chester has to tell. Such a dismissal, both of Chester's story and of the significance of Irish participation in the war, is reinforced by the men's next lines. There is a queue of people outside with stories to tell us of people who gave their lives for their country, and this man wants to take up our time. Here the opposition is stark. On the one hand, there are those who gave their lives from, for Ireland, that is, those who took part in the rising. They are true patriots, unlike those who fought under the British Army in continental Europe. The sacrifice of the latter, Jack Duggan among them, in this view is not a sacrifice for Ireland. It is then that Chester intervenes, hinting at the connection between his brother's service and the incident with their father. My father nearly gave his life for this country. He wasn't in the GPO. He never joined the volunteers. He didn't side with Collins or Dev, but he was nearly killed by a, soldier, by a British soldier during Easter week. Then, after George has finished, after the characters have read the letters and after George has finished giving his statement, he says, it will be good to have that story acknowledged in public, to which the woman replies that the bureau is not public and that the statements are to be sealed for decades. Uh, we don't want to upset people, to open old wounds, the bureau employee explains, in a display of a tendency to avoid sensitive, taboo topics like Irish engagement in the war at that time. To acknowledge old wounds, Jack retorts, emphasizing that at that point in history, stories like that of his brother were neglected. That situation has largely changed with the wide reevaluation and critical work conducted on the Irish experience of the Great War and the centenary commemorations fostering remembrance, a movement of which Jack Duggan's war is itself part. It is through the work of preserving documents in the archive, and not only that, but actively engaging with the archive, as is done, among others, by documentary dramatists such as Colin Murphy, that history can be continually remembered, discussed, and made sense of. In the play, Chester Duggan tells one employee of the Bureau that, without the courtesy of allowing him to tell his brother's story in the war, another small piece of our history will have been lost. Documentary theater helps to ensure that these small pieces of history are not lost, but instead continue to reverberate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vinicius. That was an excellent presentation. Um, now we can, I believe, move on to our next presenter, Jessica Caterini. And, but before that, I would like to remind um, our the people watching on YouTube that you can start leaving questions for for the panelists, okay, including Vinicius, Jessica, who will start presenting now. I think the questions will be very uh, will be welcome, and it will they will help enrich the works of the panelists, okay. So Jessica, uh, I will present first of all a few words about Jessica, who is a researcher at PGE at the moment. Uh, she's a PhD student who currently researches uh, speculative literature. Uh, she holds a master's degree in linguistic and literary studies with a focus on film studies and post-humanism, and a BA in English and corresponding literature, both from UFSCI. She has experience in English literature and film studies with research interests in the areas of speculative fiction, science fiction, and post-humanism. Uh, Jessica, welcome and feel free to start your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, George, for the introduction. Thank I will you. share my screen. Um, I hope you're all seeing my presentation. Is everything okay? Yes. yes. Thank you. It can be seen. 
Thank you. So my presentation today is called That's What It's Like for Pavis Like Me, Monologues and the New Traveler Subjectivity in Rings by Rosalind McDonough. Uh, this presentation is based on a final paper I submitted to my Irish studies class. And in this paper, I worked with the idea of how the monologues propose the reconstruction of a traveler's subjectivity in the two characters by analyzing what these structural elements uh, might inform us about the character's point of view about their own lives and their culture. Uh, Jessica, just a moment. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. There is, um, I think it's a window that's kind of blocking the, the presentation. It's almost like a pop-up window that's showing in front. I don't know if I'm the only one seeing it, but on YouTube, I can see the same thing. Um, I don't know if you have a window open that's kind of blocking the... No, I don't have it. I'm just looking slides. at my presentation full, full screen. Uh-huh. Let me try to take it off the full screen. Maybe we... Mm -hmm. Is it better now? No, it still has the window um, blocking it. The, uh, try, uh, try presenting only the window instead of the whole screen. Uh, I think unfortunately, helps. I think I'm not going to be able to do that because I am at a Linux software. Oh, I see, I see. <laughs> no problem, we can see most of it and we follow your ideas, that's, that's no problem. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, no okay. worries, no worries. I'm, I'm continuing. Uh, so, uh, briefly talking about the play, uh, Rings was written by Rosalind McDonough. Uh, I brought a picture of her here, I hope you can see her. And McDonough's own background as a traveler woman and as a disabled person elucidates the criticism and political aspects dealt in Rings. So Rings was first performed as a part of a stage reading called Turning Point, a reading of four short plays by Fishamble, the new play company in arts and disability. And as I said, uh, McDonough's background allows her to explore a duality in the play, because at the same time that the play draws attention to how much the traveler community is neglected by the Irish government and by the settled population, it also criticizes some of the inner tradition of the travelers discussing mainly the prejudices against disabled people and also issues regarding women and gender roles. So Rings is a two-character play in which Nora, a young woman who is deaf and a traveler, and her father share the same stage space and deliver their lines in the form of intercalated monologues in which they explore their different perspectives on the same events of Nora's life. So to resume the, the plot of this play of Rings, uh, we are following the story of Nora, who is a disabled young women, woman, and she expects to follow the career of sportswoman, being a professional uh, boxer. And we have then all her perspective and her father's perspective of everything that um, happens due to her uh, background as a traveler and as a woman in the traveler community. I discussed some definitions and aspects of the monologue form, and here I highlighted three authors' contribution to this discussion. First, Ian Jordan, uh, who in an, in an overall description defines the monologue as a theatrical form where the actor addresses an audience directly, with characters seldom interacting with each other. Then uh, Claire Wallace, who has stated that the great strength of the monologue is in its malleability, and thus that it's, and here I quote, tendency to deconstruct the fourth wall of the stage and to map out a space of performative subjectivity are certainly among the factors that have led to its popularity on the contemporary stage. And she also asserts that the monologue points toward toward the ways in which reality and identity are discursively constructed. So in Rings, both characters use monologues to expose their inner and external conflicts. And the monologues thus function using Virgin Priebus's words about the form as a means to the construction of the self and to facilitate the character's awareness and transformation. 
and then here in rings as a way of acquiring freedom from the challenging positions they are undergoing within the traveler community. Uh, then I argue that Nora and her father, through their testimonies, through their monologues, they assume a new traveler subjectivity. Focusing on both characters' description of the traveler's tradition and culture, I spot that Nora goes through a resignification of her traveler subjectivity by assuming the disabled independent woman traveler identity, and the father has to overcome the rigid traditions in order to approach his daughter's reality. And he does that by going through a masculinity crisis. Uh, as the father's lines demonstrate his thoughts very much aligned with the traveler tradition, as we're going to see in, in the lines that I brought here as example, um, they, go, they go in the same direction as Eamon Jordan has said that monologues or narrative disclosures seem like an invitation to share or to reaffirm community. And then when we look at the, at the father's lines, such as these two, um, and I quote, Kate was proud of her in the same way I would be proud of my son doing the same thing. And then the school, the deaf school, was encouraging the girls to be independent, that fucking deaf school interfering with everything in this family. So in the beginning of the play, we have the father's lines uh, showing how much he's uh, deep, deeply involved in this uh, traditional thought that the traveler culture has uh, impacted on him. And as he, he goes through this masculinity crisis, I bring here uh, Wallace and Jordan again. Uh, Wallace mentions that monologues served as a space for the articulation of contemporary Irish masculinities in crisis. And then similarly, Jordan also pointed out to the way monologues have been used to deal with the crisis of masculinity and to allow male characters to deconstruct some ideas regarding their roles. So uh, looking at the father's lines again, we have the father and the sign language. He even considers learning it, but he mentions he would do it, and I quote, only at the trailer where no one else could see. Nobody would make a life of me. And regarding boxing, the, the sport Nora practices, he says, and for years, I used to tell the other men on the site, I used to say he, and by he, he's meaning Nora's coach, I used to say he was here to talk about, about one of the boys, about one of Nora's brothers. And he also highlights, uh, again, uh, his um, involvement with the other men in the community when he says, I listened to them. I listened to what other travelers were saying, warning me, shaming me, making a life of me. So uh, as the father slowly overcomes this masculinity in crisis, uh, I argue that Nora embraces her unique traveler identity. She has to create her own space inside the traveler community. Uh, one of the examples is uh, the fact that she is responsible for the creation of their own PV signing system and the refusal to learn the buffer's language. She says, we were all the one to them because we were police. We started to make our own sign, our own language. And then she goes, and I quote, that's what it's like for police like me. You don't fit in anywhere. And when, when she's mentioning that she does not fit anywhere, she's indicating that she might need to create her own space. And she does that by breaking with the tradition and being herself. At the same time, she's still a traveler, but even with all her peculiarity, peculiarities. So she does not distance herself from being a traveler. Instead, she resignifies what it is to be a traveler, being a disabled woman and a disabled woman who wants to pursue a career on sports. And um, regarding Nora's resignification of the, the traveler uh, subjectivity, uh, there is the, the label Pavi Princess. When she, she's boxing, she uses the, the name Pavi Princess uh, in her uniform. So she's making references to her culture, which was the same culture that were the main reason for the prejudice she suffered from her own father's negligence to her fiance's 
family making her choose between boxing and marriage. And McDonald herself has discussed the resignification of this term, Pavi Princess. Uh, Rosalind McDonald comments that, and I quote, Recent documentaries about BORs are exploitative, voyeuristic, and dangerous. The Pavi Princess myth doesn't exist. It's created for a subtle audience to make fun of us, colluding with this concept of how we should be as women means we're indulging subtle people's racist, sexist stereotypes. Sensationalizing and exoticizing young BORs presents them as living dolls, where they can be played with and edited by the subtle hand. So by adopting the Pavi Princess label on her boxing uniform, uh, Nora is also deconstructing this myth. Since she, as a young woman, a boxer, deaf, unmarried traveler, is, not, is definitely not performing the role she was supposed to be performing as a traveler woman. She wears the name Pavi Princess, but she is everything but what this myth should be, or what it implies about how traveler women should be. She appropriate, appropriates this stereotypical label and gives it another meaning. And finally, in the last part of my, my work, I talk about how uh, specifically the last stage direction, but how they, they, they engage in the movement toward each other. Just these two characters, the father, Nora and her father, they, they move toward each other and this symbolizes their change of perspective. Uh, in the last, uh, the last scene, let's say, uh, Nora is wearing a wedding, a wedding dress, sorry. And beneath this wedding dress, she's wearing her boxing uniform. And the father helps her remove this dress and prepare for boxing. And he says, and I quote, my daughter will carry the Irish flag and I'm so proud of her. So we have here a line that demonstrates uh, his change of perspective about uh, Nora, not only boxing, but uh, not marrying and, and going through to the Olympics. So the last stage direction goes like, Nora is hugging the punch bag while her father is hugging, hugging it also. Neither of them can reach each other, but they are smiling. And then again, I, I highlight how this last stage direction demonstrates their, uh, how they approach each other, how their, their change in perspective and their change in their own views about their culture allows them to approach each other. So bear in mind, even Jordan's words that the characters in monologues are shaped by the place in which they find themselves it is possible to assume that the traveler culture shaped who they are essentially, but their responses to their own culture and to their inner and external conflicts also shaped and provoked the transformation they caused in themselves throughout their journey, a journey of resignifying what it is to be a traveler. So here are my references. These are the references I used in my paper and some of them are here in the presentation. And I thank you all for the attention and I'm sorry for the four point problem here. <laughs> thank you so much. No problem, Jessica. This is a kind of a uh, technical issue that we may face sometimes. Uh, it happens to everyone, uh, but thank you very much for, for your presentation. That's a, it's a, an excellent uh, play to look at and to analyze and to study and um, and I thank you for your contribution to this panel. Uh, next up is Larissa Lanyes. Um, Larissa is a master's student at BGI, uh, carrying out research on creative writing in relation to the social isolation brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, her BA in English, Linguistic and Literary Studies focused on women's studies and female representation in media. Her current research focus is grounded on theater studies and employs a practice-based approach towards playwriting as a means to investigate the creative process from a hermeneutic and psychoanaly psych psychoanalytic perspective. Uh, she hopes to advance an applicable methodology for creative studies and help establish 
creative writing as an academic area area of research for Brazilian uh, for Brazilian students. Okay, it's a very uh, it's a pioneering endeavor indeed. Uh, Larissa, welcome. Me and Larissa, we have worked together in the past. I was a supervisor for her monograph at the end of her undergrad course. It's good to see you again and welcome to this panel. Um, feel free to start speaking. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, I, it is my first time sharing my screen on Zoom, so please bear with me. I will try and do my best. Go. Can you see the screen? Yes. All right, good. So hi, hello everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, today I'm presenting uh, my works titled How Stupid Can a Father Be? Right in Guilt and Regret Through Stage Directions in Rings. Um, it is the same play that Jessica just presented. We worked with the same play, so this is going to be fun. Um, I will not take too long talking about the play because I've just uh, heard it. So it was written by Rosalie McDonough, who is a traveler, an Irish traveler, a playwright, author, academic, and activist. Uh, the play was originally played as part of Turning Point, a reading of four short plays by writers with disabilities by Fish Shimble in 2010. Uh, but my main interest in this play was the relationship between the stage directions and the dialogues within the play, because we can see two different storylines <laughs> being conveyed uh, throughout the play both through the spoken words in the dialogues, which are really monologues, and uh, the physical communication that is being enacted or suggested uh, through the stage directions. A little bit on the play, we have only two characters uh, who are Nora, a young woman who is deaf and an aspiring boxer. She's headed towards an Olympic career in boxing. And we have her father, who is in his early 40s. It is very important right at the beginning of the play, uh, the author states that Nora's only means of communication is sign language. This is fundamental to the piece, so she does not speak, she only signs. Um, and there is this, uh, this issue with the monologues and the dialogues, as Jessica just mentioned, that, in that the characters do not directly address each other. So we have monologues that are intercalated throughout the play and they complement each other, but they, not, they do not talk to each other. And this is important because uh, Nora and her father cannot communicate uh, due to his pride and his uh, reluctance in accepting her disability. Uh, her father never learned to sign, so he cannot talk to her because she cannot hear him and he cannot sign, so they cannot speak to each other in that sense. Uh, so, uh, in regards to Irish travelers, both because of her disability and her devotion and talent for boxing, which is a traditionally male sport, Nora becomes a challenge to her family and to her community with the travelers. So, a little bit on the Irish travelers first. They are this ethnic group with a very particular history of traditions, and they're said to live in the fringes of Irish society. Uh, they have this historical association with being misfits and they are deemed unfit to be a part of society. And because of that, they are the population onto whom the settled community, those who are known travelers, uh, projected their notions of what was immoral. So there is this prejudice against Irish travelers, uh, which is entrenched in Irish society. But at the same time, within the community of the Irish travelers, there is this uh, very particular social structure. So it is a patriarchal social structure uh, in which women are usually restricted to the domestic sphere and the men exert full control over the women. Uh, and there is also this culture of arranged marriages from a very young age. So a way to assign ownership from the father to the husband. Uh, nowadays, you may see this, uh, this, this image in reality shows such as My Big Bad Gypsy Wedding, for instance, 
we have examples of that. And women who defied these norms would, of course, have some backlash, face some uh, antagonic circumstances before the community. And Nora, in that sense, she's not only deaf, but she's also a boxer and she does not want to get married early. She wants to follow her own dreams, her own aspirations. So even within her community, she does not truly fit. She has to find her own space. Uh, so in regards to gestures and meaning and, the con and conveying meaning through gestures in the play. Uh, travelers, uh, some researchers said, have some secret forms of communication. One of them is the spoken language, which is similar to Irish, but is their own language. And a kind of sign language that employed physical symbols like sticks and rags to communicate matters such as a death or which way to take to other travelers. So we can see that it is a common misconception, but sign languages are not just signed versions of spoken languages, but they are a separate language with their very own characteristics. And the most important thing is that the body is the, the most important tool to produce meaning and express emotions in, rather than just, just describing them. Uh, so they are enacted. And in that way, storytelling becomes different in sign language because the narratives are not just told, they are interpreted and in rings in the play. This is especially important because we have these two narratives, one that is being said and one that is being shown. So in regards to the play and the stage directions, we have a story within the story. So if we're going to look at stage directions as short, practical performance or reader oriented instructions, we can understand them as suggestions as to how certain scenes should be performed according to the playwright's insight. But of course, when you translate that into a physical performance on the stage, other insights come into play, such as the director's uh, opinion, the actors and so on. So when you're reading the play, it is probably a closer look that you're going to get into the playwright's insight as to how that scenes should play out. The difference between the stage directions and dialogues is that uh, the dialogues meant to be spoken and the stage directions are meant to be enacted. So that allows a wide range of interpretation for how they should play out. Uh, and that they create, they do, or they create something new rather than simply inform. Because when we're reading, when you're uh, performing, you might have a different interpretation of how that should go. Uh, the main thing is that the body plays an essential role in translating emotions from the internal to the external world or from text to performance. Uh, in regard to the to analyzing stage directions within theater studies, I think it is an interesting topic because it blurs the lines between what is writing and what is performing because it allows this physical interpretation of the written language rather than just reading what is written in that sense. So in rings, we have uh, instructions on movements and actions. So the stage directions are not uh, effective stage directions. They, are, they do not uh tell the reader how to feel in a way but they are very direct on um, movements and actions but at the same time they convey this deeper meaning combining monologues and actions and providing insights on deeper emotional aspects of the story so because of that the reader uh, is provided with this contrasting pictures between what is being spoken and what is being enacted so we have access to different aspects to different uh, facets of the relationship between Nora and her father. And now let me show you some examples of what I'm talking about. So for example, when we first meet the characters, we see this distance between them on the stage or as it is described on the play. So Nora's connection to boxing, however, is extended to her father because he is holding her gloves even though they are, they are far apart. So we have her father disapproving of her attitude in which she says there was no saying anything to her being bossed around by my only daughter or 14 years of age. But at the same time, he's saying that he stands up and walks around the ring inside the ropes. 
So from a spoken narrative point of view, we have the beginning of their drifting apart, of their relationship kind of starting to break. Uh, this, but uh, on the nonverbal communication aspect, we have uh, the father reaching out to Nora, literally stepping into her world in relation to boxing. Another example is when she says, uh, she's talking about her uh, parents' reluctance to accept her and accept her disability. And so she says that her mom came to every fight I had. Uh, and she said that especially him, he couldn't accept who I was talking about her father. But in the stage directions, the father walks over and starts tying her lace for her. So from the spoken point of view, we see Nora's resentment towards her father's action and his, uh, his distancing from her interests and from her. But from a nonverbal communication aspect, we see his attempt at doing things differently. So you could interpret that as a silent wish that his actions had taken another course so that they had been different. Uh, another instance, he says, I wanted you to stop. I barred, I barred her and her brother from going to the club. He forbade her from boxing. But at the same time, she holds one side of the punching bag and the father holds the other. So we have his, uh, his enforcing of the traditions of the Irish, uh, Irish traveler world uh, upon her. So she's not supposed to box, she's supposed to get married and so on. But as we see on the nonverbal aspect, he's trying to take part in her aspirations, in her wishes. He's literally holding the symbols of her accomplishments as a boxer. So the very opposite spectrum of what is supposed to be the traditional way. And finally, in the end, which I think personally is the most meaningful part uh, of this, uh, this economy, is she says, I knew my daddy loved me whether he could sign or not. I knew he loved me. And the father says, I want her to be happy, to be good at something, and to be respected and loved the way I love her. So from the spoken point of view, we see them kind of making amends and trying to get closer to each other. But we also see that Nora is hugging the punch bag while her father is hugging it also. Neither of them can reach each other, but they're smiling. So we see that they reach, each, they reach for each other, but they are never able to effectively touch, even though they're talking in a way that they wish they could be closer, they could restore this relationship. So we can interpret that as Nora's a representation of Nora's love for her father, despite the hardships they had faced throughout her life. And at the same time, the father's regrets that he has tried to reach Nora, but he's unable to communicate with her because, as I mentioned, they cannot speak the same language. Um, but despite their attempt to fix this relationship in the present, there is the past that cannot be fully erased. So they are trying, they're hopeful, but they still cannot fully get to each other. There we go. So my conclusion is that the stage directions and the dialogues can work together to set the tone and the mood of a performance. And I think they should be uh, understood as more than just suggestions by the playwrights, but they have the power to provide many different interpretations to a play. And as performative acts, stage directions affect not only the physical performance or how the performance is imagined, if you're thinking from a reader's point of view, but they also affect the internal, emotional, and external physical direction of a scene or the manner in which a character is presented. And in the case of Rings of this play, the story relayed through the monologues could be interpreted very differently, if not complemented by their actions as they talk. So we see uh, the relationship that they have in, on stage or uh, throughout the stage directions is different from the relationship they are describing uh, through their monologues. And that allows for very different, many different interpretations of their relationship. So as readers and audience, the stage directions also allows us the opportunity of an insight into Nora's world by experimenting with body language and the silent communication that lies behind gestures and movements. So, uh, Nora uses her, her hands to sign and to box, so this is her primary means of communication. And we also learn to grasp meaning from the physical interaction between the characters. So we are learning from what we are hearing, but we are also learning from what we are seeing. And the nonverbal communication shaped by the gestures and actions indicated in the stage directions tell a story within a story. 
a silent narrative that requires interpretation and because it allows for interpretation, which is by itself very subjective, it allows us to perceive different meanings on what we are reading or what we are seeing. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can talk to me. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Larissa. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, like Larissa said, if you have any questions for her, please post it on the chat on YouTube. Um, we already have, a, qu have a, a question coming in from Marcus but that will be after the last presentation, because now we go to um, our last panelist, uh, Luana Wessler. She is a PhD candidate at PGI Ufski. In her MA studies, Luana conducted research on critical discourse analysis, investigating narratives produced by Black Brazilian women and African-American women Luana's main areas of interest are on the intersections of race, gender, and aesthetics. Luana, welcome. Um, um, you are free to speak now. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll start sharing my screen. That's... All right, so good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Luana, and in this presentation, I'll focus on the depictions of everyday racism in one of B.C. Edigon's earliest works, the second act of Once Upon a Time and Not So Long Ago. I will also discuss how the play, through the dramatization of real-life experiences of African immigrants living in Ireland, engages with the cultural similarities and differences between African immigrants and Irish people. So uh, talking a little bit about the context first, uh, Aromba Productions was the first African theater company in Ireland, founded in 2003 in the context of the Celtic Tiger, a time when, as we know, as well as an economic boom, there was also an increase in asylum seekers and other forms of migration in Ireland. In mainstream discourse, the Celtic Tiger period represented prosperity and this metaphor became part of everyday speech in the Irish Republic. One of the results of this economic boom, as expected, was, and I quote Kiyot here, the unprecedented number, numbers of asylum seekers and economic refugees. Although the numbers continue to be small by the standards of other European Union countries. The non-Irish population of the Republic of Ireland uh, was around 5% in 1996, and this grew to 12% in the 2011 census 10 years ago. This new Irish population, also called the first generation of immigrants, was composed by a highly diverse group of nationalities, mostly from economically disadvantaged areas in Europe and Africa, from Polish to Nigerian. This created uh, new forms of interculturalism. And these new forms of interculturalism created in this period were also reflected in the arts and on the Irish stage. The Aramba Productions addresses some of the problematics created by the, this new intercultural island in its productions, focusing on three types of play, classic and contemporary works by mostly West African writers, modernizations and reinterpretations of Irish drama that feature black actors and documentary plays that dramatize specific intercultural moments in contemporary Irish society. Some examples of plays in which B.C. Edigon produced or directed are highlighted in this slide. As you can see, we have a play co-written with Rod Doyle, as well as 10 years of Arambe Productions, right? Reflecting on the achievements and on the legacy of Arambe Productions, 
BC Antigone argues that one of the company's aims was to provide a platform for African immigrants living in Ireland to present, represent, and express themselves through the art of theater. The company is also known for providing African Irish actors to feature in stage productions and for reframing familiar narratives about the asylum seeker or about the immigrant. Uh, Arthur Spengler claims that at his best, Adigon's work functions to deconstruct and present a new certain calcified discourse and images of identity. The play that is the subject of this presentation is one of Adigan's earliest works, Once Upon a Time and Not So Long Ago, which was initially only Once Upon a Time, a project that took the African oral, musical, and theatrical tradition to the Irish stage. In Adigan's words, the project has become the most seminal in the life of Arambe. Once Upon a Time staged the West African tradition of storytelling and is made of several scenes in which West African folk tales are dramatized. The Arts Council funded the project in 2005, the year of its first pro production. The second part, not so long ago, which is also in the second act of the play, was partly funded by the National Action Plan Against Racism, and it was attached to Once Upon a Time in 2006 to result in Once Upon a Time and Not So Long Ago. The second act aimed to highlight some of the cultural differences between African immigrants and Irish people, as B.C. Adigan claims. It begins where Once Upon a Time ends and provides a bridge between the African memory and a contemporary dramatization of the African experience in Ireland. Its eight scenes are based on interviews conducted by B.C. Adigun and focus on the everyday experiences of their subjects, racialized subjects in a predominantly white society. Focusing on what it means, everyday racism. Kilomba, an Afro-German thinker who has studied how everyday racism operates, um, claims that racism has three simultaneous features, the construction of differences, hierarchical values, and also power. In the context in which the play was first produced, being white was not only the norm in state and institutional practices, but also the norm in everyday life. I quote Loyal again, and I will read that, despite Ireland's image as welcoming hospitable nation and its unparalleled economic boom, many members of black and ethnic minority groups have experienced racism since arrived in Ireland. In a recent Amnesty uh, International survey, 79% of individuals from black or ethnic minority groups living in Ireland claim they had experienced some form of racism or discrimination. Data from the same survey revealed that most racist acts took place in public spaces, such as on the street, in shops, and in pubs. These daily drops of racism are examples of the everyday version of the phenomenon. Focusing now on the play itself. Not so long ago opens as a staging of the famous Irish TV chat show, The Late Late Show. The host, while welcoming the audience back to the last part of the show, provides an overview on Ireland's socioeconomic situation highlighting the, and I quote the play, the unprecedented inward migration, and that for the African community, living in one of the fastest growing economies in the world must be like a dream to come true. The dramatization of the TV experience is a vehicle for exposition to the audience, the context and purpose of each of the scenes. The host and the invited director hold a dialogue before and after each scene, introducing and then concluding the scene, and sometimes making and reinforcing obvious interpretations of the scene as an attempt to make clear or even mock how obvious are the cases of racism and discrimination. 
When asked about where the inspiration come from, the director reports an episode in which a member of the audience of one of Aramba's productions confronted him by asking, so tell me, do you think it is right for you people to come into this country, take our jobs, take our houses, and now we started acting our plays as well? Don't you have plays of your own? The staging of such a real experience is one of the first indications that the play denounces cases of everyday racism. The politics, uh, this, it is interesting to, to notice that uh, these new forms of racism rarely make reference to racial inferiority. They speak instead of cultural difference of religions and their incompatibility with the, with the national culture. The politics of space play a central role in the duality of Irish and immigrant subjectivities. Being placed outside the nation is a common discursive practice to define and to mark which territory belongs to whom and who is or not welcome there. The second scene, uh, appears from a transition. The lights of the studio fade and the setting becomes an audition, a casting session for the playboy of the Western world. The play is not only a classic text in the Irish theater, but it was also adapted by B.C. Adigon and Rod Doyle in 2007. In Adigon's adaptation, the play is set in Dublin and its main character is a Nigerian refugee. In not so long ago scenario, Sarah Byrne is an Irish woman, daughter of an immigrant, trying to be cast for the playboy of the Western world. Belonging is thus put in question. As way of questioning her Irishness, Sarah is casually asked, where are you from? Have you lived in Ireland long? And when did you move here? I quote Loyal again to explain that since the foundation of the state, Irishness and citizenship have been correlated with whiteness, whiteness and Catholicism, both of which implicitly acted as the measure against which difference was constructed. In this sense, a skin darker than the white one is immediately seen as the antithesis of Irishness, even though the character claims, but I am an Irish actor. Okay, okay, my dad is Nigerian and I do, vis Afri do visit Africa regularly, but I am an Irish actor. Being a black African Irish person in this case sets Sarah in an identity limbo. She's too black to play an Irish character. And as the last scene of the play reveals, she is also too white to play a black character. I will uh, move to the closing of my talk as I am notice my time is, I'm running out of time. Well, um, this play mirrors the sec, uh, the, the final scene of the play mirrors the last, uh, the second scene. Sarah Byrne reappears in a very similar situation. Conce uh, she's considered too white to perform in an African play. The white subject tries to define what she is or what she's not, and the play finishes with Michael Jackson's black or white playing as Sarah, dressed like Michael Jackson, dances the song. The second act of Once Upon a Time and Not So Long Ago shows the Irish audience the similarities and differences between African culture and Irish culture and sheds lights on issues faced by Black Irish people in everyday situations. In a very didactic way, the lesson of each scene is further set out and explicitly, explicitly underpinned by the TV host and the director. Characters that are central in the creation of the media aspect of the play. This aspect facilitates the dramatization of the issues and serves to offer to the audience a format which for them is well known, the TV show. Drawing attention to the notion of, the, of everyday racism, the various sketches of the play illustrate how small or microaggressions are supported by a whole system that dehumanizes and places the Black subject in the role of the other. 
The work of Busy Adigan and Aramba Productions is a provocative and pioneering work. Not only was Adigan successful in his aim of dramatizing the history of Africa and Africans on the Irish stage, but he also tackled the issues of a new intercultural island with its history uh, being now a component of the first wave of African immigrant theater, the work of Arambe Productions has also uh, opened a space for contemporary discussions on place, race, and racism in Ireland. Uh, these are my references, which are uh, a lot, but I can email them to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luana. Thank you so much. These are all excellent, uh, fantastic presentations. I love to see the competence of each one of these researchers. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm sure that the people over on YouTube are also enjoying this very much. I can see by the number of uh, comments and, uh, and questions that were left here for us. Thank you, Luana. Thank you, Jessica, Larissa, Vinicius. Thank you all so much for your presentations. And now let's go to, let's go on to YouTube to check some of these questions. Um, Marcus leaves a very compelling question for Jessica here. He writes, dear Jessica, what a delight to hear you speak again. I have a question regarding your presentation. Do you think Nora's character based on your reading of a disabled body resignifying traveler's identity puts forward a productive representation of how minor subjectivities counters what you call the gender roles of her community of her community what i mean is how productive is it to have a play that exposes the inner problems of a community that is already disenfranchised when looking at the wider picture in Ireland's social fabric? That's Marcus's question. Uh, Jessica, feel free to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for your question. Uh, it is actually a very complex question to answer, but I will focus on your last question. Um, I think every problem, if there is a problem, it, it has to be exposed. So um, I understand the, the, the question of the travelers already suffering um, uh, by the government, the Irish government and by the subtle population. But uh, I believe this, this uh, insight that she gives uh, from their inner functioning of their their traditions and everything that she exposes in the in the play are not only helpful for a better understanding of the the traveler community even with their problems because every every community has problems but uh i believe it it, it also uh uh, fosters a, a better understanding from those who have these uh, prejudice against the travelers. I don't know if I made myself clear. So um, I do believe it is a, a productive uh, representation uh, of the their problems uh, regarding disability and uh, their their prejudices against women. I believe that. Uh, those problems must come to to the surface when when we talk about communities uh, in general. So I don't believe this makes um, the the problem uh, between travelers and the settled community worse. I think it, it enlightens different uh, discussions. Did I answer you? <laughs> oh, that was definitely. Great light to be shed on on the discussion. Uh, it's a natural response to this to the question. It was indeed a, a a very nice and complex question by Marcus. He has a few other questions here, but before that, um, there is a question by Alini to Luana. Okay, Alini starts by saying, "Amazing paper, Luana." Besides those very explicit rem racist remarks on those production 
uh, on those productions coming from audience members. I wonder how else reception has worked, as in whether Once Upon a Time has been just regarded as exotic, thus dehumanizing the stories they represent. Yes, um, I'll be honest, I don't know much about the reception of these plays. Um, in fact, uh, it is true that Once Upon a Time was uh, mostly seen as this staging of a ritualistic uh, practices and that um, not so long ago has brought together this uh, connection to the modern, to the contemporary island. Um, I, I believe that uh, the work of B.C. Edigman was mostly seen as this innovative work which opened space uh, indeed for uh, African immigrants to be in stage and to represent those uh, experiences. Uh, I don't know if that answers. <laughs> there, was, there was actually a question. Thank you very much, Fana. Um, oh, and while we're here, I have uh, I have another one from Marcus, also for for Luana. Uh, he says, "Dear Luana, what a brilliant talk! Uh, do you think theatre offers more compelling affordances than other artistic media to this represent or he, he writes uh, mediums to this representation of multiculturalism in Ireland?" And if so, what is the significance of having these bodies of non-hegemonic Irishness being staged? Uh, thinking about the Irish context, I would say yes. I would say that the significance uh, is in fact this, um, I would like to stick with the word representation, but for now, I, I guess representation uh, is the best word I can get. The importance is representation. You are having a new intercultural island and these new uh, bodies, they uh, have the, their spaces in stage. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Luana. Uh, I have um, uh, another question here for Larissa. This one comes from Aline as well. Larissa, how has your analysis of rings affected your own reading of plays in general? I think it has worked uh, broadening my horizons on how plays um, can, in can infer meaning. I think I looked at it, for me, what affected me, most, for, what affected me most was looking at it from a creative point of view. So the many different possibilities that you have to create meaning when writing something that you're not restricted only to what is being said, but you can play a lot with what is being implied because that also takes the, the interpretation of who is reading or who is watching the play into consideration. And that allows, you know, a very wide range of, of meanings, of understandings. And I think that is that is very rich when it comes to creating art because it involves many parties and I think it, it allows for the creation of very interesting works. I, I hope I can answer that. Oh yes, and it is very instigating for some for a creative person to, to get into these details. I agree yeah. uh, completely. <laughs> Uh, very nice. Um, and I have one question. I think we have time for one last question for Vinicius. Uh, Vinicius, this is a very simple question. It's more to instigate some reflection, which I think it's, is uh, worth having. Uh, how might the fact that the play is a documentary drama contribute to the rethinking of the foundational myth of the Easter Rising, uh, as opposed to other kinds of drama that do not take documents as a basis for writing. I don't know if Vinicius can hear me. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for the question, George. I think it's a really interesting one. I, I would guess that uh, I, I think both things may be helpful, of course, in, in rethinking uh, Ireland and other countries in general's relation with their past and their past events. 
But maybe the allure of documentary theater is that seen as it's based on documents and it's based on documented fact and documented stories, I think this helps convey the idea of truth to viewers. So I, I think the thing is that nor traditional fiction might be more easily disregarded uh, as, oh, okay, so this might be based upon something that happened, but, you know, they're taking creative liberties. Whereas for documentary theater, I think this uh, idea of truth is, is more present. I think it, it might, uh, it conveys this idea of truth in a more, I think perhaps in a more stable manner. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Vinicius. That was that was an excellent uh, answer, an excellent presentation as well from Vinicius and from everyone here present. Um, I think that's it for this panel about contemporary Irish theatre. It has been a great pleasure and a big thank you to all the participants, to all the panelists. Thank you, Janaina, Beatriz, Aline, Hita, Atne. Uh, for organizing this great event. It's great to be part of another uh, NAY-related event. And thank you all panelists and people over at YouTube for watching us and for being present. Thank you all for the excellent presentations. Have a nice Friday and a great weekend, everyone. And we, are, we will have now a coffee break and we will be back in about 10 minutes for the last panel of the afternoon. Thank you so much, folks.
Gente, vocês me dão ok? Quando puder começar. Can I go on? Ok, so... Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I am Larissa. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, it's very emotional for me always to be in a May event. Uh, and today has been wonderful. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the entire organization, the translators. Uh, thank you. And it has been amazing. So, uh, without further ado, let's begin our uh, panel four. Our first panelist is um, William uh, Weber Wanderling. I'm not sure if that's how I pronounce your name. If I am mispronouncing, please correct me. Um, he's a second year PhD candidate at the PGU. In his master's thesis, he explored the convergence between different, sorry, between different concepts of romantic irony and the works of William Blake. More specifically, the book uh, Songs of Innocence and of Experience. He's currently researching different editions of Blake's works, seeking to understand how editorial decisions were shaped or not by current editorial practices, as well as how these editorial decisions have impact and still impact on Blake's reception. So thank you very much, William, please. Okay, thank you, Larissa. Also, thanks everyone for being here. And just, uh, thank you for the organizers of this event for letting me share a little bit of my research. So I will share here my slides with you. Uh, can you all see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, in this presentation, I will analyze some aspects of the play uh, The Old Lady Says No written by Dennis Johnston and first staged in the Gate Theatre in 1929. Uh, the play focuses on the character of the speaker, an actor who is in the beginning playing the role of the nationalist revolutionary Robert Emmett. In this play within the play that happens at first, Emmett bids, bids farewell to his beloved Sarah Curran after an unsuccessful rising in 1803, and is arrested by Major Sir. While the play within the play is going on, the speaker receives a blow on the head and falls unconscious on stage. The rest of the play will follow the hallucinations of the speaker during the brief period he is unconscious. Already at this point, we can see the expressionistic inspiration of the play and all this emphasis on the unconscious mind of this unnamed character. The speaker's hallucinations will merge the identity of the speaker with that of Robert Emmett, and the scenes bring allusions to events and historical figures of Emmett's lifetime, while at the same time oddly being contemporary with the speaker. That is to say, it is as if Robert Emmett, the 19th century revolutionary, appears in modern-day Ireland a few years after the independence and the Irish Civil War and during the interwar period. While a lot of the characters during the hallucination are not named, and in, this, and in this Johnston was following an expressionistic inspiration, some characters are named. And one is of particular interest here. Uh, the statue of Henry Grattan is a crucial character in the play. Henry Grattan, the historical figure, was a parliamentary nationalist who lived in the same period of Robert Emmett. Uh, the speakers Lash Emmett and Grattan will at some point discuss the possibilities of independence, each one representing a different perspective as to how to achieve Irish independence. Uh, Grattan represented the attempt of independence through legal reform and politics, whereas Emmett represented the attempt of independence through revolution and blood sacrifice. Uh, these are aspects that are discussed in the play with Johnston reflecting on the recent independence and civil war. Uh, I bring here one quote from the character of Grattan in this play, uh, somehow setting the scene of 1920s Ireland. 
Uh, he says, this place stifles me, the thick, sententious atmosphere of this little hell of babbling torment. Sometimes the very breath seems to congeal in my throat and I can scarce keep from choking. In this early scene, Grattan is commenting negatively on Ireland's problems, or as Jean Barnett puts it, the dismal reality of the Irish situation in the 20s. Uh, revolts, civil war, assassination, atrocities. Grattan is passing a judgment on the current situation, that is the 1920s, and he does this by using a reference to hell, or as he says, the little hell of babbling torment. As I will analyze here, Hell is used as a metaphor throughout the play so as to deliver different political statements. We will see different characters with different political opinions mentioning hell. Uh, not, long, not long after this speech comes this one also by Grattan, and he says, Full 50 years I worked and waited only to see my country's newfound glory melt away at the bidding of the omniscient young messiahs with neither the ability to work nor the courage to wait. Grattan is referring here to a tradition of blood sacrifice, of dying for one's country that we see in Irish history. Emmett is a figure attached to this tradition or ideology. Grattan criticizes such attitude, an attitude which in the 1920s was still mostly unchallenged. After the independence, with all the violent events leading to it, and with the civil war, the idea of blood sacrifice and radical nationalism what was at that point hegemonic. As he is criticizing such ideology, Grattan's use of hell not only refers to the dismal reality of the Irish situation, but also to the permanence of such ideology. Arguably, Grattan is expressing a vision close to what later Irish historiography would call revisionism. The idea is that this fears radical, violent nationalism was actually a hindrance to Irish independence instead of a catalyzing. In this vision, the work of parliamentary nationalists such as Grattan was undermined by the violence of nationalists such as Emmett. Here, Grattan is expressing a view close to Johnston himself. In an introduction to this play written in 1960, Johnston states that the only practical outcome of Emmett's affray was to confirm the union with England for about 120 years. Another character in the play, the blind man, also brings reflections of this kind, and he too makes a connection with hell. He appears after the drawing room scene in part two, and his speech comes just after a couple appears on the stage and then vanishes. The couple was talking about trivial subjects, dancing, dating, traveling. The blind man perceives in them a triviality and a lack of concern. They are, as he states, blind and drunk with the brave sight of their own eyes. His critique, like Grattan's, points to his Irish social problems, but also to the cause of their carelessness. As he says, for why would they care that the winds is cold and the beds is hard and the sewers do be stinking and steaming under the stone sets of the streets when they can see a bit of a rag floating in the wild wind and they dancing their bloody sea keelies over the lip of hell? Here, more than in Grattan, the linking with hell uh, and the perceived social problems becomes evident. By dancing a traditional Irish dance or gazing at the Irish flag, the people of Ireland are entranced by the recent events in history, uh, independence, civil war, and stuck in an ideology of reverence to nationalist heroes such as Emmett. Uh, at this point, we may ask ourselves which kind of hell is being invoked in these quotations and to what kind of intertextuality they appeal. The old lady uses Dante's Inferno as the most prevalent view of hell, whether through the use of allusions or by direct reference to Dante by name. The direct reference happens at the beginning of the second part of the play and is uttered by Grattan. After entering a drawing room, the speaker is presented to guests and then Grattan's, Grattan says, welcome Don Quixote Alighieri. More importantly, this view of hell is also expressed in the play by another character, the younger man. 
In this case, however, the character refers to a previous situation and uses the image of hell through, through another political prism. He's not, like Grattan, a sort of revisionist avant la lettre. In fact, he's himself trapped in the ideology which Grattan criticizes. Uh, the younger man appears with the older man near the end of the play. When they appear, the scene changes to a tenement house. Both are playing cards and discussing politics, and an altercation occurs. And the old, older man says, oh, yes, the, the public still lives. Oh, go to hell. And then the younger man, I've been to hell all right, never fear. I went down into hell shouting up the living republic, and I came up out of hell still shouting up the living republic. Do you hear me? Up the republic. Uh, the hell for the younger man is that of the war of independence and the civil war. He uses hell rhetorically like the other characters, but he uses it, it, it so as to reinforce the harshness of the political struggles, struggles of earlier years and his commitment to the Irish Republic. Still, his hell is certainly close to Dante's since he wants to emphasize the physical sufferings of his earlier revolutionary activities. Uh, during this altercation, the speaker who is present makes an explicit reference to Dante's Inferno. And he says, up the blood red phlegathon, up Cossito's frozen lake of hell. Uh, these are places in Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, Phlegathon is a river situated in the seventh circle of hell, and Lake Cossitus is the in the last circle of hell. At this moment, the speaker is making out comments such as this one and does not take, take part in the discussion. It is as if he is commenting on the situation, a sort of intradiagetic lunatic chorus. Since the altercation between the younger man and the older man never reaches an agreement and is interrupted by the arrival of other characters, the speaker's comment can be read as referring both to the physical situation, and they are, after all, in a tenement house, and also to the fruitlessness of such debate. If up to now, up to now we saw Dante as being the main intertextuality for the different allusions to hell, in the final scenes of the play, there is a change towards a different kind of hell, the one we find in William Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Near the end, an even more hallucinatory passage occurs as the shadow dance begins. Shadows appear on the stage, quoting from authors such as Wilde, Joyce, Yeats, and Shaw, as we see modern Irish authors. At, and at this point, the speaker says, the souls in the seven circles of purgatory cry out, deliver us, O Lord, from the mouth of the lion that hell may not swallow us up. While the first part is certainly Dantian, the second half of the sentence alludes to one of Blake's proverbs of hell. The proverb being, the wrath of the lion is the wisdom of God, beginning then a change towards the Blakean hell. Blake's hell is close to the tone of the speaker in this scene, since he is mostly antinomian and heretical. In the marriage, Blake distinguishes between the heaven of reason and the hell of energy and argues for the importance of the latter. By the end of the 18th century, he thought that the forces of reason and order, uh, that is to say, enlightenment thinking, the Anglican church, uh, those were suppressing the essential forces of energy, imagination, and creativity. So that Blake's appeal to hell is not for the space of suffering and punishment, but for the state of unsuppressed desires and boundless imagination. Blake's book moves away from the tra traditional hell. In the context of the speaker's speech, this allusion re reinforces the fiercely angry tone of the speaker at this point, moving from a state of suffering to one of action. Right after this, the, speakers, uh, the speaker utters his litany of curses, and he says, cursed be he who builds but does not destroy. Cursed be he who honors the wisdom of the wise. Cursed be the ear that heeds the prayer of the dead. Cursed be the eye that sees the heart of a foe. Cursed be the prayers that plow not, praises that reap not, joys that laugh not, sorrows that weep not. This sort of heretical sermon on the mount is aligned with Blake's proverbs of hell present in the marriage of heaven and hell. 
In fact, two of Blake's proverbs are explicitly cited in the last of the curses. Uh, the proverbs being, Please, prayers plow not, praises reap not, joys laugh not, sorrows weep not. Such allusions make clear the change of direction perceived in this last scene. As we see a call to action here, we cannot mistake it for a call to revolutionary political action, not then a return to Emmett. In the marriage and other books, Blake advocates for artistic action and the importance of creative work. The speaker's justification when questioned by the shadows earlier on is also a sort of artistic justification. In this sense, the fact that the quotations used are all by modern Irish authors, Wilde, Yeats, Shaw, Joyce, most of them still living at that point, is meaningful, since all of them, through different paths, were peers in the Blakean call to artistic creation. It is in this change of direction, from Dante to Blake, that the final transcendence of the speaker can be understood. The hell of suffering and punishment is behind, that is to say the hell of Dante's divine comedy. And as the call for a hell of energetic creation is made, the speaker is able to see a sort of Eden and deliver his final most famous speech, even with the Blake and hell marking a change of direction in the end of the play, it provides a means through which to make a political statement, as was the case also with the earlier allusions. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna have some questions to you later, uh, but let's move on. Now, uh, this our second panelist is João Pedro, Minute, Spinelli. He's a translator and master's student at Pejet Ufski. He has been a creative writer in Portuguese since the age of six and in English since the age of nine. He's also a songwriter, singer, musician, actor, and music producer. He has been involved in theater groups, performance troupes, rock bands, cultural projects, and original films. He is a published poet and award-winning soundtrack composer with a focus on audio production. Since 2020, he has been channeling his creative energy exclusively into his academic studies, both in theory and the practice of translation. Please, João Pedro. I can't hear you, John. We're not listening to you. Can you hear me now? Now, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Yes, okay. Uh, well, First of all, thank you. Can't hear me. No. Oh. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, there's evidently a lag in my internet connection. That's fine, you can begin. I'm literally hearing myself. Talk to talk with the lag, but it's okay. I'll figure it out. Uh, I'm gonna shut down the YouTube. That's a good idea. Okay, that's bad. So anyway, uh, thank you very much to the organizers of the event. I, I'm very thankful to uh, Maria Hita, especially because she invited me to be part of May, and she has been. A huge help in, in the translation of Yeats' fairy tales. Uh -huh. 
and also Juice and my advisor at Bajet and everyone at Fiji. Very good to be here. Uh, when I was uh, handing in the summary of my presentation, I thought it'd be fun to make a close reading of a fairy tale and link that with the ideology of social class and social ascension. Uh, but then since I was bringing in the fairy tale, I thought it was better to focus on my close reading of the fairy tale and uh, leave aside some of that contextualization that would have certainly enriched the reading of the fairy tale, but I thought that maybe my time would be short to do both. Uh, I'm trying to put in a presentation here. Share screen, okay. Sorry for the delay. So this is the title of my presentation, The Ideology of Social Ascension in a Radio of Jamie Friel and the Young Lady by William Butler Yeats. Literature has a way of being a part of culture and culture has a way of changing society on a political and social level just as social and political conditions influence the content of literary creations. This interplay is so rich and complex that it could be a master's or a doctorate work in and of itself to make a reading of this fairy tale and then contextualize it theoretically. The corpus of my master's research is a book edited in 1984 by Neil Philip, who took material from two books of fairy and folk tales by William Butler Yeats. Those books are Fairy and Folk Tales of the Irish Peasantry from 1888 and Irish Fairy Tales from 1892. Most of the tales come from the first one and in Philip's edition, the authorship of the fairy tales come in the form of endnotes. It wasn't until Professor Maria Hita told me about the authorship issue that I looked at Yeats' original books and saw that the author's names came right below the title of the tale. So I have to give credit to my story in this talk to Letitia McClintock. The version of this book where I selected and translated half of the fairy tales and one of Yeats's poems will be available by publisher Illuminuras sometime next year. The remainder of the tales in the book I will translate and analyze in my dissertation. So having made that preamble, uh, let's dive into this fairy tale. The fairy tale tells the story of Jamie Friel, a hardworking young man who lives in poverty in Fanet with his widowed mother. One Halloween night, Jamie decides to visit a castle that everyone knows is lit up by parties carried on by fairies at that time of the year. Jamie is welcomed into the castle and the fairies invite him to go on an adventure to capture a young sleeping lady. Banded on horses, they fly across Ireland, naming the cities through which they fly until finally arriving at Dublin, they capture the young lady. They pass the lady around from rider to rider, carrying her in their flight until Jamie asks to get a turn while coming close to his home. Deceiving the fairies, Jamie touches down at his home, gripping the young lady. The fairies then cast a spell on the lady and make her deaf. Jamie's mother is taken aback. How will we feed her, she asks. Jamie says that he will work for them both. A year passes and Jamie returns to the fairy castle. The fairy who cast the spell on the girl has the antidote to her deafness. When Jamie learns of this, he steals the cup with it from her hand and runs away home. He saves the girl from the spell. She decides to write letters to her parents in Dublin who never answer. Not being able to afford a coach, Jamie and the unnamed lady travel on foot from Fanny to Dublin. Arriving at the house, her parents say that their daughter is dead. But Jamie and the lady are finally able to convince them of her return. The lady reveals that she loves Jamie and they get married. Jamie and his mother move to Dublin to live with the lady and her parents. The end. At the beginning of the story, Jamie is characterized as being the widow's sole support. And he worked for her untiringly. 
and poured his wages into her lap, thanking her dutifully for the half pence which she returned to him for tobacco. Jamie is depicted, sorry, Jamie is depicted as a man of simple needs, needing only his tobacco to be happy. He is depicted as hardworking, righteous, and selfless. The neighbors say that Jamie is the best son that ever was heard of. Jamie is the stereotype of the fairy tale hero, righteous, selfless, and brave. Jamie has a merit in his soon to be found wealth. His investment in moral rectitude is about to get rewarded. The word meritocracy comes to mind. This will come about both from the magic of the fairies and from his own intrepid nature. According to Nancy Canepa, fairy tale heroes alternate between extremes of worthiness and commonplaceness. Commonplaceness is not Jamie's case. When Jamie finally goes toward the fairy castle, I quote, as he crossed the potato field, came inside of the castle, whose windows were ablaze with light that seemed to turn the russet leaves, still clinging to the crab tree branches into gold. He crosses the potato field, the potato that provides sustenance for the poor population of Ireland, to which a blight caused enormous damage during the potato famine. He crosses that thread of poverty into the other side. At that other side, there is light that the fairies are casting, and that light turns the leaves to gold. Gold here refers to the color, but the way that the word is placed in the sentence could be taken literally as that magical light transmuting that which has no financial value into something extremely valuable. The fairies welcome Jamie, they do not repel him. He is in his place among them because he's worthy. They invite him to steal the young lady. Emphasis on the word steal, a word usually used when referring to material possessions. The fairies welcome Jamie, they do not, I'm sorry. Uh, when they arrive at the lady's house, I quote, it was no mean dwelling that was to be honored by the fairy visit, but one of the finest houses in Stephen's Green. Previously, the half pence was a marker of specificity. Now here is another marker of specificity, Stephen's Green. This makes the physicality of the material elements more real. Work generates sufficient sustenance. A half pence is enough for tobacco, that's what work generates. Wealth is beyond the realm of enough, therefore it can only be generated magically. The fairies sing and dance in a castle, fly around in fine steeds, and then honor fancy houses with their presence. Their power to generate wealth is unique. In either case, in Stephen's Green or in Jamie's home in Fanet, each inhabitant is born into their social class and only magic can change that. The young lady is then captured and passed around from rider to rider. She is never named, only known as the young lady. She is actually an object, first being stolen and then passed around. When Jamie takes in the lady, his mother brings up the threat of poverty. How will we feed her with our poor diet? She asks. Jamie's hard work overcomes that. The threat of poverty is the only threat in the story. Jamie is never under threat from the fairies. When the fairy punishes Jamie, she does so by taking the lady, by making the lady impossible to talk to. Without talking, they cannot fall in love and Jamie cannot rise to wealth through marriage. The story is put on pause for a year until Jamie can retrieve the antidote. Only then does the lady write to her parents. One could think of the implications of her deafness and its association with her uselessness, but that's another possible reading from another angle. Um, just as the issue of gender inequality implied in the object, objectification of this lady. The lady is Jamie's ticket. She's the connection that bridges the gap between Jamie and his wealth. When he stole her from the fairies, whether or not he was aware of it, he made an investment in his future. The fairy tales end, ends with, I quote, Jamie was heir to untold wealth at his father in laws death. There is no they lived happily ever after. There is no they at all. It is Jamie, and he has achieved his goal. 
much like a charged entrepreneur climbing the ladder of success, which ultimately is a solitary achievement. In this story, magic and success come in the form of wealth. Wealth only comes at the expense of bravery and a brush with the supernatural, and only from a righteous deserving man who is only able to attain it through marriage. Social ascension is thus placed in the sphere of the miraculous. When we talk about poverty in Ireland, there's certainly a lot to talk about, like landlordism and the land wars, the conflict between the Protestant ascendancy and the Catholic majority, and the impact of the social changes that were entailed in the passage into industrial capitalism that happened in England a lot sooner than in Ireland, who, according to Declan Kibbard, shares with England forced intimacy. According to Maria Tatar, fairy tales, instead of romanticizing poverty, aestheticize wealth, bringing magical substance to commonplace objects. That object of beauty that is foreign to the reality Jamie and his mother are in is this wealthy lady. It is that objectified lady that bridges the gap between the commonplace and the supernatural. Through the medium of that object does Jamie obtain passage into the realm of material wealth, much as if the lady were the lamp, the commonplace element from where the genie, in this case the fairies, could spring forth from and without which Jamie's poverty and his future wealth would be forever two incommunicable worlds. While Jamie's bravery alone is enough to wine and dine and dance with the fairies for one night each year, that poor man's luck cannot be permanent until he can take an object. Sorry about the, the use of object. I'm, I, I'm aware that the subjectification of the, of the lady is negative, and I'm not trying to reinforce that, but. Uh, Actually, I'm calling attention to that, which is uh, lamentable and should be looked into. Right? There's a lot of gender studies related to uh, fairy tales that I'm aware of, but of course that's not uh, the focus here. Uh, he can take an object that opens up to a power that he is not normally able to access. Ultimately, the existence of this magical passage to wealth betrays the reality in which wealth is utterly inaccessible through ordinary means. As Italo Calvino famously stated, fairy tales are real. That reality might come at the human value we find in them that connects us to our own arguments. Or the sphere of that which forever elusive is the substance of human desires and hopes. In my master's research, I hope to investigate Yeats' Yeats's writing on folklore, written between the 1880s and the 1900s, reflecting on the context of the Industrial Revolution, construction of national identity, folklore and authorship, and the Irish literary revival. Though I have focused on a very specific topic, on a very specific fairy tale, I hope this talk has been both informative and entertaining. And uh, I still have much to read. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Well, uh, we're gonna, uh, I also have questions for you, uh, but I'm gonna do them later. Um, uh, I would like to, to ask people who are on YouTube to leave your questions uh, in the chat box. So I'm sorry, can I can't. I can't hear you. Just, just a second. Let me change my output. Um, okay. Okay, I hear you now. Can you can you hear me well? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I was just saying that I I have questions for you that I'm gonna ask later. Uh, I found it there. Okay. Okay, <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm asking everyone on YouTube uh, that they can uh, leave their questions, and we're gonna ask right after the presentation of the other two panelists. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, now, Alison. Uh, just a minute. Alison Silveira Moraes is our next panelist. Uh, is a writer and illustrator. He has uh, a master's degree from Pejet uh, where he also got his BA in uh, Letras Inglês. Alison has been pu publishing horror and terror short stories in a variety of anthologies since. 
2016. He has recently organized and participated as an illustrator in the books O Gato e El Diablo, uh, 2019, and Hoje Potá e Outros Três Tristes Contos Téticos, uh, 2019, in partnership between Ufski and Catarina Cartonera. Alison, please. Vocês estão me ouvindo? Yes. Ah, muito bom, então. É, boa tarde a todos presentes. Queria começar também agradecendo a PGET e a PPGI, aos organizadores do evento, né? A Maria Rita por ter me incentivado a levar essa ideia adiante para eu apresentar aqui hoje, né? A Aline também por ter aceito. E eu acho que podemos começar. Eu vou tentar compartilhar o meu meu slide aqui, só um momento. Vocês conseguem ver ele? Yes. Tá, perfeito, então. É, o nome do meu trabalho é Ilustrando Yates, a tradução intersemiótica de contos selecionados da antologia Fairy Tales of Irish Peasantry, de 1888. Para começar, né, eu acho que quando a gente fala sobre tradução intersemiótica, não tem como a gente começar sem falar do Jacobson, né, no On Linguistics Aspects of Translation. Né? É, nele, ele comenta que a tradução intersemiótica, ou que era também conhecido como transmutação, consiste na interpretação dos signos verbais por meio de sistemas de signos não verbais. Né? E... Eu trouxe como uma forma de complementação para essa minha pesquisa né, o trabalho da Nilce Pereira, num artigo que ela escreveu, chamado Book Illustration as Intersemiotic Translations, Pictures Translating Words, onde ela complementa essa, essa visão com, é, e fala que a tradução intersemiótica envolve a tradução entre dois tipos diferentes de mídias, por exemplo, de uma mídia escrita para uma musical ou para uma cinematográfica e assim por diante. Essa escalada de produções intersemióticas é, tornou possível que esses diferentes sistemas de signos pudessem ser analisados também através da ótica dos estudos da tradução. É, assim como a tradução, a ilustração também muitas vezes é vista como algo secundário, né? ou até mesmo uma espécie de enfeite ou um ornamento que vai junto com a obra e depende totalmente dessa obra para que seja possível, né? seja, seja criado. E a gente já, a gente como tradutor também, a gente se vê nesse, é, nesse, nesse julgamento também, né? de, verem, de algumas pessoas verem a tradução como algo secundário e que depende do original, assim, por, por, por dizer, né? É, e aí isso me trouxe um questionamento né, sobre a equivalência na história, equivalência de importância, se é, as ilustrações chegaram a ser tão ou mais importantes ou menos importantes do que uma obra e tal, e eu acabei levando, lembrando das, das obras clássicas, né, claro, como Frankenstein, Don Quixote, Don Quixote e Moby Dick, porque são e ilustrações que a lembrar de tem muita gente que lembra de Frankenstein então até que ponto houve essa equivalência se ela existe até hoje né e eu trouxe um exemplo do ex libris que o ex libris ele é uma espécie de carimbo ou uma vinheta como vocês podem ver aí que ele fica na contracapa, ou ficava né, na contracapa, ou na página de rosto dos livros, e costumava indicar o seu proprietário, ou se fazia parte de uma coleção, de uma biblioteca, de uma antologia, também, às vezes, identificava a autoria, né, um lema, ou algo do gênero. E, até hoje, a gente tem menos né, exemplos desse ex libris, mas ele ainda existe por aí. E isso também trouxe uma um, um pensamento, né, um, um debate interno assim, sobre o peso mercantil dos livros atuais e como eles deixam de ser ou se tornam memoráveis. Né? Porque, assim, eu, digo, eu vejo que a importância da arte nos dias 
é, atuais, assim, em relação aos livros, a gente consegue ver que é, é, é muito extensa, né? A gente vê, por exemplo, livros que vêm com brindes ou, às vezes, o que é, o, tem que QR Code dentro dos livros que é, vão para uma playlist no, no, no Spotify, vai para um vídeo no YouTube, né? Então, ele se, se abre, assim, em, muitas, em muitas, muitos caminhos, né? É, clubes de assinaturas, é, boxes, né? Então, isso acaba abrindo uma brecha do quanto essa multiplicidade de artes que vem surgindo deixa uma obra... É, um exemplo muito claro, a primeira capa de Harry Potter. Alisson, acho que está cortando um pouquinho. Harry Potter e a Pedra Filosofal, por exemplo, icônica, né? E... Muitas, muitas outras capas vieram depois dessa, né? Só que a gente acaba, muitas vezes, lembrando da primeira. É, seguindo, é, por que ilustração pode ser tradução? Aqui eu retomei de novo Pereira, né? É, ela comenta que, independente das circunstâncias, ilustrações podem ser vistas como tradução devido ao seu processo. As metodologias empregadas para ilustração são, na maioria das vezes as mesmas adotadas por tradutores texto-texto, além de exercer um papel bastante significante em relação à recepção do livro entre os leitores. Né? E eu também trago Haroldo de Campos, é, um, um, em um de seus escritos selecionados do livro da tradução como criação e como crítica, de 92, que ele faz uma boa analogia é, quando debate a tradução de poesia. Ele comenta que qualquer mudança mínima em sua sequência perturbaria sua realização estética, né? no caso, a tradução da poesia. Mas, apesar de resultar em outra informação estética, na outra língua ou linguagem, ambos estarão ligados entre si por uma relação de isomorfia. Serão diferentes em termos de linguagem, mas, como corpos isomórficos, eles serão cristalizados dentro do mesmo sistema. Né? E uh, o que trouxe também eu, 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 a gente pensar sobre a ilustração e a recepção em diferentes culturas, né? Que capas e personagens, por exemplo, que foram ilustrados e que são mais famosos do que a própria história, né? Eu até trouxe exemplos é, pessoais, assim, para ilustrar, né? Eu... 1984, o próprio livro mais recente, Fahrenheit, São livros que a gente sabe, a gente tem uma, uma larga iconografia, mas que muitas vezes essa pessoa conhece a ilustração, mas não conhece a obra. Né? Então, a ilustração, muitas vezes, ela consegue alcançar mais rápido e trazer o leitor, né, a pessoa interessada, para a leitura. Né? Seguindo, é, também, com o, ainda com o... O, o artigo da Nilce, ela comenta sobre é, três processos que os, tanto os tradutores quanto os ilustradores, eles podem passar, né? E aí ela comenta sobre os recursos, por exemplo. Existe a omissão, a explicitação, condensação, explicação, adaptação, que são recursos que tanto o tradutor utiliza quanto o, o ilustrador. E eu vou poder mostrar para vocês mais para frente quando eu mostrar algumas das, dessas ilustrações. A questão de seleção, né, a representação, se tu vai representar um capítulo, um personagem, um local, etc. E segundo o Lefebvre, 92, também a questão das restrições que a gente sofre, tanto quanto o tradutor quanto o ilustrador. Né? É, prestar atenção no público, o tipo de forma, o formato, o cor, a quantidade de ilustrações que pode ou não, a disposição, levar em conta as agendas sociopolíticas, os interesses pessoais da editora, né, entre outras, entre outras. Falando rapidamente sobre, o, sobre a obra que foi ilustrada, né, é a tradução da seleção do, de livros do Fairy and Folk Tales of the Irish Peasantry, traduzido como Contos de Fadas da Irlanda, pelo nosso querido João Pedro Spinelli, que acabou de apresentar. 17 ilustrações criadas para essa obra, usando técnicas Nanquim, principalmente, né, e marcadores, 
e a PC partiu, né, e o interesse também da, da leitura e da pesquisa sobre as artes criadas em versões anteriores do livro, né, P.J. Lynch, James Torrance, John D. Baden, etc. Então, aqui eu vou começar a explorar um pouco as minhas ilustrações e explicar um pouco do que tem por trás delas em relação a essa, essa tradução intersemiótica em relação ao livro, né. Então tá, a gente começa pela Criança Roubada, que é o primeiro, é uma, uma poesia, né, do, do Yeats, que abre essa, essa tradução. Na história, essa, tem uma criança que ela é seduzida, ela é atraída por, por, por uma fada, e que fala sobre as maravilhas do seu mundo, né, e depois de algum tempo, essa criança cede, ela convence a criança, e o menino é lançado à própria sorte, sozinho, num lugar inóspito, né, então, assim, é, na, na poesia não fala quantas fadas são, mas por serem três estrofes onde elas tentam seduzir o menino, eu pensei em desenhar três fadas, né? Então, além da questão do enredo, te, teve essa questão da estrutura. É, sobre, ali no, no, na poesia também comenta que é na região da, de Glencar, né? na Irlanda, né, numa, numa cachoeira, cachoeira de Glencar. Então, fiz a pesquisa, tal, tentei fazer o desenho, uma cachoeira e um menino ali sozinho, e na, ao longo da poesia, muitas vezes se repete a questão das águas insanas, né? são águas insanas, águas insanas, e aí eu fazer com que né, e o foco na... na também que na, no ambiente, né? E por fim, é, por se tratar, assim, por, por, por se tratar de um trímetro iâmbico, né? Eu, eu fiz uma pesquisa ali sobre a estrutura. É, eu pensei sobre o triângulo, né? Fazer o triângulo se repetindo várias vezes ali no fundo. É, Para a segunda ilustração é do James Frew e a moça. Eu peguei a ilustração do Nilesh Mystery, de 98, e eu acabei tentando colocar um, 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 um fator ali de um efeito mistificante, né? Porque a menina, no caso do meu desenho, à esquerda, ela está flutuando, né? E ao mesmo tempo expositivo, porque eu fiz o desenho dos goblins, do goblin e da fada, enquanto no desenho à, esquerda, na, à direita a gente consegue ver ele somente ao fundo. É, os Doze Gansos Selvagens, é, eu fiz a pesquisa pela espécie dos gansos, inclusive precisei de, de ajuda quanto a isso, porque tinha que ver que tipo de espécie estava na época, né? Então eu, eu acabei indo longe, assim, para conseguir fazer algo que né, seja interessante para mim e que eu fique satisfeito também como ilustrador e tradutor. Então, é uma reprodução com foco na localidade. Como vocês podem ver, tem essa janela, né? Que fica na Anthony Dominican Ferry, em Galway, na Irlanda. Então, eu tentei reproduzir essa janela ali. E, por fim, essas outras duas ilustrações do conto O Homem que Não Conhecia o Medo e Daniel O'Rourke. No primeiro caso ali, à esquerda, a gente, eu tentei... Eu fiquei empolgado com a história porque se tratava de um menino que era muito corajoso e não tinha medo de absolutamente nada, um guerreiro. Então já vem toda a ideia de desenhar uma armadura, um escudo, uma pessoa grande, alta, forte, né? enfim. E eu acabei indo para a pesquisa da curiosidade histórica para ver que tipo de roupa que era usado, que tipo de cantil, que tipo de espada, né? para poder fazer esse desenho. E para fazer o, o, o monstro, né, a representação do medo, eu fui atrás da, da imagem do sátiro e também dessa criatura da cultura celta chamada Bocaná, que era uma representação da morte, representação do medo. Né? Acabei fazendo isso, esse desenho com base nisso. E no Daniel O'Rourke, é, foi um, um desenho mais sugestivo, né? uma coisa para trazer o, a pessoa ficar curiosa, porque eu, não, eu acabei pensando que, nesse caso, expor o personagem não ia ser muito interessante. E, como vocês podem ver ali, no, isso no desenho da direita, né, o formato ovalado por trás da, da baleia e do mar, 
é, devido ao Hungry Hill, onde é a localidade onde passa essa história. E ele é ovalado. Então, eu acabei pensando nisso como uma forma de também trazer um pouco, um elemento a mais para a ilustração. Para concluir, eu só queria comentar né, sobre as ilustrações, elas seguiram a cronologia dos contos, tentei evitar os spoilers, né, pra, tentei ser, fazer com que eles fossem, de maneira geral, sugestivos, né, respeito ao público, principalmente o público que foi passado, é, Uh, jovens adultos, adolescentes, né, pré-adolescentes. É, no meu caso, sempre foi um interesse muito grande, mitologia nórdica e celta, e para fazer essas ilustrações eu tive também um, um, é, essa questão do, do jogo, do role-playing game, que eu já conhecia há muito tempo, do Dungeons and Dragons, e que me ajudou né, bastante a nessa pesquisa, de maneira geral, em buscar as criaturas e características dessas criaturas e tudo mais. É, eu gostaria de agradecer, muito obrigado novamente a todos. É, as referências, se vocês quiserem, podem entrar em contato comigo, eu posso mandar as referências para todos vocês. E é isso, muito obrigado. Muito obrigada, Alisson. Vamos continuar essa conversa em breve. Ah... <risos> Last but not least, Caroline dos Santos Rolim is a doctoral student at Preget Upski. She has a master's degree also from Preget Upski, CAPES scholarship, and a BA in languages, Portuguese, English, and respective literatures from Faculdade Santa Rita, in and in translation from Universidade Federal de Rio Preto, uh, with an exchange program at the Università degli Studi di Napoli Orientali. I don't know if I mispronounced, sorry. Uh, she participates in the Irish Study and Translation and Comparative liter Literature Groups promoted by UPSKI. She has also uh, a scholarship from the Institutional Nucleus for Languages and Translation of the Department of International Relations at UPSKI and works mainly with Portuguese, English, and Italian. Uh, Caroline? Boa tarde. Good afternoon. Tá dando para ver minha tela direitinho? Yep. Ok. Então, vamos lá. Pessoal, primeiramente, boa tarde. É, obrigada por todo mundo que está aí assistindo. Obrigada pela oportunidade de estar tá apresentando mais um ano no Núcleo na Jornada. É, primeiro, eu gostaria de agradecer ao programa de pós-graduação em Estudos da Tradução, a minha orientadora, Maria Rita, que foi minha orientadora no mestrado e está sendo agora no doutorado. E deixar aqui também o meu agradecimento para a Cap, CAPES, porque essa pesquisa ela começou no mestrado, ela é uma parte dela, e eu fui bolsista, e isso foi muito importante. Então, também deixo aí meu agradecimento à CAPES. Bom, eu vou apresentar agora é, os vários retratos de Dorian Gray, quatro histórias do mesmo romance. Para a gente poder entrar no retrato de Dorian Gray, a gente fala um pouco sobre o autor, que é Oscar Wilde. O Oscar Wilde, ele nasceu na Irlanda em 1854, e em 1874 ele foi para a Inglaterra. Então, vale destacar que a Inglaterra vivia, nesse tempo, a Era Vitoriana. Depois ele ficou na, na Inglaterra e terminou seus dias na França. Ele escreveu o retrato de Dorian Gray, que foi o seu único romance e foi o suficiente para se tornar épico. Então, eu vou falar sobre essas quatro versões que existiu do retrato de Dorian Gray e por que, que elas são importantes porque elas fazem parte de uma construção, tanto da história do Wild, quanto da versão final do livro que a gente conhece hoje. Então, tudo começou em 1889 para 1890, quando Wild escreveu o retrato de Dorian Gray à mão. 
em, e esse é o retrato, a foto que está disponível pela De Morgan do original, do manuscrito original. Em seguida, ele datilografou o que ele escreveu à mão em 1890. Então, foi um espaço de tempo bem curto. Em 1889 para 1890, ele escreveu o manuscrito. Em 1890, ele datilografou, se tornando o datiloscrito. Eu não tenho a foto do datiloscrito, então eu coloquei uma foto dele. E, em 1890, ele entregou esse datiloscrito para a Limpcott Moffles Magazine, e a revista fez modificações antes de publicar, sem autorização do Wild. Ela foi publicada e só depois da publicação que o Wild viu tudo o que tinha sido cortado da versão que era encontrada no datiloscrito. Com isso, é, e essa daqui é a foto da Limpcott. Ela foi publicada ao mesmo tempo, tanto nos Estados Unidos quanto na Inglaterra. Mas essa questão de censura e a influência que teve também na vida do Wilde por causa do julgamento, ela veio pela publicação que aconteceu na Inglaterra. Depois de toda a polêmica e de toda a censura, o Wilde escreveu mais alguns capítulos fez uma revisão do, do que já tinha sido publicado na revista e publicou o livro pela Ward Lock Co., em 1891. Essa é a foto do livro da Ward Lock Co. Então, agora a gente vai falar sobre o prefácio, o famoso prefácio. O prefácio, quando ele nasceu, ele era é, sozinho, ele não, não foi feito junto com o retrato de Dorian Gray. Porém, depois do Wilde ter que mexer no, na versão da revista da Limpcott, ele decidiu colocar o prefácio junto com o livro. Então, o prefácio que hoje a gente vê no retrato de Dorian Gray, ele só existiu junto com o retrato de Dorian Gray a partir do livro publicado em 1891. Foi assim que ele foi agregado. O interessante, que é o primeiro ponto que eu vou levantar, é que só agora, na última década, essa publicação da Limpcott se, se tornou interessante para o mercado editorial brasileiro. E mesmo se tratando de uma versão em que não existia o prefácio, todas as editoras decidiram colocar o prefácio. E todas elas explicam que estão colocando o prefácio pela influência que o prefácio trouxe na vida de Oscar Wilde, influenciando também o retrato de Dorian Gray. Para poder trazer alguns dados, é, a primeira tradução para o Brasil aconteceu do livro e foi em 1911 pelo João do Rio. Entre 1911 e 1993, o livro ainda não era de domínio público e ele foi traduzido mais de 20 vezes. Todas essas traduções foram baseadas no livro, aquela última versão que trouxe o prefácio junto. Depois de 1993 até hoje, menos de 30 anos, e aí já tinha se tornado domínio público, o retrato de Dorian Gray foi traduzido já na mesma quantidade dos 80 anos, de durante esses 80 anos, de 1911 para 1993, de 1993 a 2021, ele já foi traduzido o mesmo tanto. O interessante, e que eu destaco, é que a partir de 2012, a versão da Limpcott, ela ficou é, visada no mercado editorial brasileiro e ela foi traduzida. Para a gente ter uma ideia de que o tempo de, de, de versão do que o, o Ayod escreveu e o tempo de publicação aqui, ele inverte, porque o texto foi entregue para a Limpcott em 1890. Em 1890, a Limpcott publicou. Teve todo o problema de censura, aumentaram os capítulos, colocou o prefácio. Então, o tempo que ele tinha sido revisado para se tornar livro 
aconteceu em 1891. E em 1891, a Warlock and Co. publicou o livro. Aqui no Brasil, a primeira tradução que existiu de qualquer retrato de Dorian Gray aconteceu em 1911, pelo jornal A Noite, e o tradutor foi o João do Rio. A tradução da Limpicott só aconteceu em 2012, que é sobre elas que a gente vai falar um pouco agora. A Marcela Furtado fez a primeira tradução de 2012. Em 2014, pela segunda vez, teve essa tradução do livro da, do, da revista, que foi do, do romance publicado pela revista, e foi pela Doris Gottens, que foi a tradução de 2014. Todas as duas foram publicadas pela mesma editora, além de Mark. Aqui está a foto do livro, que foi publicado pela, pela editora Landmark em 2012. O segundo é, momento que eu tenho para dar uma atenção é para a gente entender que a, o livro ele se tratava de um ato inédito, porque era a primeira vez que essa tradução da Limpicote estava acontecendo. E a editora decidiu é, não colocar isso na capa, que era uma coisa muito importante, era uma informação muito importante. Eles decidiram fazer assimilação com o filme, o que é muito normal acontecer, essa assimilação entre filme e livro. Mas ao invés deles darem é, essa informação que traz a diferença de por que essa tradução, eles não colocaram, eles preferiram colocar o livro. Penso eu, é um, foi um, um pecado, erraram nisso. Daí, em 2014, eles já mudaram a capa e decidiram colocar, daí a gente está falando de, de, de é, para textos editoriais, e eles colocaram primeira versão de 1890 da obra-prima de Oscar Wilde. Daí já traz uma informação diferente. Em 2013, o Jório Dauster é, traduziu um livro que o Nicholas Frankel escreveu, também fazendo é, com um trabalho envolvendo um retrato de Dorian Gray. Foi pela editora, é, biblioteca, pela editora Globo, a Biblioteca Azul, que esse livro foi publicado. E a curiosidade deste livro é que ele é o único traduzido, pela, é, foi traduzido baseado no Datiloscrito. Até então, a gente tinha duas versões da Limpicott, e em 2013, a gente teve essa versão do Datiloscrito. Porém, na capa, também não tem essa informação. Por isso que eu achei interessante trazer isso no trabalho, porque quem gosta do Wild vai, vai entender que existe essa, essa sequência da, de tradução e de obra. Agora, em 2021, a Dark Side resolveu também fazer a tradução, e, é, pelo que... Eu não consegui ler o livro inteiro ainda, mas se trata da Limpicott. Ele também não traduziu o datiloscrito. Então, até, até o momento de agora, a gente tem só é, aquela do, do, da Editora Globo, como do datiloscrito. Eu trouxe um exemplo, só para finalizar... A gente fez uma pesquisa para entender se essa questão de colocarem nos paratextos editoriais que se trata de uma censura, que foi um livro que trouxe muita história, como eles viram isso na tradução e se, eles, e se realmente era só isso ou se também tinha uma questão de tradução. Esse exemplo, é, a gente já vê uma diferença de impacto até de tradução, que é como a Furtado resolveu traduzir com parece e a Gottens é como renunciar, que são traz um, uma interpretação diferente para a gente que não tem acesso ao livro original. Com isso, é, o cotejo ele revelou é, alguns trechos que contradizem essa ideia de que a revisão ela tenha sido baseada essencialmente em uma suposta censura e não em questões puramente estéticas. Encontramos trechos que são apresentados tanto no livro quanto na revista que enfraquece essa ideia de que é só censurado. Ele tem as partes da censura, mas ele também foi mexido muito na estética. E... É, Para terminar... Não está passando mais. Espera aí, perdão, gente. Aconteceu. 
Ah, e aí eu trago as referências é, desse trabalho e a ideia foi apresentar um pouco essa sequência, porque quem é da literatura, quem conhece o Wild, quem gosta, é interessante saber que existem essas versões e que elas estão chegando cada vez mais para o público leitor é, brasileiro. Era essa a minha apresentação. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Muito obrigada. Uh, I think we have a very short amount of time to make comments and questions, but uh, I will I'll make uh, I'll actually I'll, I'll talk about some comments that were made on YouTube. So Beatriz is talking uh, about uh, William's work, an original analysis of Dennis Johnston's The Old Lady Says No. William, a great addition to the scholarship on his work. Well done. GC also uh, congratulating João and telling us to wait for this new translation uh, illustrated by Alison. And afterwards by Maria Rita, I am going to be waiting for this. Uh, there is a question. Uh, oh, uh, Alain also uh, congratulates João Pedro. Uh, and GC, Maria Rita, uh, Aline is uh, saying that all of your uh, works are amazing and I agree with her. Uh, let me see, there. I know there's a question. There are some comments about uh, RPG, uh, but uh, there's a question to Alison. Uh, I think you're not, uh, uh, you're not in the PhD yet, but uh, Alison, I think it's not yet, pelo que Maria Rita commented, you still didn't enter no doutorado, mas em breve, se tudo é certo. E a Aline tem uma pergunta, se uh, você, eu acredito que possivelmente, né, no futuro, vai se amparar nas metodologias de practice-based research? Se sim, em quem você está se amparando? Como pretende descrever seus processos criativos? Vocês estão me ouvindo? Sim. É, então, assim, é, essa pesquisa, na realidade, para essa apresentação, é algo à parte, não é o tema do, do, do doutorado, né? É, que eu pretendo... O doutorado é uma extensão do, do que a gente fez, né? eu e a Maria Rita, durante o mestrado, né? Que é tradução de um livro do inglês médio para o inglês, para o português, agora, né? Então, assim, essa pesquisa que eu fiz foi para a apresentação desse trabalho é, foi para eu poder fundamentar, mais ou menos, o que eu queria trazer. Eu queria trazer as análises e os motivos, as explicações das escolhas tradutórias, né? Por que de cada elemento trazido ali na ilustração... Só que eu não podia fazer isso simplesmente dizendo, ah, porque eu quis e porque é tradução e pronto, né? Aí eu dei uma pesquisada, encontrei esse, esses livros, né? A Arudo de Campos, da, o, o artigo da Nilce, e aí eu pude dar uma complementada, assim, digamos, para eu poder estar preparado para essa apresentação. Mas no caso, para o doutorado vai ser outra, outra coisa. <risos> Tá certo, obrigada, Alison. Uh, I would like to make some, some comments uh, first uh, for William. Actually, I like all the, all the words, but I'm, I'm going to talk first about William and John Pedro's work, and then later Alison and Caroline. Uh, I, I really like this idea of going through uh, from uh, Dantian uh, hell to um, Blake's hell. Uh, I think a lot about our political situation and how more it can be more interesting uh, than, um, than just suffering from actually learning from it. I don't know if you agree with me or not. Uh, to João Pedro, great work, amazing work. Uh, it, it makes me think about the role of ontologies uh, because what you what you described uh, while you were uh, described, what you said while you were presenting. Uh, we have a lot like gender roles, religion, class, uh, class roles. So um, everything that uh, we can see in, I think a capitalist project or uh, as we know, capitalist 
Capitalism Today is pretty much there. Alison, sensacional, adorei. Na verdade, eu já acompanho um pouco do seu trabalho, porque eu te sigo no Instagram, mas muito bom. Eu acho muito interessante a gente pensar nessas questões de é, imagem e leitura de imagem. Eu lembro que algum tempo atrás, quando eu estava fazendo, é, uma especi... algum tempo, não, muito tempo atrás, quando eu estava fazendo especialização, é, eu trabalhei com quadrinhos e uma das coisas que eu lia era bastante era falar da falta de letramento na leitura de imagens, que às vezes quando as pessoas vão ver imagem, né, enfim, é, em uma exposição, ou ler quadrinhos, Principalmente, na verdade, eu estava trabalhando com quadrinhos, então isso tinha muito mais a ver com quadrinhos. As pessoas focavam muito na, no que estava escrito e não na imagem. E o quanto isso é um problema, porque é, a gente precisa, é, sim, ler a imagem, prestar atenção nas cores, traços, formas, é, tudo. Então, sensacional. Adorei os desenhos. Eu realmente mal posso esperar para sair essa edição. Estou bem empolgada mesmo. Parabéns. É, a mesma coisa para o João Pedro. Só por último, vou só fazer um comentário geral aqui. Caroline, gostei bastante do seu trabalho também. Uh, muito legal e me faz pensar muito no papel desse original e das versões, né? é, nesses projetos literários, é, nessas publicações, por onde saem essas traduções. E, e me lembra muito uma, uma palestra que houve na PGET há muitos anos atrás, quando eu entrei no mestrado, que falava justamente sobre o que é o original e, e como se publica e como se pensa um original. Não sei se você faz essa discussão é, no seu trabalho, mas enfim. É isso, acho que é, se alguém quiser se sentir confortável para falar, a gente tem alguns minutinhos ainda antes do encerramento, então fique à vontade. Tem alguém com o microfone ligado? Alguém gostaria de comentar? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I think this, uh, this uh, shift that happens with, with the advent of capitalism is, is uh, like you said, it's, it's, it's all this uh, boiling pot of, of different... Uh, exclusions right different types of, of, of exclusions that happen both in the, uh, the 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 term social class is put back into to the discussion uh, like Raymond Williams says and also the the whole notion of individualist uh, achievement creates these exclusions uh, such as social exclusion and gender exclusion, race exclusion and, and so forth. And I mean, I, I, I'm not even uh, that deeply in there yet. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm studying a lot about folklore and that transition into from, uh, from 19th century into industrialism and, and how that impacted society. Uh, But uh, it's it's very interesting how that comes off in the in the folklore and and how much these these pertinent themes about uh, minorities and and capitalism are related to that to the literature of that time specifically folklore uh, and and it's interesting that in this experience that I've had with with the translation of the of the shorts of the of the fairy tales. Uh, uh, I try to uh, prioritize the, the the audience that was going to read these these fairy tales, which is mostly children, and that's another issue altogether. You know how translating fairy tales for children is, you know how how are these stories for children after all, or are they not? Right. So while, while at the same time that they bring up all these complex issues, they are uh, aimed at a lot of the time at, at children, but that, that was not the original aim of folklore, right? So I don't know, it's a lot of issues. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes, uh, so I think that's it. I think we are on time. So thank you very much, uh, you guys, for presenting. Uh, I would like to thank the organization and the interpreters. You are amazing. And everyone else, uh, hope I can see you guys maybe in person uh, next year, maybe. I don't know. Uh, again, congratulations. Always lovely being, a, uh, being at a May event. Okay. So that's it. Goodbye. So uh, we're about to close the Quinta Jornada do Núcleo de Estudos Irlandeses da UFSC with a focus on the intersections of Irish literature, theatre and technology, which we started planning in 2019. So as I have already said elsewhere, switching all the activities of NEI to online platforms in the last two academic years has caused instability, uncertainty and even pain, but this was eased by the fact that we have been able to continue to support each other's learning and research and to share our work and research with larger audiences, thanks to technology. So it is thus extremely rewarding to conclude this fifth edition of our annual Jornada. At times of isolation due to the pandemic, the NEI online events have been strong elements of cohesion and research support for our members and other scholars in the field of our studies in Brazil. Despite its disadvantages, the cyberspace has been providing significant opportunities of interaction and academic exchange. While I was preparing like these closing words, I went back to a collection of articles edited by Catherine Conrad, Colin Parsons, and Julie McCormick Wang, Science, Technology, and Irish Modernism, published in 2019, in which they remark that since W.B. Yeats wrote in 1890 that the man of science is too often a person who has exchanged his soul for a formula, the anti-scientific bent of Irish literature has often been taken as a given. Their edited collection challenged the stereotype that Irish literature has been unconcerned with scientific and technological change, though. Uh, though. And so did this event, I think, by examining the complexity of Irish writers and scholars' engagement with innovations in, in literature and science and technology. And the range of subjects explored in this event, which also included translation and the intersection of Irish literature and theater with history and social, social issues, suggests a map of the current landscape of Irish studies at Neufski and attests, they say, I think, the caliber of the work being done in this field here uh, at Ufski. So thank you all very much for taking part in this online jornada as speakers, organizers, moderators, and audience. A big shout out to the work of the interpreters, who, as uh, Claire said, must be exhausted by now. And a special round of applause for our incredible three guest speakers. I would, I would like now to introduce Rachel Fitzpatrick, the current Deputy Council General of Ireland in Brazil. She has recently arrived here, but is already part of our community of Irish studies. Welcome to Rachel. Thank you so much, Professor Vastas. Am I audible? Perfect, thank you so much for, for the introduction and for what has been such a fantastic day. To those I've not yet met, good evening. My name is Rachel Fitzpatrick and I'm the Deputy Consul General of Ireland, recently arrived in Sao Paulo. And before all else, I would like to offer first uh, a huge congratulations and the most sincere thanks on behalf of our Ambassador Sean Hoy, Consul General Owen Bennis and myself, to you Beatrice, to Alini, to Bayahita, to Janaina for all of the work that went into making today happen. It is no small feat to have secured so many wonderful speakers to have curated a diverse range of topics that coalesce so coherently around a very 
timely theme and, and to have all logistics running smoothly on the day, tackling technical challenges while simultaneously chairing thought-provoking thought discussions. I also want to thank all of those working behind the scenes and in particular the interpreters. This fifth tornado has been such a great achievement and while I know it takes a huge amount of effort, you all make it look completely seamless for those of us online today. I should of course acknowledge the fact that we are online today, which no doubt has its advantages. We are very lucky to have speakers and panelists and interviewees online that would not otherwise be available to us. Although I must say that Uski has an admirable track record in bringing Ireland's best to Brazil. But in a way, it's been very fitting uh, that we have been reflecting on the role of technology, all of us far from the days of Marconi in Dancing at Lunasa, but rather looking into our personal YouTube screens. Uh, Claire Lynch had asked us at the beginning of her lecture whether our devices bring us together or tear us apart. And for me, at least, while definitely questioning their embeddedness in my life, today has been a fine example of technology leading to greater intellectual and emotional bonds. Of course, I really miss the in-person element. There were so many moments today during the discussions where I was struck by a comment in a presentation or, or a listener question and would have loved nothing more than to sit down afterwards, talk through it with the expert, you know, bounce ideas off one another and identify projects for future collaboration. So that's certainly an element that I am looking forward uh, to reviving once the public health situation allows us to do this presencial. I've already had the, the pleasure to visit Florianopolis. It was actually the first place I traveled to in Brazil where I was so warmly welcomed by Alini and I can't wait to return. Uh, Marahita, although you have a new institutional home, I expect you to come back when I travel <laughs> so that we can get to know each other. I, I, I want to now acknowledge the instrumental role that Uski's played in fostering such a, a deep connection held by so many Brazilians to Ireland and to Irish culture. So much of this love is, is thanks to the commitment and, and to the passion of our partners at the Nucleo, and in particular to our dear friend Beatrice, who has for decades been promoting Irish literature, Irish theatre and Irish culture in ways more innovative than, than often Ireland was. <laughs> Owen, um, our Consul General this morning listed an unending really number uh, of really meaningful links that Beatrice has created and nurtured between educational institutions, cultural institutions, and more importantly, people in our two countries. So Beatrice, the Consulate and, and the Embassy are so grateful uh, and indeed indebted to you for this. Uski truly is a model uh, for internationalization of universities which is something I've been sharing with colleagues at headquarters and uh, at Irish universities with whom the consulate works closely. At the Programa Postgraduação em Inglês and at NEI in particular, I'm really envious of this extremely rich and in many ways unrivaled study environment. Uh, when I reflect on my own time at university, I only wish I had the same opportunities to engage with the great minds of Ireland and, and to benefit from such high quality courses, innovative seminars and roundtables. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the very special one a couple of weeks ago um, where we brought together, or where it was he brought together some of the most significant commentators on Tom Murphy's work. And so many insights of, from that day have really, have really stuck with me. Uh, it was, I believe, Alini who highlighted in, in her presentation Many examples of artists flourishing in what has been such a challenging time for the sector due to cuts and, of course, aggravated by the pandemic. And certainly at the consulate, we count Uski among those developing alternative and interesting forms of expression. And especially following today's success, I must say that the consulate really looks forward to deepening the relationship with the Nucleo and to exploring new ways of cooperation with the university as well. I would love to, to offer my reflections on every single session of the day, but I'm conscious that timekeeping was so effectively done throughout and I do have my own limits, so I will just offer one or two, if I may. Um, first of all, as, as Owen, our Consul General, spoke to in his own introductions, it's an important centenary year for Ireland uh, in which we are as a nation reflecting on the events of the last century. And, and Barry Hulahan's words then today, 
regarding how memory can be digitally reconstructed will certainly be with me as I undertake my own personal reflections. Uh, of course, questions of independence uh, and of statehood are front and center at this, but I feel that today's program captured so many of the more tangible things on the minds uh, of a young Irish people. And, and we are, demographically speaking, a, a very young country. So the questions that, that, that people touched on today include how can we disentangle masculinity and violence? What can we do to ensure that culture belongs to all members of society, including those who have been disempowered? Individually and collectively, how do we amplify the voices of women, people of colour, travellers, the LGBT community and others? And how do we make sense of instances uh, of growing division on this island? I don't unfortunately have, have the answers to any of those questions, but it does not go unnoticed, uh, the efforts that have been made today to bring diverse voices and, and to bring experimental art online. These are the voices that I want to hear more of in 2022, uh, the voices that increasingly my department is trying to engage with and listen to, though of course we always have more to do. And, and with this in mind, uh, I just like would like to stress that the consulate is always open to ideas from all of you online today regarding ways to commemorate these upcoming anniversaries, methods of, of promoting Ireland and Irish culture more generally in Brazil, or any other opportunities to cooperate on, on cultural or educational projects. So feel free to get in touch with me anytime uh, on that. I will finish just by saying that I've been so pleasantly surprised how much engagement with NEI in my short time in Brazil has enriched my own understanding of Irishness and how it's evolving across the world. So thank you again to Beatriz, Alini, Mariakita and Janaina for allowing me to be a part of today. And I'm really looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I think our last thanks go to the consulate and the embassy in your person today and Owens uh, earlier. And also to always to Hadis and uh, Carol who support us technically in the backstage so that everything goes well in our event. So I think we are all now ready to go home or stay at home for a glass of wine or a cup of coffee. Thank you very much and uh, see you again soon. <laughs>